Right shoulder, I believe, based on where you are in the guys. studio. Hey! Oh, there we go. Just had to get around the friends. Just get around the lift. Look at that. Oh, look at that. You look so little. I could. <laughs> I feel like we. Yeah, we could just go. Oh, I could squish them. All right. I'll squish them. They look so tiny. So tiny. I hey, see. Hey, Hey, Steve. <laughs> hey, guys. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, guys. So the air is better up here, as it turns out. <laughs> Who's there? are we talking to you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, good. So, Rob, tell me, because we've just been walking and talking, and you had yeah. a funny story earlier telling me about your walk-in. Oh, in. Well, well, it was more of a, it was kind of a question and such. So, in my walk over here this morning, it was reminded as we were walking here, is I, I it was dark as we're coming here early this morning, yep. and I stepped off and just barely missed getting run over by this convoy of bicycles that I, I didn't really <laughs> hear coming, and it just dawned on me that... Maybe that's just something I'm not used to. What, and what yeah, did you ask me? Because I asked you if you were walking through the middle of a cycle lane, and you said, yes, I think so. And I thought, it's not that unsurprising to hear well, that. See, that's the idea, is that <laughs> cycle lanes. I'm not used to cycle lanes. I, I'm sure, Cedric, <laughs> you're probably very used to cycle lanes. I am. Yeah, I love cycling, Rob. But I can, I can, definitely, see, I can, I can definitely see that happening. Like, I'm just having the image in front of me of you on a cycle lane. Rob, it just, just makes me laugh. I have to jump in on this as well. Every time I'm in Amsterdam, this is just my special gift. I feel like I have to look look left and right about 37 times when I cross the block. Right? I've got the pedestrians, then the cycles, and first line of cars, second set of pedestrians, another line of cars, another set of bicycles, and I'm usually dead by the time I reach the other side. It's well, not pretty. Well, Steve, but what you do, what I run into as well, is the whole notion of, okay, are we in a are we in a place where they drive on the right yeah. side of the road or the left oh. side of the road? Because when we're in in, uh, in the London area, where Cedric and Nish are, yep. I, I have, all my instincts are just wrong That's what for the which to way here. to turn. I'm looking the wrong way, going one way, and then so yeah. you have, that happens to you in America? Yeah, because we're on the other side of the road. Or even the here. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this this is, is the most you. fascinating conversation I think we've oh. ever had here on set. In <laughs> this show. Guys, Steve. here's what I want to do. I want to get your perspective. We're down low. We're in mixed with everybody. What does it look like from all the way up here on the top ramp? Give us the big picture view. Nish, I'll let you start. Okay, well, we have so much going on here. We're at the hub. Uh, so you can see we've obviously gone to our Cisco uh, TV studio. That's where our wonderful co-hosts and crew are. Along from that, we have the Cisco Insider area. We've taken you there yesterday. We had an interview with the lead of Cisco Insider and our advocates program and our user research and user groups. We've got, we're opposite the DevNet zone. So that's where Cisco's community of developers is hanging out. Um, obviously, we've got the Cisco Secure booth. We focused on security today. Lots of great coffee there. If you haven't been there. Mm -hmm. And then if you just take a look down here, the Cisco store, Rob, this yeah. is one of your favorite parts. Of well, yeah, no, y'all, there were several things I was wondering about, which I was just curious if the dressing rooms were fully enclosed because I was realized there's a, there's kind of an area. It is, it is, there's nothing, there's nothing there whatsoever. But yeah, it's a good view. It's a nice to be above the melee. Studio, we'll go back to you. Oh, thank you so much, Rob, Nish, I appreciate it. Keep getting those great perspectives from out there. You know what, Cedric, you have spent almost in the entire day over in the world of solutions. We've got like a minute and change left in the broadcast, yep. not even that. Give yeah. me a 10 second hit. Favorite thing you saw today? Favorite thing I saw today? Yep. That's a good, that's a good question. Collaboration, right? Collaboration. Yeah, yeah. just that this mini, I want to have one. Human, I love that. <laughs> well, All right. In my kitchen. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take back over for the end of it. On behalf of our entire Cisco TV team, we want to thank you so much for joining us here on the live stream. Keep interacting with us using hashtag Cisco Life and Mia. We are going to meet you right back here at the Rai tomorrow morning. We hope that you have a great night. Do not leave us behind 24 hours a day all the way up through the closing keynote. You keep talking to us, we will keep talking to you. Take great care, everybody. We will see you soon. Bye-bye. Welcome to all of you to Cisco Live EMEA. You know, the last time we were all together was three years ago in Barcelona. Isn't it great to be back together again? I get to talk to you about two things. One is around innovations that we have in market today and what's coming up in the future. Then we have a whole bunch of new things going on in full stack observability. 
But today when you think about Thousand Eyes WAN Insights, you can analyze diverse data sets, forecast potential performance issues, and recommend optimal paths in your SD-WAN environment. And by the way, in a few months, we should be able to give you that option to automate that action as well. So fabulous product. At the company, we're looking at generative AI. How can generative AI enhance the use cases, our products and solutions today? And how could it build on more from infrastructure all the way to applications? Cisco's responsible AI framework includes things like ethics, risk, security, privacy, responsibility. It's gonna take all of us coming together to make responsible AI happen. We believe OTEL, or open telemetry, will see more adoption in 2023, driven by this need for a standard way of instrumenting, of collecting, and exporting telemetry data. You, as partners or customers, can ingest the visibility insights and actions from what we're building into your business processes and flows, and you can quickly identify what part of the business is impacted. You can prioritize based on the business context in terms of what matters most and return the systems to a healthy state. With application security, our goal is to be able to protect the application. This is the first time, as of a couple of days ago actually, that we've released a first-to-market business risk observability. We've integrated AppDynamics business transactions with API security, threat intel from Talos, and with Kenna vulnerability scoring as well. You want to be able to triage issues in real time, whether it's at the user end, mobile or app, the application, internet, or third-party SaaS services. And this is why we're doing a deeper integration with AppDynamics and Thousand Eyes, sharing bi-directional da telemetry data. We're closing the internet visibility gap as the application's journeys to the cloud and being able to deliver this with the customer digital experience monitoring solution, especially as the adoption of hybrid work goes out, you can enable a much richer experience for the user. I lead the Cisco networking team that is transforming infrastructure around the globe. Cisco networking builds the products and technologies that power the most sophisticated networks across the planet. This includes hyperscalers and service providers, public sector companies, enterprises, small and medium businesses, all that critical infrastructure depends upon Cisco for providing those unified experiences. And for end users, those unified experiences simplify technologies, it simplifies applications, networks, and solutions to go and act as one. Cisco's strategy for unified experiences begins with one simple vision, to simplify IT for everyone, everywhere and anywhere, and at every scale around. Simplification begins with platforms. Think about Nexus, DNA Center, Intersight, Thousand Eyes, and of course, Meraki. Now you can monitor and manage Catalyst products using the simplicity of the Meraki dashboard. Nine out of 10 enterprise decision makers believe that wireless networking and IoT are important to their future as businesses. I'll give you an example. Ford Motor Company worked closely with Cisco to become a first mover in transforming transportation. The automotive industry is over 100 years old. Colossal changes are happening in that space. You have electrification, you have auto manufacturing, you have autonomous driving, and you have what we all love, these in-car experiences. Today, cars do so much more than move us from point A to point B. Cisco is all in on simplifying IT everywhere and at every scale. Hybrid work is still an experiment that uh, we are also still learning from. And that's because hybrid work is both harder and different than how we've worked in the last couple of years. We are reimagining workspaces everywhere, whether, whether that's the home or the office. Second, we are optimizing collaboration across your ecosystem to enable new kinds of interactions. We just announced Cisco devices support for Microsoft Teams Room natively. So this gives you a choice, right? You can use the native WebEx experience 
which allows you to join all those platforms, or you can use the Microsoft Teams Room experience. There's no real reason for you, for you to use any other competitor's video device equipment with your Microsoft Teams Room ecosystem. I'm happy to announce a preview of our latest innovation in WebEx Control Hub, Carbon Emissions Insights. It shows IT scope to CO2 emissions from their collaboration devices based on usage and consumption. If you have an end-to-end -end view, if you can see from the point where a user clicks on a link to the point of access to the point where an application actually talks to the data, you lay out these puzzle pieces, the patterns become very, very clear. And we can figure out friend from foe. And so this is very much the vision behind the Cisco security cloud. You're going to see a consistent, clean, intuitive interface where we take this complex kind of jumble of information and turn it into actionable data that you can use to protect your infrastructure. The security cloud is, used, is built using cloud native applications, modern techniques, it's independent of infrastructure, heavy investment and emphasis on automation, AI and machine learning, so we can identify friend from foe. We've introduced new, very high performance firewall appliances. They offer very high performance levels terrific price performance, and perhaps most importantly, we have returned to pre-pandemic availability levels, so you can get this stuff where you need it. And I know this has been a big issue. We're building these products with sustainability in mind, and we're building security controls that are designed for this highly distributed, remote, and multi-cloud world. It's fantastic to be here and to see this incredible venue so full of interesting people. We are living in very complicated times. Everything is changing so fast, and we can't make things easy always. But what we can do, we can make them feel easy to the people that we care about, and that makes all the difference. Solving complex business challenges may be hard for us, but we should always make it look simple to our customers. Good news, the answer is yes. Yes, we can do that together. You and us, we can do that. We innovate with you using our bespoke solution because we want to make you future ready. Let me say a little bit about uh, City Football Group. We're the world's leading owner and operator of football clubs. Uh, we have total uh, the group has total or partial ownership of 12 clubs in 12 major cities around the world. Uh, we seek to empower better lives through football. Connectivity for us uh, is absolutely mission critical. So it's connectivity with the communities that we operate in, it's connectivity between these 12 wonderful clubs, and it's connectivity with millions of fans uh, around the world and those that visit our stadia. Football is the most popular sport in the world. It's the most watched sport on television. It's the number one sport on TV in 75% of major markets around the world. Within that, the Premier League is the most watched and most competitive league, uh, with a total TV, TV audience annually of over three billion. And within that, Manchester City have featured in four of the last five most watched Premier League games since 2018-19. Uh, we have over 120 million followers on our own social platforms. More than 800 million people around the world will say that they are interested or very interested or following Manchester City. So we are a club overall that demands the very best at all times in everything and that absolutely includes technology. So let me tell you just a little bit about what Cisco support for us on match day. Um, the network, first of all, the network swells to expand and uh, house and accommodate 50,000 people that want to get connected, keep in touch with friends and family. They want safe, fast connections. We have Cisco and Meraki cameras throughout the stadium. They help us monitor queue times at our food and beverage concessions, getting the right information to fans. And we've brought real-time information into the stadium for public transport for our fans to help them get home. All the car parking is operated by AMPR, again, all relying uh, on the network. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you all soon. All the best.
So Cisco Live, for me, is all about learning. I've been coming here for years, and it's all about how much can you learn in what period of time while you've got all the experts in one place. So we thought it'd be fun to go out and ask everybody, well, as of right now, how much you learning? The number one thing that I've learned at Cisco Live is to be prepared. There's so many things here to learn. I learned a lot about business values, strategic values, uh, a lot about different certification. You can learn about anything from the dark web to Starlink to new networking capabilities and products. It's really amazing. We had some talks about UCSX and um, UCC. Pretty interesting upcoming um, technologies in combination with uh, WebEx. New ways to fulfill our needs. Yeah, main topics for me is looking into uh, full stack observability, cloud technologies, big deal for the future. Cisco is going full in on many services and that's really exciting. I'm really proud to be here. It's great to be in Amsterdam. I love it. The number one thing I've learned at Cisco Life is what an incredible company Cisco is. Amazing. Sometimes learning is just simply about reconnecting. Either way, what's been your experience? to Cisco Live EMEA. Together, we can achieve incredible things. Together, we are building an inclusive and sustainable future for all. And I know that we are all in. A cyber attack can grind everything to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco.
All right. Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you all back to the final day of Cisco Live 2023. Amsterdam cannot even believe it. We want to thank you all so much for joining us here on the live stream. We are all in and we Really glad that all of you are as well. Thank you, thank you. I'm Steve Bolter. Our entire Cisco TV broadcast team has been having such an amazing time here at the Rai in Amsterdam, which we'll talk about in a moment. We've got a sold out crowd of 10,000 here in the room with us. All of you tuning in from all over the world, we're really grateful, it's been incredible. From the inspiring opening keynote with Wendy, Liz, Jonathan, Javed, Dom, Adele, we have explored edge to edge power across our one Cisco portfolio. We have been bringing you every angle, every behind the scenes detail in our iTalks, in our partner sessions, throughout the hub, and more than 150 demos across the Cisco showcase right next door. And it's all headed up to our closing keynote this afternoon with Pierre Luigi Colina. All right, now I am joined here on set in Studio A by Abhi Singh, Senior Director, Future of Work. Hello, Abhi, good morning. Good morning, Steve. And we're so glad to have Robert Hattink here with us as well. Robert is System and Network Consultant for The Rai. Amsterdam, thank you for all the amazing work that you've done and for making this an incredible venue and great week for all of us. Good morning to you too. Good morning. Oh, so, yeah. Abhi, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to let you chat with Robert. I'll be hanging right here as soon as you're done. All right. Good morning, Robert. Thank you so much for being here. And more than that, thank you for hosting Cisco at the Rai. This is a beautiful facility, and what we see here is a futuristic work environment. So, what, could you share a little bit how you make all this magic happen? The magic here is uh, waiting a long time. First two times were canceled due to COVID, and now finally we're here. And all those years we were working very closely together with the IT team of Cisco Live. So it's our Dutch guys, so I know them. Uh, and it's very close together, creating this, uh, this space, this environment, and this, um, yeah, looking for the, for the English words, but um, the experience for everyone to get here. And it's all been done close together with the IT team. So it's not only the guy, we invested, of course, but we put up all the equipment needed. And that's why we're the first Wi-Fi 6 full event for Cisco Live, and that's why, uh, I'm very happy that it's that you're happy. So that's basically <laughs> the thing that that's for me. It's well, everybody's smiling and, and happy about about it. Yeah, the internet works everywhere. The connectivity for all the mm -hmm. thousands of people, wherever you go, it's working beautifully. How do you make that happen? Like any any nook and corner you go, you always have connection. Yeah, uh, that happened because we work very closely together with the IT. Uh, even the Wi-Fi engineers from the United States, the big one, and Jim Florek in this case helped us design the network, helped us to place it, and we just brought it together to host this event in this venue as good as possible we can. That is amazing. And we did a good job. That is amazing, we love it. Now, I also see this is a huge venue, we're hosting mm -hmm. 10,000 people, and we're all uh, very cognizant of the circular economy for sustainability. I'm curious, as we design all this technology, does it also contribute towards your ESG goals? Yes, it does. Um, we've been close for two years. We were able to put up a lot of Cisco stuff in here. It's all Cisco, by the way. And we're connecting everything at the moment to get the lighting there, the heating done, uh, uh, the environmental uh, monitoring and getting the heating corrected um, automatically. So that's all done by connecting our sensors and everything that's in here to our Cisco network. And without that, it's very, very difficult to do so. So looking at that part, we're making steps. The second step we're done. I just arrived yesterday in the shipping, the new access points, environment monitoring, count, people counting, in the office part, that will be done the next one month, two months, and then we're very up and running again after being closed for two years. So there's a little gap for us in getting there. That is amazing. Are we also using any power over Ethernet here? In Every, the almost everything is power over Ethernet. Awesome. As you, as you see, all the sensors, everything is just one wire up there. It's much more easier than getting electricity also up there. <laughs> so um, that, that's basically basically what we're doing. Powering everything to power over Ethernet. That's that one is of the amazing. things we do. That is amazing. So we already here, I'm just like, I'm excited. What is going to happen next time we're here in two, three years? What, what, what are we going to see more? Now, the, the Rai 
uh, and Cisco itself have a program that's called CDA, Country Digital Acceleration. Okay. And especially with the Cisco Netherlands, the RAI and the city of Amsterdam is working on accelerating the digitalization of the RAI and the environment around the RAI. Um, that's, that's the big part we are, we're doing together. And it, it's, it's accelerating at the moment because we got the stuff, we got the equipment here, and now we started connecting together and working together to get everything up and running. That is amazing. Thank you for being an amazing partner and thank you for hosting us again at, at the Rye. Right. We will be here next year again. Yes. And it will be even better. Looking forward to that. Me okay. Too. Back to you, Steve. Avi, thank you so much. Robert, congratulations. You've done such a fantastic job. We really appreciate being here at the Rye. It's been great. Looking forward to the ne those, uh, those next three years. Avi, great job. Good to have you in the studio. All right, so at this point, we are going to head out to an area that we have not had a chance to visit yet. Make sure that you keep those social media ticks flowing into us using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. We want to hear from every single one of you. And right now, my buddy Cedric DeValder is out in registration, which is down the hall that way. First time that we've been out there. Hello, Cedric. Good morning, Steve. I'm here, as you said, in registration and Amsterdam is waking up right now. People are flowing in behind me right now. And um, we are just, uh, yeah, so people are coming in. Amsterdam is waking up. Cisco Live is waking up. We have such a packed day ahead of us. We're going to have wonderful guests in the studio. Wendy Mars is going to join us later. We're going to visit the Beehive. We're going to go to DevNet. We're going to visit the CX booth. We're, of course, having our keynote later today with Per Luigi Caloni, who is the, greatest, the world's greatest referee. And, of course, we have our famous Cisco celebration later tonight. So everyone is coming in. I can see people being excited. People are thinking, I just woke up, like, why are they with a camera in my face? But, you know, that's what happened at Cisco Live. So we're going to throw it back to the studio right now uh, to Steve. So, Steve, over to you. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Thanks for bringing us a, a quick call out from registration here this morning. We are going to take just a moment to drop back in on one of the most important elements of Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam, and that is sustainability, which is really the backbone of powering an inclusive future for all. Cisco sits right there at that phenomenal intersection between sustainability and technology. We are working to help businesses and IT to make more informed choices in their journey toward sustainability goals. Let's take a look at a couple of those goals right now. Sustainability and circular economy, along with reverse logistics, has been a core strategy for Cisco for many years now. This is about creating value, not just for our customers and partners, but also for our shareholders as well. Cisco's purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And an inclusive future is not possible unless we all look after the planet that we all share. Something uh, I'm quite proud of is to go uh, to the office uh, by bicycle. Just for avoiding to use the car, but I can go by feet. Self-produced power um, at home on our roof. We try to use all the equipment as long as possible. What you see behind me here is uh, our receiving and processing. Our partners will receive the product back. They will dismantle it, they will break it down, identify products that can be reused and repurposed. If we can't repurpose at a part level, then we will ship it to our recycling partner. Our recycling partner then recover raw materials which go back into manufacturing processes. All parts will be separated. In the end you get a product like this in the jars. That will be our end result when we get our things back. We reuse and repurpose about 99.9% .9 of all products. People, when they talk about sustainability, is if they mean it by their heart and not because it's a trend. If you don't live it in your culture, I think it's, it's not the truth. Save the planet. Don't waste anything what you do not have to waste. Sustainability means building bee hotels for solitary bees all around the world. Tying up with how the bees look after their environment, they monitor, they run it efficiently. We're drawing an analogy with the workspace, with Cisco smart workspaces. And what this means is not only are we selling customers on the ability to look after their work environments, we're looking about sustainability more broadly. And basically what we're doing is we're building over 200 bee hotels to save solitary bees and to ensure that they continue their population growth. 
So at Cisco, it's important for us that we are sustainable ourselves. I think we're really looking more broadly at the planet. We're taking it very seriously. It's not just something that we sell, it's something that we live in terms of our end-to-end -end product cycle and how we operate as individuals. Raw materials are running out. If we can recover, reuse, recycle, repurpose, then we're supporting not just the economy, but also the planet as well. Well, as you can see, we are not just talking the talk. We are walking the walk here at Cisco and Sustainability. I love, love, love that part of our story. You know, we have been so honored and so excited to bring Cisco live here to the Rai in Amsterdam. Such a beautiful venue, such a beautiful country, great people. We've received an incredibly warm welcome from the city and strong partnership from the Dutch government. And that is what we are going to talk about next. Nish Parker is hanging out right next door to me here in Studio B with Luke Dobrinsky, Cisco's VP of Transformation and Strategic Offers. And she's also got Kim Gronsma with us from the Dutch government's Ministry of the Interior and Dutch Relations. So Nish, I'm gonna send it right next door to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Yes, I'm here. I'm even in my Dutch orange today. <laughs> so, <laughs> really happy to be here. And I'm joined by Luke and by um, Kim as well. So, I'm going to hand it over to you, Luke. I know you've got some things that you want to ask Kim. Yeah. And then we'll, I'll be right here if you need me. But Thank please, you so much. Thank you. take it away. Kim, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. We obviously have a great relationship with you and, and the Dutch government. Um, and hybrid work or future of work is on everybody's mind. Uh, so, let me start more broadly, what trends do you see in the market today? Uh, well, I see a couple of trends where everybody first was used to 100% working from home. And it's a very level playing field. I have you on one screen and me on one screen. And no matter how many people I'm are joining, it's all fine. Uh, what we see now is uh, people are coming back to the office more. Right. Uh, but that leads to a little bit inequality because if eight people in a room and just one or two people are uh, joining remote that might feel a little bit awkward it might feel that you're just an onlooker to the conversation and not actually joining it so we are spending um, a lot of time and effort in making our offices nice meeting spaces to meet face to face but also have a lot of video capability and collaboration capability to actually work together and make it not matter if you are in the office or at home yeah the equality matters a lot what we see is that going forward more than 90 percent of meetings actually are going to be hybrid is that has been your experience where even the physical space you still have one or two yeah. participants joining remotely yes definitely we have basically equipped all of our meeting rooms uh, with video capabilities but uh, that's not enough because we've had eight uh, person meeting rooms before where it's just a square table with two people on each side Mm -hmm. But wherever you put a monitor, two people will have their back to it. So either we have to scoot <laughs> in. Um, so we're looking uh, now more at uh, triangly shaped Triangle. tables and doing something about the acoustics uh, in the room. Because before it was optimized to, you know, uh, cleaning and meeting. But now acoustics matter too. So all hard surfaces just won't do it anymore. So uh, that's what I mean by taking the next step, just putting in... Um, a nice Cisco system is not all there is to it. Yeah, that's interesting because what we see the, these days is that technology is almost intertwined in the design of the room. It becomes just part of the ecosystem. Um, and interesting you touch on, on, on the challenges because I think coming out of pandemic, everybody's trying to figure out their hybrid work strategy. What are some of the challenges that you're facing? Um, well, one of the challenges what we are facing is the spread in the office, where we have two very busy days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, everybody is in. On Fridays, it's like it's Saturday, nobody's there, and Wednesday, just a little bit. So what we are trying to do is um, make a spread more between when we have meetings, but also um, we are looking into uh, workplace management systems, looking at how we should design our spaces and have them more optimized to meetings. Because before we have like half and half uh, spaces where for meetings yeah. and spaces for work and concentration work, but we were lacking like individual calling yeah. spots yeah. where if I have one WebEx meeting with people abroad where I'm the only one joining remote, I don't want to be... We're just about to run out of time, yeah. so we need to jump to our next session, but thank Sorry. you so much for joining me in studio. Thank you, really appreciate it. All right, let's take a look at our next session.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, let me welcome to the stage my dear guests, uh, Mark, Chiara, and Pavel. Please come. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Elisabetta. Hello. Hello, Pavel. So once again, thank you for everyone being here today. We have the pleasure of speaking with uh, our partners and, um, and uh, also um, uh, dear companies who we are collaborating together for a long time to talk about um, their role and their journeys in, in their companies and portfolios. Uh, in terms of network automation and the, the role of automation in terms of network engineering and management. So this is our topic for today and the panel is supposed to give a little bit of more clarity about it and the clarity about the role of network automation and the rules uh, of that um, application in terms of today network environments. So with me today we have um, just a second, sorry. With me today we have uh, uh, Pavel Bukov, uh, who is the CEO of IP Networks. Then we have Chiara Rigale, who is a VP of Product and User Experience of Forward Networks. And then we have Mark Harris, who is from NetBrain, and he's a senior VP Global Marketing. I want to start with Pavel and ask him to briefly introduce himself and introduce, uh, obviously, um, IP Networks. IP Fabric, yes. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. IP I'm, Fabric. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Pavel Bikov. I'm co-founder and CEO of IP Fabric. I've been building and managing large-scale and global networks for over 15 years. And as also an ex-CCIE instructor, I saw the problems firsthand that we wanted to solve with our company by modeling entire uh, network infrastructure and ensuring security and reliability of uh, entire enterprise networks. Chiara, how about uh, Forward Networks and yourself? Sure, thanks. Hi, and welcome to our panel. I'm Chiara Regale. I'm VP of uh, Product and User Experience at Forward Networks. I've been with the company for more than seven years. And prior to that, uh, I spent uh, quite a few years in Cisco in various roles. My last responsibility was as a director of Insieme Business Unit, developing uh, Nexus 9000 ACI in the ecosystem. Forward Networks is uh, the leading vendor in a digital twin. We build a mathematical model that allows us to uh, make networks more secure, reliable, and predictable. Thank you, Chiara. And then Mark from NetBrain, tell us about yourself and, and the company as well. Great, great. Uh, Mark Harris out of California. Um, I'm actually one of the few people at this conference that has never done time at Cisco. Uh, I've actually been around the networking industry for about 40 years, and almost every other company that's done networking I've been part of. Uh, I've been in the data center, many, many different technologies that fill up the, uh, the IT infrastructure. NetBrain itself has been around for about 20 years, and we focus on network automation. Uh, we build a platform that has extreme uh, detail on an infrastructure, everything from interfaces down to uh, bits and bytes, and then we layer business logic on top of that, and that's where automation comes in. So we take that layer that is widely uh, uh, aware of the infrastructure itself, and we lay business rules on top of it and let automation manage that at scale. Thank you, thank you, Mark. So what we are going to try to cover today is how to unlock the value of network automation to simplify operations, to remove the errors that are happening during propagating policy and configurations in the network. So my, my first question would, um, would go actually to all the panelists, and it's really about the the role of this investment overall in a nutshell, how every company takes into their approach and how the go-to-market strategy is with that regards. And then what are the kind of behaviors that they all can see um, when they implement their solutions in our customers' portfolio and networks and what are the behaviors they can kind of observe and how they can address them? 
we can start with PubGIF. Yeah, so thanks. I mean, uh, just to ad address the elephant in the room, the, so we are competitors uh, <laughs> between ourselves. So the, I think a lot of what we are doing is around the uh, uh, overall observability and specific uh, goals of uh, every company. So we have a developed a system of baselining then uh, to enable companies to operate and innovate uh, based on their needs. And some of the interesting behaviors from technical operational intent uh, that are worth uh, uh, um, uh, assuring, such as um, uh, MTU mismatch or uh, various uh, duplex issues issues all the way to too many MAC addresses behind an access port or address family consistencies of BGP, all the way to the uh, contextual operational intent, such as that we want to have uh, access ports uh, secured with 802.1x, or that we don't want to have single points of failure on a certain path, or that the path needs to be secured. Uh, so our approach is to capture the entire uh, state and configuration of the entire infrastructure and every single protocol and technology that is involved there to make sure that all of these analyses are then available for, um, for when the enterprise wants to um, implement a certain type of uh, assurance. Thank you, Pavel. So, Chiara, how would that be from uh, your perspective and, and your company approach? As we said, you're all kind of in the same field, and yep. then uh, how how is that being implemented and at forward networks? Yeah, absolutely. So, visibility is a, a big problem in the customer that uh, we manage and we see. Networks are heterogeneous uh, on prem as well as in the cloud. And there are, there are really a plethora of tools that provide some sort of visibility, but where they lack is the end-to-end -end single source of truth. So where we at Forward bridge the gap is in providing a, a platform that is a, a network digital twin able to not only give visibility into the whole infrastructure from a configuration, from a security standpoint, and from a connectivity standpoint, but also to automatically validate that any change introduced, uh, being connection change or security change, is validated. This could be in conjunction to network automation, that is paramount for business agility, but also if you have a change management and you don't want to introduce any, any error. So uh, that's our approach. We have uh, multiple applications in the platform that gives this visibility. Uh, just to name a couple, uh, the search application that gives an end-to-end -end path connectivity analysis, as well as verification. Thank you, Chiara. So Mark, from NetBrain perspective, network automation can be applied to both enterprise service provider networks. So how is NetBrain applying your technology uh, into, into these companies? Yeah. I, 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 one of the things NetBrain is very, very focused on is viewing the network really from the top down. Because if you look at business leaders, each one has a set of needs. You know, the security folks have a set of needs that, they're require, that they require of the network. The applications people have a set of needs there. Uh, the data center people have a set of needs. And what it, you realize pretty quickly as uh, uh, topology kind of people, we've all grown up on topologies, is that from the bottoms up, we, we think about boxes. But from the top down, we think about services. And so when we think about managing services, all of a sudden you get light bulbs going off within an organization. And NetBrain focuses on managing the services and then ultimately the underlying boxes and, and transports and things are, are come into the picture. But we manage from the top down. So MSPs, uh, large enterprises, where they're focused on is my point of sale application running? Is my voice over P users experiencing good calls? So we come at it from the top down. Obviously there's a layer of topology underneath the whole thing. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Uh, so let's move to the next topic, which is mostly about the uh, the errors and on, on top of it, all the implications that are coming from DevSecOps complexity in the network. So what I'd like to ask my guest is, obviously, one of the most common errors that happen is obviously the human error, where uh, maybe a wrong configuration is propagated into the network. So I, I'd like to, to ask, what 
what are the steps that we can take from network automation perspective and network management perspective that we can prevent and make sure that the enterprise companies would, would let's say, prevent as many incidents as possible from security perspective? Yeah. Chiara, we can start with you, yes. <laughs> sure, absolutely, yes. my pleasure. Um, so what we see is that uh, network automation is very much needed, as we were saying before. But imagine uh, automating a, a misconfiguration, right? Is a, a, a big bomb exploding in the network. So misconfiguration on the landmines in the network, and uh, what we should do in, as an industry leader is really deliver a digital twin that number one, gives a, a visibility into the network, number two, provides a behaviorally accurate model that allows for quick troubleshooting and, and verification. Um, in forward, we have one specific application that uh, helps uh, with config audit and config drift avoidance. It's called Network Query Engine, or NQE, as we abbreviate it. And that allows our user to uh, query network information, configuration, and state as if it would be a SQL database. So the power that the user can uh, configure the checks that they desire to always pass config audit to their business needs and to the features that, that they want. Uh, and just an anecdote, NQE was built after understanding uh, one of the big network problems from one service provider in the US, where they couldn't understand the BGP configuration and correctness. So that was the use case that spearheaded the, the platform specific and uh, has been widely deployed uh, across our customers. That's a really great example. Thank you so much for the use case. Mark, how about uh, your approach? Yeah, there's actually two pieces of this. One, in change management, again, because we look at it from the top down, change management is all about making sure services work before you make the change, making sure the change happens, and then seeing what that did to the rest of the services that traverse that in those environments. So when we look at this, we're, we, we say, you know, let's, we, we call them uh, intense. It's really the behaviors. And so as we go through this, we, we focus on, you know, how, are, how can we proactively make sure that the behavior exists? And a good example is an HA pair, a redundant pair. We make sure that A equals B. That's something that you can proactively do. If you expect that behavior to exist at some point in a stress condition, condition, then you need to make sure that A always equals B. Otherwise, you're going to have some sort of an outage down the road. And so we kind of carry that through many, many different kinds of technologies and proactive behavior management, and that's really the enforcement that we do at the service level. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Pavel, from uh, IP Fabric perspective, so how would your approach look like in uh, preventing as much as human errors we can have and also simplifying the, uh, preventing those types of errors. Yeah, absolutely. It it's all comes down to what is the intended operational goal or the, uh, either in the form of context of a service or a technical uh, protocol or technology. That was a, large, a huge fallacy of the legacy configuration management tools which were able to only uh, determine if the word is present in a configuration. Is that something that I'm pushing, that the word is present, but what is the impact of that word in the configuration, of that sentence in the configuration? And one of the uh, examples in, in, in this uh, uh, case that I can think of is when we are configuring specific technologies or uh, like AAA and suddenly after a software update, exactly same configuration line suddenly has a totally different be resulting behavior. And validating and ensuring, continuously ensuring this resulting behavior is absolutely key to ensure uh, the overall infrastructure dependability. Thank you. Uh, moving to once those errors may happen, right? So, and then we talk about uh, the CVE, the, the common vulnerability and exposure remediation, right? As a, as a topic for, for the three of you. So, I guess what's critical here is to, uh, those tools exist, you guys, uh, provide those to, to your enterprise customers, but sometimes there are so many tools and, and so many also applications of those. So what would be kind of your recommendations to the customers in terms of selecting the tools and, and, and having the right way to implement it? 
I guess we can go with Mark this time first. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we've been doing for many years and, and we're very, really strong uh, outspoken about is using no code. No code allows you to take the smartest guys in your, in your environment and capture their thought process and their best practices into something that can be executed and repeated. So when you, when you look at the problems that, that occur, it's only dozens of problems. You know, I, I know we spend our days you know, solving problems over and over and over again, but you're basically reinventing the wheel. So when you, when you realize that there's only 50 problems that, get, that happen in a network, but they happen over and over and over again, you can now then capture your smartest thought processes and just keep applying them. And that's really how we come at this. We, automation allows you to apply these at scale, right? The same set of processes that are captured and now can be executed in an automatic fashion. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Chiara, maybe we can cover, so what is really the benefit of, of automizing the CV remediation and also overall your approach to CV sure. be interesting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so security is a, a center technology in the forward platform. And uh, by talking to our customer, what we learn is that vulnerability analysis is a very daunting process. Because many platforms give a list of CVEs, but this list is not actionable. When you have a large environment with many vendors or many platforms, how do you know which CVEs to first focus on? Well, how do you know how to remediate first? So we are connect, collecting from the NIST database uh, all the CVEs affecting the network that we model. But we went one step further. We can give contextual information on the configuration. CVE is tied to a vendor, to a platform, but also to features that are enabled on, on a given platform. So we can get that insight and surface to the end user just those CVEs that require immediate attention and they're relevant to the network. One problem that we see is the noise around vulnerabilities. Often SecOps are overwhelmed by the tasks they need to perform, they don't have time. It's something new that they need to absorb and there, there is no time. When our customer was telling us, when I need to provide an audit and I've been asked if we're vulnerable, I don't know, I say that we're not because I don't have the time and the tool to do that. So Forward aims to accelerate this analysis and again to reduce the noise and focus the attention on just what's relevant and requires immediate remediation. Thank you, Chiara. Pavel, uh, how about your approach? Yeah, so absolutely the context matters that uh, if we would take on the overall approach that in whenever CV is published, just upgrade to the latest version and there would be no discussion about that. Unfortunately, the world is not that simple. There are a lot of dependencies, context, end of lives, and various implications of either uh, specific uh, protocol or technology in use, a business criticality, and so on. Uh, capturing an, every single protocol and technology uh, that exists in the infrastructure, structuring that information, and being able to uh, correlate the actual CVE contents, not only from the impact on the specific version of our platform, but also on the, those individual feature set being used, uh, then gives the customer the um, uh, clear guidance of what to focus on first, and what to address immediately, and what can wait. Yeah, so, so if we are to summarize on the risk ass uh, assessment overall, uh, what would be your three points maybe to kind of summarize on de-risking the, from IT operations perspective that you would like to highlight once again from what we have spoken so far before we move to maybe kind of other aspects of the organizations? Uh, we can uh, we go with Mark again. Yeah, uh, de-risk, actually everything we do in IT is about reducing risk, right? It's either reducing risk or reducing costs. And so when we look at a network, you know, everything you do potentially has an unintended consequence if you're not careful. You know, there's many situations where you have applications today stepping on an application from before. So if I, you know, if I think about the three kind of bullets, it's, it's making sure that you're constantly thinking at the service level, you know, that's the first bullet. Making sure that you're constantly aware and, and have the ability to scale your solution, whatever it is, so that you're testing all of those across the entire enterprise. 
You know, you've got many, many, like, like I said, we've got some customers with 25, 30, 40,000 intents, behaviors. And so being able to do that, not statistically or representative or sampling, but actually test every one of those, that's really critical to network automation. And being able to do that so that you're aware of the ultimate end user experience, you know, that's another piece of this. We have to get to the point that we care about the end user, not the fact that the lights are blinking on the boxes. Perfect, thank you. Pavel, how about from your perspective, just to kind of put it in a, in a summary on the, especially on the de-risk process? Uh, so de-risking is definitely that is, uh, we were we are as engineering community averse to change because we know that it introduces risk. But I also believe that uh, not changing also then there, risks our risk? job. Is that yeah. to lost revenue in the future? We have to stay competitive. So uh, the, our view is that the main thing to consider is eliminating silos that exist between the individual products and technologies and approaches. There are multitudes of uh, various uh, products that are being used today and everyone has their own world view, point of view. So normalizing the, uh, the, the, um, the approaches of individual products in, into one uh, coherent behavior across the infrastructure then allows us not only to de-risk operations, but also provide us for the baseline information to be able to change faster and uh, at, at a faster pace while still reducing risk. Thank you, thank you. That's really, really great. And Chiara, from Forward Network's perspective, the I know I've, I've read, you know, we've been together preparing all of this, so what would be your kind of main kind of a approach towards the de-risk along all the tools that you have just talked about? So just to give us a little bit of a summary of, of the, that topic so far. Yeah. So in order to de-risk uh, your environment, your network, you need to have deep visibility. You cannot secure, you cannot protect, you cannot... Uh, um, have a good operation on something that you don't know. So the, the, the mantra at Forward is to provide really deep visibility in terms of a broader support for vendor technology and environment, but also deep knowledge of protocols through the full stack. Um, our digital twin provides layer two up to layer seven in depth visibility that allows our user to know at their fingertips really what's going on in the network. What's the behavior, what's the connectivity, what's the security posture. So once you have this in-depth knowledge, you gain confidence, and you know that any change that you apply in the network uh, is still backed up by the validation platform that, that we provide. So uh, visibility all the way is our approach to the risk yeah. in the environment. Thank you, Chiara. Let's continue with you in terms of Today's network environments, we have private, hybrid, public clouds environment, different type of traffics that go into the customer networks. So as, as Pavel mentioned, the risk, we can de-risk as much as we want, but the risks are there, right? And so what would be your kind of response to, to in a way of all the risks that can happen in reality while having this multi-complex environment in our customer networks? Yeah, definitely. So what we see and what we, we, we talk of every time with our customer is the fact that uh, environment are heterogeneous. On-prem networks, we all love Cisco, but reality is that it's a multi-vendor environment. Uh, in the cloud, uh, is multi-cloud. Uh, there are many platforms, many tools that try to provide visibility, that provides uh, troubleshooting aid, but all the information is, is this joint. So the plethora of tools available doesn't provide a single pane of glass. Uh, one of our, my customers was telling me, too much data is like no data because I'm not able to reconcile it, I don't know what to do with it, I don't know how to act upon it. So um, what we advise is really to provide uh, one platform that is the single source of truth across all the environment. And also we see convergence of tool in the industry. There are the security folks uh, that want to use and leverage the same platform as the NetOps. They want to have one single platform that provides uh, insight 
in data information for their role. So uh, having this digital twin that is accurate, is scalable, is easy to use, and really unlocks values, business, and use cases across all the IT infrastructure. Thank you. This is also applying right to an infrastructure like what Cisco does and uh, the advice of trying to reduce the number of, of multi-vendor environment as much as you can usually simplifies things. Pavel, what would be your response to, to this question? So the, the overall infrastructure uh, runtime for us to be able to have full predictability, there are just too many moving components for, for us to be able to accurately simulate every single thing. It is technically uh, impossible. So we can focus on either specific things or testing these technical operational intents or contextual operational intents such as end-to-end -end paths and specifying those as enterprise knowledge base that I know these things have to behave in certain way and then by changing some parts of the network, I can always validate has was there predict the result of this change, was it predictable, or was there something unexpected that some other part of the network somewhere far away on the other side of the globe has changed because of the route policy and community string that I didn't expect the result to. So having those tests of the technical intended behavior and the contextual or business intended behavior in terms of services, and validating them continues, uh, I think that's, that's the, the key part of, uh, uh, of, of this. Yes. Thank you, Pavel. So, Mark, from NetBrain perspective, what is the advice to the customers when they would go with multitude of tools for management and uh, in all of their complex environments? Uh, what is your advice? Yeah, one of, one of the things that I, I think everybody at this conference is, is dealing with is the fact that for many, many years, for decades, frankly, there's not been a lot of documentation. There's not been a lot of best practices. We haven't really written down how our infrastructures are built. Right, so now we're kind of playing catch up. We're trying to use visibility tools, observability tools. We're also kind of being pounded from the top with what the business line uh, owners need. You know, the service level kind of people, the applications, the security operations. So we've got this, this infrastructure that's fairly delicate that we're trying to catch up and build and document. Then we've got this set of needs that just keeps growing from the business down. And we're trying to figure out how do we squeeze in the tools to make those successful going forward. You know, so change management is a really good example. When we look at change management, you can make a lot of mistakes just by doing what you think is right. And so by constantly evaluating, did this change meet the goals? And then check with everybody around you, whether it's through NetBrain or whether it's you know, some other mechanism. You know, that's really what this is all about, is, is de-risking through this change management and understanding that the absolute end game here is to deliver services the way the business line managers need it. Thanks, thanks Mark. So b before I go to my next question, I actually kind of think of one more is like, um, let's just go back to our overall topic and like the, the, the real value of network automation, what your companies are doing. Um, I, I just wanted to give you some time that you can kind of go through once again and that what what is that you're providing in terms of network automation and how you you convince your customers about your approach towards uh, towards the, the investment in it. Chiara, let's go with you. Okay. Yeah, so at Forward, uh, we basically assist uh, uh, the acceleration of network automation. What I mean by that is uh, often customers are reluctant in embracing um, automation because again, if you automate a misconfiguration that has a, a huge effect on the entire network. Uh, the way we can de-risk that is by providing a platform that uh, provides a pre and post change verification such that uh, our users are confident about the network behavior and correctness before the change and after the automation, they can invoke us either via UI or via REST API and make sure that uh, the automation engine didn't break connectivity, didn't break security policy, didn't open any security breach. Right? So 
Uh, that's our value in the market in order to accelerate automation that, again, is very much needed for business agility, but at least uh, we can assure that uh, automation is done uh, with reliability and with safety. Thank you. Uh, Mark, what about NetBrain and the overall kind of approach in network automation and, and in, in today's environment, it's really simply impossible without it, right? So yeah. it's, it's, I think, your value proposition. Like yeah, it, it, it's really all about scale. You know, everything that we do in this, in this, in this world today is about scale. You can solve a problem individually. You know, any, any network engineer, anybody that's got a CCIE uh, uh, certification can go off and solve a problem or, or the equivalent for any other network vendor. But to do that one time is easy to understand. You can even write it down if you like. But to do that 100 times a week or 1,000 times a month, that's where this is. So automation allows you to get out of the sampled, representative sampled, you know, calling people escalations, but actually just codify that again, using no code the way we do it, but bring that to the table and say, let's just make this replicatable. Let's make it repeatable. Let's bring a little bit of smartness to this equation that we've just been brute forcing for years and years and years. You know, I did a session earlier today and I asked how many people are brute forcing it and making through every day with the skin of their teeth, frankly, and everybody in that room said, Sorry, you know, it was, it was very sheepish because we know that for decades we've just been throwing brute force at it. And that's where automation comes in. If you could just put that, make it executable, and then run it, run it, run it, that's where the automation really brings value. Thanks, Mark, that's excellent. And Pavel, right, so from, from your perspective, obviously the network automation and the network, easing the network management and, and, and engineering in a, in a company environment. So what is, what, what could you add more from, from like a, a IP Fabric perspective that you would like to address the audience? And uh, uh, especially from experience, I feel like network automation has always been part of our trade. Uh, back then in uh, Perl, Bash, uh, PHP, all of the other tools before Python as well, and all of these great tools. But there is this uh, either impact of misconfig misconfiguration propagation uh, or uh, just generally breaking things faster is that the uh, the, the key part that was missing from our point of view was presenting this uh, entire network source of truth where we can, uh, if, if the decision for the customer is either build or buy, and build is very exciting, but in two weeks time they will realize that there is another software version, there is another change, they need to update it, and suddenly it's no longer fun, it's just another job. And they don't want to do that job. So to bring in those, the, the structure and the, the knowledge of the community in one product as a baseline for them to then build those additional valuable business services and deliver services upstream to other business units directly out of the box. Thanks, Pavel. And so you mentioned you guys are all competing, right? Uh, but I want to talk about partnerships a little bit. We are at the Cisco conference today, and I want you to all talk about why ex partnering with Cisco and some of the best use cases that you can maybe share with the audience and with us, and how was that uh, working, and then we can replicate for other successful uh, implementations and customer satisfaction, obviously. Let's go with you, Pavel. Thank you. So Cisco, I must say, it's like Europe. That's not one homogeneous place, just as America isn't. And Cisco, individual business units. So I, uh, I would say that from our experience working specifically with business units that have customer success as their priority to uh, where based on the customer um, um, request, we work together and then we can deliver uh, um, the next version that is already compatible, so working between uh, with the uh, business units and specifically with Nexus 9000 business units, so what Kiara has mentioned, yes. to make sure that we are delivering uh, already a complete product 
uh, right from version 1.0 uh, has been uh, um, uh, a, a great experience for us. Thank you. Um, Chiara, um, you've been in Cisco, so that's yeah. maybe easier for you <laughs> in, the, in terms of partnership because you know how things work mostly internally. So tell us more about how do we partner? Yeah. What do we do together? Absolutely. So for us, Cisco has been a great partner through all these years. Uh, not only because we are sponsoring Cisco Live, we were there in Las Vegas, uh, we'll be there again this year, but we support uh, pretty much all the Cisco platform, from the data center portfolio to the enterprise portfolio, routing portfolio, security portfolio, even the, the, um, the desktop uh, switches, let's say. Um, in terms of joint use cases, it's always uh, uh, reinforcing the fact that we are solving together a real problem when it comes to visibility and observability. We had uh, multiple conversations uh, with various Cisco's team in basically augmenting your platforms to extend visibility to other vendors. Uh, uh, Cisco obviously is uh, Cisco specific. Yeah. We can extend that visibility across uh, the cloud, across uh, security vendors, across load balancer vendor, and really provide together and end-to-end -end visibility wherever application are deployed, uh, wherever customer needs it. So we look forward to continue this partnership and strengthen it through the years. Likewise, thank you, Chiara. Mark, how about NetBrain and Cisco? Yeah, uh, NetBrain has, has been a long connect, uh, partner with Cisco. You know, it, it, it's interesting because we have 2,500 customers and every one of them has Cisco, but yet they, they work with us because their whole, from their perspective, their world has more than Cisco, right? So Cisco, and, and we love working with Cisco, and we, we introduce you know, ACI support, people, yeah, that's great. Every device goes into an environment that has other devices, and I think that's the important part from our customers. So when we partner with Cisco, matter of fact, today here at the show, we had five or six hosts from Cisco bringing their best customers to NetBrain because they know that in that multi-vendor world, you know, it's really important to have visibility end-to-end -end and orchestration end-to-end -end and, and, and uh, automation end-to-end. -end. You know, we've got three, 400 uh, uh, vendors that we support with thousands of devices, but Cisco is a predominant player there. And so clearly you have to support Cisco in a full, non, you know, full end, end stop there mode. Every device from Cisco that you know, is in a modern environment is supported by NetBrain. And you know, Cisco makes it so easy to work with. You know, we've got lots of different paperwork and things with different organizations and you know, different groups doing trade shows and, and other things. But, but yeah, working with Cisco is tremendous and you know, we're very proud of the fact that we've been a long-standing provider, uh, a partner with Cisco. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes if there is any question from the audience. Uh, and um, I think this was a very amazing and insightful conversation, guys. Thank you so much. Um, let me just see if there is anybody interested in some questions. And if not, I want to thank you once again. And uh, thank you, see you next time. Next thank time. you, thank so you much. very much. Hybrid work is here, it's there, it's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here or here, there has to be someone here, making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead, log in from here, dial in from here, sit in from here, assured that someone is here with a view of everywhere, ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. My phone is at the center of my world. Life and work all in one wherever I am. And now with WebEx Go, I can easily balance both. Enterprise grade calling with my phone and an experience I'm used to. Personal calls are still on my plan and phone number, and for work, I make and receive calls on a dedicated business line with great call quality. I connect with clients, coworkers, you name it, 
on a separate secure mobile network without sharing my personal information. WebEx Go is built into iOS and Android, giving you the best possible calling experience. And that experience seamlessly extends across my WebEx workflow. Now I'm taking my business calling and my collaboration tools anywhere my work takes me. That's WebEx Go. Humans, a nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco wireless and DNA spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hard work has its place. But when it comes to managing your network, you want to work smarter, not harder. You want to accomplish more and stress less. That's where the next generation AI-powered Cisco DNA Center comes in. It simplifies operations through automation and shortens response times. So tasks that took days are done in minutes and sometimes don't need to be done at all. With Cisco DNA Center, you'll have the superpower of teleportation to virtually see and adjust your wireless coverage in any space in your network. You'll have AI-driven security to classify endpoints and enforce security policies across domains. And you'll be seamlessly integrated into the broader Cisco ecosystem for an unparalleled end-to-end -end network management solution, which means you'll spend less time worrying about your network and more time innovating. A classroom is no longer a room. It's wherever a student is. It's wherever curiosity plants a seed in a mind, sprouts wildly, and then demands to be fed. More, more, more. It's wherever someone asks why, or how, or what's at the bottom of a black hole. A classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn. Through secure remote and hybrid learning, Cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom. And we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world. Powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. 
Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. My phone is at the center of my world. Parker, I'm here at Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. Remember, if you're joining the event, use at Cisco Live and hashtag Cisco Live EMEA to let us know how much fun you're having. Now, I'm joined in studio by Haim Pinto. Welcome, Haim. How are you? Great. Thank you. Good. So thank you for being here. So you are the chief technology officer for our customer experience team here in the EMEA region. Um, so firstly, welcome. And are you having a good time? I'm having an awesome time. This is a great event. It's so nice to meet everybody over here face to face and get together to this fabulous event. It is spectacular. Amazing. Now let's talk a little bit about innovation. Um, you've spent many years um, in this industry as a CTO, I think at financial service organizations, Correct. right? Financial institutions. Um, and you've helped work through FinTech and through the uprising of cryptocurrencies as well. So you've really been at the kind of center of innovation a lot of, a lot of the time. Tell me, what does innovation mean to you? This is what Cisco Live is all about. So surprisingly enough, people expect me to say that technology is innovation, but actually <laughs> I see innovation in the people. Right. So if you empower the people and you empower your team, and I, I like to say to my team, it's, like, it's not about thinking outside of the box, but empower your team to build new boxes. And when you do that, you find that the innovation bubbles up from, from the field, and then you pick it up, you empower it, and then that's how innovation spurs across the organization. And we've had lots of our people and culture leaders. We had Kelly Jones in, who's our chief people officer the other day. So it's really great to see this show is obviously a lot about the technology and a lot of people come to hear the latest and greatest in terms of products and innovation. But we've also been focusing on people and culture. We've had the IT leadership right. program as well. So absolutely agree with everything you just said. Um, now, you often say that CX is a secret weapon to innovation, right? It customer is. experience. So tell me a little bit around why that is. So, so think about customers who are being faced with business challenges and they're seeking and they're sourcing technology to try and actually address those business challenges. There's always a gap between one technology domain and the other where we're working hard to bridge those gaps with features and functionalities. But CX really resides in those gaps, in between the things that weren't invented yet where we can actually partner with the customers and provide that innovation to connect those domains and address the customer needs. So yes, we assured that there is a spectacular and, and great customer experience and implementation and delivery, but also the added value comes in when we are able to actually meet those customer requirements to address their business needs and get them what doesn't exist in the market today. So that's where that ingenuity comes from the people that build it. Got it. And you are based in Israel, I believe, right? I do, yes. Um, this is sometimes known as the startup nation, so lots of innovation coming out there. I think we've had 17 companies that we've acquired from Israel yeah. alone, over $7 billion through the years. So where do you think the, the new wave of innovation is coming from? What do you see for the future? So everybody's talking about cloud over here, and that's been a topic for, for many years. I think that we'll see, still see some innovation coming out of that space, predominantly in two different domains. One is automation. Automation is becoming a critical part in any cloud motion, and technology is becoming more complex, so automation is, is necessary to actually help the professionals within the organization to maintain, build, and keep up with that innovation. And the second place is in the security side. So right. as you're expanding your networks and your attack surfaces expands, you actually need to address the new security needs on the cloud native platform. So I think CNAP, which is cloud native application protection platform, is going to be one of the key innovation parts for us to grow and connect with our customers. Amazing, and we had you know, a little bit around customer experience at the keynote, we had some really great use cases and customer stories. Tell me, how is customer experience and your team showing up at the event here today? What do you want people to take away from the event? So first of all, I would invite everybody to come over to the showcase and see some of that innovation. You will see some of the tools that were developed by our teams, uh, which you will not find in any of the Cisco catalog because it is, it, it is a part of the CX offer, so we come as a service and we offer those tools. As an example, we can actually reduce time to deployment from what used to take six months in a standard IT team to 15 minutes. Oh, wow. And for me, that is pure magic. So if you want to see magic, <laughs> come over and visit us. I love that, and I'm sure customers are also thinking that that is magic as well, right? <laughs> um, so we're here, obviously, Cisco Live. 
what you know you've said your experience has been really great so far what do you want people to kind of take away from the show i know you said a little bit around what customer experience has here right um i've been walking around the world of solutions i've seen you know the industry's team um has got lots of great use cases around how they're improving customer experience for the people that are watching the broadcast as well right. what resources can they use how can they learn more about customer experience so first of all everything is going to be available online obviously so you can do the research and watch the vod's as we move forward um, but but if you're here, then you know come over and, and look at some of the. We, we talked about technology. There's also social responsibility. We have a lot of offerings right now around sustainability, which is a key element in any growing organization. We want to grow the business. We want to service our customers, but we also be responsible. Want to be responsible for the globe. So uh, I would invite you to come and see some of our initiatives around uh, sustainability. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Haim, for joining me in the studio. It's really lovely to meet you here. Thank you for having We're now going to head out, out to Rob. You've got some apprentices and some interesting people for us to meet. So over to you, Rob. I absolutely do, Nish. This is one of my favorite parts of Cisco Live because this is where it most often happens, where I get to meet that next generation of successful leaders, engineers, and so forth. At least that's the pressure I'm putting on them here. Uh, these guys are part of the Cisco's apprenticeship program. And to explain that, even though you guys have explained it very well to me, I'm going to depend on you to do that one more time. But let's start with Rhiannon. I think I'm pronouncing that roughly correct. Can you explain the program, what your involvement is, and um, what's important to understand? Yeah, so the apprenticeship program, you start when you're a school leaver in most cases. So I was 18 when I joined Cisco, so quite young. And Cisco pay for your degree. So I do my degree in digital technology and solutions. There's also a business option. And throughout your time on program, you get to rotate around so many different parts of the business until you find what you're really passionate about. And then you find your place, you find your home. For me, it's in marketing and you graduate with a degree and you're paid full time as well. So it's an amazing experience. This sounds like something that I wish I had become a part of much earlier, but what kind of advice would you give to anyone that's looking to perhaps leverage this program for their own means? Mm -hmm. um, as an individual, when I was younger, when I was looking at this program to join, there was a lot of pressure to go to just traditional university and do what my friends were doing. So it was quite a big leap of faith to come into an industry so young, especially in corporate. But my biggest piece of advice is if you're interested, just do it. Just take that risk because you won't regret it and you will love the person that you become at the end of the program. Wow, that's that's pretty good endorsement, I think. That, that is fantastic because, I, again, I wish I had taken advantage of something like that or thought it, but I was on a completely different path when I was your age. This probably shouldn't even get into here because I'm not sure if it's safe for consumption. Uh, do you mind telling me your name and what you're working on now? Uh, my name is Regan Newman. Um, I am within the apprenticeship of my third year and I work within the Global Security Sales Organization. Um, here at Cisco Live, I'm working I, within the Network Operations Center. So, been here for since before the start, helping put together all of the switches, deploy them out, and make sure that all of these booths that we see here are all connected and uh, calling home. Yeah, that's one of my fa favorite parts of this is the network infrastructure that we put into place. And so, I'm curious, is this the most hands-on type of activity in a real type of environment with the pressure of performance that comes along with it that you've been in? And has that been a good learning experience this week? It absolutely has, yeah. So I joined with Rhiannon in the apprenticeship at peak pandemic. So as we were rotating around, there wasn't many opportunities, if any at all, to go in and get that hands-on lab experience and, you know, see how networks actually fun function physically. Here is the first time I've got that and I've got a wealth of it. So everything is made up for all of that time. I haven't been able to go and get that experience. Yeah, because I think all the it's one thing to do things in the lab, it's another thing to do them. And that, you know, and I say that even for marketing positions, because marketing is what I traditionally work with as well. You get in the reality and it's like your plan, the best laid plans fall apart. We just got to move on in a little bit, so we'll be quick about this. We gave you a microphone so you could speak yourself. Yep. With some being introducing yourself and your role. Yeah, so I'm a second year apprentice. Um, I joined a year after Regan and Rhiannon. Um, so not, not quite the pandemic, so I was able to go into the office and that kind of thing. Um, at the moment, I work uh, in Cisco Managed Services, and that's in like a network operation center for one of our global customers. So anything goes wrong, anything breaks, we get a ticket, we go and fix it, we, we log in and uh, make sure they're up and running. That's perfect. The service provider technologies to me are, are interesting. The way in which we're scaling, but the new things that are coming along and, and our, our traction in that environment is attractive. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. You represent yourselves well as the rest of the people we don't get to meet. Nish, we'll head back over to you in the studio. 
Thank you so much, Robert. So great to hear from the apprentices, and I'm really excited and honored that they're part of Cisco. So, great job, team. All right, we're heading to Steve now. He's just next to me in Studio B, and he is with Mario Sebastian Miguel, who's our Vice President of Customer Experience from Cisco. So, Steve, over to you. Thank you so much, Nish. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, this is great. I love being over here in Studio B. Everybody's doing such a great job. So, Mario Sebastian. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome into the studio. I'm glad you found time to actually do this. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure being here with you today. Uh, After three years, it's uh, amazing. Well, that was the last time you and I talked to each other. It was three years ago here at this event down in Barcelona. You know, I'm always amazed by CX. I love CX. I, I think the work that you, Alistair, the rest of the team is doing, it's such a vital aspect of our brand here at Cisco. And it's also such a human first story which really brings out our brand in the right way. You gave a great lightning talk innovation session earlier this week. Take us back to that. Give us the big picture, some of the top takeaways from that yeah, talk. Yeah, no, uh, great. So what we are hearing from customers this week and throughout the uh, last couple of years is that their increase in operating expenses and the complexity in managing uh, and operating technology is blocking them realizing their business uh, um, values and outcomes. So what we are here to offer, what we can offer from CX, is three solutions through our business critical services um, uh, elements. First is help them move from being reactive to proactive to preemptive. Second is when problems appear and show in the network how we solve them quickly and fast in an automated manner with software. And third, by having a stable environment, how they can really implement and realize the business outcomes. And we can offer all that through uh, business critical services that can be acquired either as a scrum or as an add-on on top of success tracks level two. Absolutely. Um, what do you see as maybe the main challenges that digital assurance and automation services are, are looking to solve right now? Okay, so as he said, it's, it's mainly helping them uh, in an automated manner, moving from being reactive when they have an issue to being preemptive. And to do that, we, we do that through uh, by offering three solutions. The first one is managed insights. So we leverage uh, the full stack observability of Cisco to identify what are, what are the issues going on in the network in a proactive manner, mm -hmm. so that we react before they are even detected by the end consumer, by the end customer. So we recreate the issue, we take action, and uh, we, make the, we implement the change. And the benefit of all that is that we reduce by around 25% incidents in the network which is, I think, amazing. And not only that, we do it faster because it's automated, mm. it's in software. So the speed of resolution is much, much faster than in the traditional way. So that's with uh, managed insights. The second one we offer is automated uh, incident and assurance, which is by um, uh, implementing um, the uh, Thousand Eyes solution of Cisco, we can correlate issues in the network and we can um, identify what those issues are, take corrective action and implement. By, and by doing so, we reduce the, uh, down, the downturn of the network by 95%. So it's very, very impressive. It's proven. And the third element, the third thing we provide through this service is, is assurance change, which basically means is that we help our customers with the testing and validation in their network so that whenever they need to implement a new feature or a new solution live, it's, uh, it's uh, implemented, all this change management is implemented automatically so that they, they can be faster and they can really focus by having a stable environment and a self-healing network on, on um, getting the business outcomes that I was referring to at the beginning. Perfect, perfect. So we've got a little about uh, one minute until we go to the next iTalk, but I quickly want to ask, what can customers expect from us? What is their takeaway? What is in it for them when they partner with us here at CX? Yeah. Super quick. So particularly CX, we are here to help our customers. As, as we uh, claim, we are the, the, we are the Cisco experience for our customers. So we leverage technology, we leverage human uh, intellectual property, and we leverage the full Cisco uh, breadth access to the engineering and the business unit to help them uh, have the best experience with Cisco and now in an automated manner. So I think it couldn't be better. Agreed, agreed. If people want to learn more about CX, where do they go? Of course, they can pass by the CX booth today. Uh, if they're not here with us today, uh, of course, everything is going to be online. So just connect to a Cisco Life event and they can have access to all the information that, about CX. Oh, that is so great. We're going to be spending a lot of time with CX over the next few minutes. Mario Sebastian, thank you again for taking time to be with us here in the studio. It's always a pleasure to talk. We love, love, love the work that CX thank is you. doing. We're very grateful.
Pleasure is mine. So in just a couple of moments, we're going to head over to our next iTalk, creating exceptional experiences. Remember to keep reaching out to us using social media with hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. As soon as the iTalk comes to a conclusion 30 minutes from now, we're going to meet you right back here in the studio. Let's go create some exceptional experiences right now. Away we go. That are all about how we are going to combine the best of human and digital. I will be joined by two friends and colleagues, Kuhn and um, Michael, that are even the best experts. And I'm delighted to have Martin Gysi from Swisscom, who will tell us, who will show us what we can achieve if we focus on what really is important for us and what is really important for you, and you leave the rest to us. Yes, because what we want to do is to make your lives easier. And before we talk about the how, I really would like to hear from you. So please scan somewhere the QR code, okay, perfect, and tell us which of your business challenges requires an automated solutions and which one an expert, someone that you can call and talk to. We will come back to, this, uh, to your answer in a while. One of the most important questions in the history of humanity was, and actually still is, which task, tasks should be performed by us and which one by machine? And the vision behind that, it's a perfect world. I already bought in this world, is a world where we do only what we really want to do. And if you think about that, what we don't want to do is dangerous tasks, repetitive tasks, tasks that require and consume a lot of time. And this is the real engine behind several of the innovations that we have had in our history. <coughs> this is even the secret of several successful companies, companies that were able to produce quality time for the customers and for their workforce. That's really what we want to do. Now, thinking about these innovations, let's do a step back into the history and let's have a look at one example of this innovation at its best. So please, roll the video. Around 1440, all Europe's books were hand copied and therefore amounted to only a few thousand copies. Yet by 1500, they were printed in the millions. All thanks to the innovation of Johannes Gutenberg, the German inventor who introduced letterpress printing in Europe with his movable type printing press. His innovation to create small movable reusable letters gave us the ability to print and reprint information instead of transcribing it manually over and over again. These small letters are standardized. They can be reused and assembled differently for other books. They are created from a community of people. This concept makes it scalable, fast, and economically very attractive. Thanks to Gutenberg, today we can use our time to actually write a book instead of squandering our talent by copying the ideas others have written down. I love it. Gutenberg's press, uh, printing press revolutionized the way we share information. It changed completely the way we learn, we work, and we live. And the reason why I like this uh, innovation is because it reminds me the first of our two innovations, that is digitized delivery. Digitized delivery is a game changer. No more static PDF documents and manuals that requires a lot of time to be updated, rather dynamic code-based, <laughs> did I say well, dynamic code-based digital asset that will stay up, will say state of art automatically. And to talk about that, please let me welcome to the stage Michael Camper, Senior Director and Head of Service Providers Architecture. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Oh, that's my. Now the difficult part. So coming back to what Adela just mentioned, uh, we are doing PDF documentations right now all over the place, and that's the standard. Why do we do this? We have got three reasons why we do it. We want to capture the intent of what we want to achieve. 
we are going to capture the results, that is the test reports in many cases, and we are capturing the instructions how to get from A to B. So keeping that up to date in the lifetime of a network is a pretty cumbersome environment. It takes a long time and it's a lot of human effort to keep all of these manual made uh, documentations up to date and also in the lifetime, if you do small changes to your environment, to continuously keep them up to date. So they are getting outdated. The second challenge is, it's PDF documentation. So PDF documentation is made from humans to be executed by humans. That means that every change in the environment you are basically executing as a human. If you take it a step further, you are going to move into an environment where we think if you change from PDF documentation to digital assets, you're going to have the uh, possibility to basically do this very different because the documentation is still done in a sense of where you are capturing the intent in a digital way, you are putting the instructions how to get from A to B also down in a digital way and automatically create the results. So the purpose is still the same. The way you do this is very different because humans are crafting the intent and the instructions and the machines are going to create the results. And once you've done this in your project lifecycle um, correctly in a full digitized way, you can repeat as often as you want because the machines are not getting tired. The machines can do this much faster than any human can do it and you're going to eliminate human errors. To take it one level down, we are doing this realistically right now with a couple of solutions. The first solution where we've introduced this and tried it out was ACI as a code. That is uh, done a couple of years ago. We have a good amount of customers on this throughout the implementation lifecycle, but also in operations meanwhile. We are doing this with SC Van right now. We are doing this in the IP transport space, and we are going to extend this along the way to many more solutions. That's the best of human plus machine invention because at the end of the day, humans are doing what they are most interested in and machines can execute flawlessly with the instructions given by humans. And for the geeks in between you, this is a full CICD pipelining, which is using Terraform, NSO, and uh, Ansible to get these things implemented. It is created automated documentation, automated implementation and testing and you can repeat it as often as you want. Am I right if I say that with this innovation we save time, cost and we even improve quality? You, absolutely. And if that's the case, I'm all in. Are you all in? <laughs> so yes, cost I have to say takes a little because you need to transform the organization um, to get into this you environment. You didn't tell me. You say that we get cost savings immediately. Well, Are you changing? No, you okay. need to transform okay. the environment with this along the way. So you're going to do three things. First of all, you're going to simplify the entire life cycle. You are simplifying the implementations because you can repeat and use the stuff you've built once many times. You are going to also simplify the operations because you will never ever have outdated documentation any longer. You have always up-to-date testing results, and when you implement changes, you're going to have a versioning of your networking, and you can roll back at any single point in time. It comes naturally. Now comes the cost piece. Transformation, because what is most complex to change is the habit. Oh, yeah. And the habit of creating um, PDF documentation to document things is a pretty old one. So the entire IT industry is living of this for a very long time, changing that habit to move into an environment where the code artifacts are living on Git and where you don't capture any longi longer in PDFs takes a bit and it takes education for the people. It takes um, a shift of your intentions to do this and it needs acceptance of the troops. And that takes a little bit of cost at the beginning of the journey. The coolest thing is you're going to move people, engineers and the entire workforce from a repetitive environment where people are replicating things and do it again and again what needs to be done into an innovation environment. So people can, instead of doing night shift windows to do massive upgrades which are, well, pretty boring, I found them boring when I did this in my past, into an environment where machines are repeating this very, very fast and uh, the only thing you need to do is to feed the machines at the beginning and let them do their job. So. I think it's pretty cool innovation. 
to sum it all up, we are going to have full, a full pure DevOps environment in reality. That is nothing which is existing on slides. That is something which we are doing all over the place right now. You are going to get agile execution along the way because project management and the way to keep it on track is very, very different than it was before. And it's creating automated uh, documentation, implementation, and test results all along, as often as you want. So it serves the needs for sustainability, it serves the needs for security, because if security threats come around the yes. corner, you can react much faster with this methodology than you would have been done, than you would have been able to do this in a manual environment. So, so it's a magic combination of sustainability, security and innovation. Absolutely. I love it. So looking into looking into something very specific, we have a long lasting relationship with Swisscom and we would love to introduce a very, um, well, very high-skilled um, engineer who is leading this environment uh, in Swisscom and to talk a little bit about reality. Swisscom is using from our biggest uh, Cisco 8000 platforms down to um, wireless access points. They are using a lot of pieces of our portfolio since a very, very long time. They use automation in case of auto, uh, they use NSO in the case of automation. And uh, probably most important, we innovate together with our services in the last two years, the transport platform of Swisscom. So, so without any further hesitation, please welcome to the stage Martin Gysi from Swisscom. Hello, Mike. Hey, Mike. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for coming to me because it would have been very dangerous for me. <laughs> no way to. <laughs> Martin, thank you very much for coming and thank you for really the long standing partnership and trust in Cisco. Before we go into the what you are doing, I really will do a step back and think about and talk about the why. Why did you start this transformation? Uh, that's a good question. We noticed that our old methods, our old development methods, they just did not work anymore. Uh, the time to, to deliver a new feature was too long, and when it finally got delivered, it was often of insufficient quality. Um, and as a consequent cost, you know. Yes. And also, the methods that we were using were not suited to an agile organization. We have transformed uh, to agile methodology and uh, organization uh, a while ago already. So we're no longer organized in silos, you know, that have a limited responsibility, a limited set of tasks, to uh, squads that have an end-to-end -end responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, now, we had to empower the teams to, with the right tooling to, so that they're able to fulfill this end-to-end -end responsibility. Martin, when you look into how did the innovation of digitized delivery state or change the status quo in, uh, in Swisscom? Well, all that digitized delivery network automation is a journey. So you can't do that in a day or two. Mm. You really have to set a goal, uh, persevere to achieve that. So it's not something that you can do quickly. But we have uh, some things that do pay off quite quickly. Let me give you an example. For instance, by really focusing on automation right from the beginning, we have been able to come up with a fully automated rollout process for our next generation uh, <coughs> business service edges. Um, so in contrast to bef before, there was no manual intervention by the network operation centers people at all. So everything can be done via a mobile application by the field engineer himself. That's one example. And another example where a network of automation really pays off quickly is automated testing. So I, I noticed that immediately by doing those repetitive tests all over again, whenever you apply a change to Git, um, you notice errors much quicker. Yes. And as a consequence, quality increases yeah. right from the beginning. And Martin, everything starts from the expectations, from the requirement. What were the expectations of the different people in the organization? Hmm. Well, our fin finance people, obviously, they want to get the savings right from day one. <laughs> uh, I had to tell them, well, it doesn't quite work that way. So give us a bit of time. This is an investment that will need 
um, a year and a half or two years, but I promise it will, it will pay back. So obviously cost is the first expectations. Then uh, operations also has high expectations mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, whenever people work manually, especially on a network, things will go wrong. Um, and the expectation is that this happens a lot less, <laughs> or not at all actually, so quality must increase as well. Now what's in for the engineers? Yes. They uh, have to deliver better quality at lower cost. How is that going to work? What's in for them? Uh, I think, you know, by getting rid of all the repetitive tasks, all the boring stuff, the night shifts, mm. um, that can be automated. Uh, and they can then focus more on innovation. Yep. They can focus on delivery, delivering the, the new features. They can focus on uh, writing those automated test cases. That's a very interesting job. I've done it myself. It's really good fun. Um, so all, all that, I think, uh, is uh, enriching the job profile of the engineers. You talked about um, skills and processes. So how did the processes change and what did you need to do with the skill set of the uh, workforce? Yeah, if, if, if we think back of how we developed uh, in the old times, we had very uh, separate skill sets like the, the network development engineer who wrote the template and maybe uh, an engineering manual. That was then read by someone from the, uh, an IT person who wrote a uh, a specification that was handed over to an IT developer who wrote code. Um, that code then gets delivered back to some test engineer. Um, he probably figures out it doesn't quite do what it was expected in the first place, so that cycle repeats all and over again. Uh, and when it's ev eventually of good enough quality, it's passed on to a test engineer. Um, and uh, the the operations person uses that code to roll out the feature in the network. Now, all these different roles, they basically have to come together mm -hmm. yes. to form what I would call a, a net DevOps engineer. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of many skills that you have to yes. acquire. And I think it's important that we support the people mm -hmm. by, by uh, giving them a set of standard tools that they can work with, mm -hmm. kind of making a yeah, a common vocabulary, uh, a common set of process and tools, and that's how we can help them in, in doing that. Yeah. Final question. What does this mean for your end customers? Hopefully nothing. I mean, they should not notice that at all, except for maybe one thing, that the quality gets better, so their services, they just work. Um, we can deliver new features at a higher pace. Mm -hmm and uh, lower the costs, so uh, I don't know who would profit from that, maybe. Let's hope that the engineers get a pay rise. That's a huge you know, benefit. But you know what, you, you said it very well, because this is exactly, exactly our intent, what we should do at Cisco and at Cisco CX. We should make all the complexity, the technology invisible for our end customers. They should just enjoy the experience, and that's what we want to do together. Now. Why don't you stay with me and we have a look at the Slido answers. Please, if you can pull it up. Okay, so that's the first and is about the business challenge that you would like to be solved by human. Innovation clearly is, uh, I think it's a hit. And so as Michael, well as I think that you will be busy in the next uh, yeah. few days or few years with all this innovation creativity. I'm sure. It's all about you. I'm sure. It's not Good. about, this is, it's all about the engineers, right? Yes. Instead of doing Correct. boring things, yes, they, that's can, the point. they can bring new things and they can innovate and be creative along the way to solve the complex things. And the complexity as well. Absolutely. Agreed? Yeah. What about indeed the second, the automation? So the by automation, mm. we should do deployment, simple and compliance. Oh, compliance is an important one because, yeah, we, we know that it's becoming more and more top of mind for everyone. And we are going to discuss about that even with Kuhn. So with that, I would like to thank you for coming and for sharing with us this amazing innovation. It's going to to change the way we deliver. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, please welcome to the stage Kuhn Bastians.
Vice President of Customer Experience in North. And with Kuhn, we are going to talk about the second of our innovation. It is all about the evolution of the customer experience portfolio. So Kuhn, welcome. And before we start talking about the customer experience portfolio evolution, I really would like to hear more about what customers and partners are telling you in these days here at Cisco Live. Thank you, Adele. Look how wonderful it is to be here live yes. in Amsterdam with all of you, all our customers and partners. And as a slide you already indicated, you kind of confirm most of our conversations, mm -hmm. where we talk to our CCIE communities, our technical experts, our IT leadership. Digital evolution, or call it innovation through digital evolution, is really, really top of mind. And it's happening across every industry and really at incredible space, mm -hmm. which you, I'm pretty sure you all feel. Mm -hmm. But let's first give a perspective of how we as Cisco help our customers in their digital journey. We will hear from one of our Danish customers, Nerlis, how they're actually enabling the Danish society on that digital evolution. Nerlis is rolling out fiber to literally every corner of the country, connecting farms, rural areas, businesses, and as such, helping the society to, uh, to evolve. And as Nerlis is also a utilities energy company, they tie this to their sustainability goals. But instead of me talking, let's roll the video. Being at the forefront of the fiber movement is an incredible journey. It's not a place where you get a lot of second chances. High-speed internet is more or less a fundamental thing for people living. Every outage is, is critical. My name is Thomas, uh, I work at Norlys uh, in our fiber division and I'm the network planning director. Norlys Fiber is the largest fiber net in Denmark. We have more than 800,000 addresses that we are currently supplying with fiber and we have more than 1.7 million customer relations within the entire Norlys group. As Norlys is a giant cooperative, we try to make sure that everybody within our community get the same possibilities as everybody else, basically ensuring that everybody will have access to high quality, high speed internet. Cisco has been with us since the beginning of our fiber adventure, and now everybody's craving fiber. And everybody in the service provider space knows that scaling the network is the one crucial area where you can really shine or you can really falter. And Cisco helped us through our entire expansion. So looking to the future, we are trying to provide a sustainable green network that provides high-speed, quality and stable internet, future-proof network uh, through the entire Danish society. That is our obligation and that is the sole vision to make sure that everybody gains the same possibilities as everybody else. Woo. So so you've heard from one of our happy customers, and actually <clears throat> pretty proud at Cisco, we help uh, our customers to digitize the society. And as Thomas in the video said, we were there with him from the start of their fiber adventure through the full expansion. Our human experts, and now I come to the team of expertise and digital, are working with him on architecture to enable fast and smooth rollout, but also on the operational side of it. Now, Thomas said something very particular, he said, how we help him mm. managing his security risk. And you can imagine for a company like that, that is absolutely crucial. So let me go slightly deeper on this one. Through all our analytics and insights, our experts, network security experts, are tailoring and specializing recommendations for Thomas and his team to keep his network compliant and to actually keep it safe. But Kun, you, you touched a very important point, security. Everyone is talking about security. Security is top of mind for everyone. The question is, why us? Why Cisco CX? So when you engage with Cisco services, you actually get access to our world-class solutions consultants. Their expertise has been built on 35 years of successfully transforming business. But not only that, all this is powered by insights, which we harness from 50 million installed equipment and other 3 million cases where we get all the analytics from. So the result of that one is a true unique combination mm -hmm. of this human expertise, this human brain, built on analytics. Fantastic, right? Think about what we hear. I should say that, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adele. <laughs> but think a little bit of what is happening AI these days. It's all over, right? 
think about what's happening with the likes like ChatGPT. If you start evolving and combining all of this, it's unbelievable what is possible. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, right? We still need that human brain. We still need that passion on innovation, as you clearly indicated over here, and solving the world complex business problems. But I have a surprise for you, a bit of off script. We actually have Thomas in the room. Oh, wow, this so is Thomas, nice. <laughs> join <But> us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And, and I have one simple question to you. Would you be able to do that if you do with our team with ChatGPT? So, so basically working with uh, CX is to me all about uh, human relations and trust. He said quite well. He said it Thank really Thank you very much, Thomas. Really, really well, right? <laughs> this is super. Thanks That's fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you very Thomas. much, Thomas. <laughs> and, and now, Kun, you came here to talk about the CX portfolio evolution. You didn't start yet. Please tell us more about it. L let me know how we really sell yes. this, how we really dis put yes. this together. So the human approach, brains plus digital expertise combined, actually keeps evolving in our portfolio. And we've built our portfolio, evolved our portfolio on two different approaches. The first one is business critical services, where we take a human first approach. Our consultants work with your teams across all architectures, across all the life cycle, and across every use case. But all this powered on those insights we harnessed. On the other hand, our success tracks portfolio take the opposite pro approach. We start from a digital first approach through CX Cloud as the unique one stop digital platform, and from there, augmented with digital expertise. And we keep innovating on this one. And I come back to the same topic, particularly for the engineers, I'm part of it. We won't be replaced soon by artificial intelligence. We will be here again, Adele. It's good to hear. <laughs> good to hear, um, Kuhn. Now, you mentioned a, a lot about customers, about human, digital, but you didn't mention an important key element of our ecosystem, partners. What about partners? What's their role? Absolutely important. We are not only on this journey with our customers. We are on this journey with our global partner ecosystem. Right? Through partner lifecycle services, we actually empower our partners to deliver services across the full lifecycle under their own brand. And here comes now the beauty of the approach. Mm. Within partner lifecycle, through APIs, we actually share those insights through our partners. We share that value to this on which they can build their own portfolio, their own targeted versions of services to this one. This actually gives a lot more choice to our uh, end customer, a lot more flexibility. And also our partners are specialized in specific outcomes, gives us way wider scale. But let me go back to what Martin and Michael so beautifully explained. All this innovation, digital delivery, we are actually working on embedding that in our future generation and expose that with our partners. And I think that is really true innovation at scale. That I love, as I said. Thank you very much, Kuhn. Thank you for sharing with us. And now, I will be brave. I will, eh? I will stand up. Thank okay. you, Kuhn. Thank you. <laughs> so now, before we close this session, we have one more surprise uh, for you. So please, if you can scan the code, we are going to launch a competition. If you please can submit which is your innovation that you would like to start at your business in your company, we will select the best idea and the winner will have two weeks of our expert working with you in order to kick off this innovation. And finally, if you want to have, if you have any question or curiosity or feedback, please come and join us at the CX booth. Martin, uh, Michael, Kuhn, and why not Thomas? They will be there uh, with me in order to answer to your question. And with that, thank you again to Martin, Thomas, Michael, and Kuhn, and thank you for coming today and listen to us. Thank you very much. Right. Welcome back, everybody. So glad to have you with you here in Studio A. My name is Steve Moulter. You are live with us here on the show floor in the hub, part of the streaming broadcast, tuning in from all over the world. We have just wrapped up another fantastic iTalk. In just a moment, 
We are going to head out to the CX booth where Cedric Duvalder is going to bring us a behind the scenes chat with Michael Camper, Adele Trombetta, and Conrad Bastiens. Directly behind me, we have our social media team back over here in the social circle. They're waiting to read all of your tweets and to repost your photos. So keep on posting using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. We want to see your experiences here at Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam in person, whatever you're doing at home or in the office or anywhere you happen to be. Right now, I'm going to turn the cameras over to Nish Parker, who is hanging out over in Studio B with our Director of Growth Initiatives, CX Media. Danny, some more Nish, let's send it over to you. Thanks so much, Steve, and hello, and welcome to Danny. How are you doing, Danny? Hey, how are you? I'm it's good, great thank to you. to see so many people here, so much energy, we're all in. Right, and it's great to be back right in person and Absolutely. to get all those, those interactions. Um, so we've talked a lot around smart buildings here at the event. Um, we've been out to the wider solutions, we've seen some of the demos. So tell me, you know, what is, really stands out to you? Why should customers care about smart buildings? Tell me what's exciting. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Truth be told, every customer we talk to comes to us and tells us a priority for them is to digitize their assets, their smart building, right? For us, we see this as a transformation initiative that they are taking, right? And there are several reasons for that. First and foremost, the user's expectations are changing a lot, right? So different generations coming in and being employee generation X, Y, and Z, they want a different approach to work-life balance. They want flexibility. So the life and work are a bit intertwined these days, right? And they expect from the workplace something different, right? So this is the first one. Second, another important um, pillar and driver is the focus on sustainability. Sustainability is not anymore just a compliance. Of course, buildings need to be um, certified, lead certification, yes. fire, what have you, but there is also something else happening, right? Um, employees want to work for companies who have a corporate and social responsibility, who are committed to a responsible use of resources. And of course, the energy crisis and the increase in energy spent are also driving priorities. Third, last but not least, the maturity of the um, IoT devices, right? The proliferation of more technology the evolution is driving an easier way to digitize and transform. All these together make it happen and make it a reality now. Amazing, and let's talk a little bit around why Cisco is going to be the best partner to help them do that, right? right. Um, like you said, we've heard about hybrid work, we've heard about it in the keynote, lots of the innovation talks being focused on it. Let's really just kind of summarize, what are some of the technologies that Cisco have, our own team that we have, you know, how can we help customers in this transformation towards more digitization and smart buildings? Absolutely. Listen, there are two ways to approach modernization of buildings. A customer can go to all the vendors in the market and come with point solutions, right? right? They will have hundreds of offers. They wouldn't know what to take from. They don't know which one will meet their business needs, et cetera. What we believe in CX, we want to help the customer step back and think holistically, an outside and approach. I would call this more of an experience-centric approach rather than a technology approach. So we look and understand what does digital mean for that very specific customer. Everyone has his own definition of smart. It can be about energy saving, it can be about attracting talents, it can be about being at the forefront of innovation. So we step back and we look holistically and build a service catalog that is very much bespoke to all stakeholders in that specific building. Once this is done, the rest comes very easy. So we have a service catalog, then we design an enterprise architecture that is secure, future proof that avoids vendor lock-in because we don't know what we don't know what tomorrow will be made of right yes, yeah. and underneath this we have all the digital infrastructures that will enable passive active infrastructure in the building that will enable actually the digitization so this is a different approach that we take to the market for sure, and here at Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam, uh, we've got a lot of technology tracks and a lot of the technology that you just mentioned there, right? And some of those capabilities is what we've been showing our audience, where, you know, wherever you're watching from. Um, so tell me a little bit around, um, you know, specifically around smart buildings. What can that transformation look like for customers? And some of them are going to be earlier in their journey, some of them are going to be later. What advice do you have for those kind of starting out? And then some of those that have more mature strategies in place, how do they get started? Uh, absolutely. What I would, um, when we talk to our customer, what the first thing we tell them 
is let's step back a little bit and think what does smart mean for you. Regardless where they are in the journey, you may have some buildings that are partly digitized, right? But you want to know what is the vision you are taking, what is it that you're trying to achieve? So thinking holistically, what is it that you're uh, trying to make? Then you do an impact analysis. This is what I have in terms of capabilities today. This is what I need to build later. Yes. And we have fantastic teams you can go and speak to. They tell us about um, our experience and they will help you shape actually your digital vision and then execute step by step through it. Right? Danny, thank you so much. That's some really you. great insights. We're now going to head straight back to Steve. So Steve, over to you. Thank you, my friend. Great job, really appreciate it. Nishinar, thanks to Danny as well. You know, CX really is one of my favorite Cisco stories, as I always say. CX really creates leadership in this important role of bringing our technology together with our people and with our partners. It is all about helping partners exactly like you to transform from the traditional product resale business model to a value-added life cycle growth model. CX is helping your customer to extract the most value possible from their investment in you and from your brand. We're going to head out to the CX booth right now on the World of Solutions show floor where Rob has tracked down Adele Trombetta, Con Bastiens, and Michael Kemper to dig a little deeper into digitized delivery. So Rob, how you doing? I am doing great, Steve, and thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the weight off of saying full names in that introduction, so that gives me permission to not have to deal with it. I am here in the Innovation Theater where I've captured a few executives as they've come off the stage so we can get the rest of the story, so to speak. And Adele, you just where they are, I caught the tail end of it and such, but Adili, I'm sorry, I'm being corrected in my ear and I apologize. But, um, so tell us, what, is, what has really stood out this week for CX? Look, first, the emotion, the excitement. Why? Because we are finally back in person. And then it was all about uh, innovation, was all about sustainability and security, of course. Finally, we have discussed it with our customers and partners how we can use the technology in order to make the complexity disappear behind the experience. And that's what we are going to do. Well, and that is a constant battle with the customer experience, right? Because yes. you've just got this ever-changing landscape of challenges to overcome, but you guys seem up to the task and you've been pulling it off. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to have you step aside and we can bring in Kuhn. You gave me permission to say Kuhn, correct? Yes, okay, I'll morning. make sure I had it right. Okay, well, fantastic. I was curious from your perspective, first, you mind giving us uh, your full name and what you're responsible for? Kuhn Bastianza, I'm responsible for the customer experience organization in the Northern Europe. So actually I'm playing here at home with Amsterdam being part of my region. Did you have to travel far to get here? Uh, not at all, <laughs> very close by. <laughs> and then something I'm learning this week, did you ride a bike or did you have a transportation with a motor attached? Actually, still with a motor attached, but I'm looking forward to that bike in the future. Absolutely. Perfect. I'm very quite jealous of the whole biking culture here. Well, let me ask you, because I think huge uh, talk in the industry, beyond the industry, but especially when it comes to customer experience around AI, ML, it's taking jobs, you know, hey, we're going to be able to use this instead of people. Some people are scared. What's the right way to think of the value of the human brain versus what we're getting from AI, ML as it applies to the things that you're continuing to drive forward? So actually, let me first go back to the AI ML, the data. As we have information from roughly 50 million devices worldwide, 3 million cases, as a human, you can't process that. But a machine can actually derive a lot of insights from this one, an awful lot. Just think about the security information we have these days. But you also heard the session. Thomas actually worded it fantastic, way better than any of us. The human brain has that expertise and built that trust with working with the customers. And it's really that about innovation and not only about innovation, driving that next step point. And that makes it really cool, that combination. I think that's the perfect match we need to work on. It does feel like there is a good uh, case being made for these generative AI tools, for instance, that we're seeing, especially with chat and things of this, the interaction, that these are good tools to assist and to put the right information in front of people faster, perhaps, and, and continue to find new ways to be productive. You agree with that, I believe? Uh, fully, and I'm sure they will keep on playing a bigger role. And I think also Michael touched it through the uh, um, automation piece. That will take away a lot of work. So our people can really focus more on that innovation, business, technical, architectural innovation. It gives a lot more time and opportunity for us. And actually a lot more fun in the end. Yeah. Absolutely, Kuhn, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. We'll wait, bring Michael over here real quick. And so he was just referring to you, I believe. Um, yeah, did I get your name? Did I pronounce your name wrong as well? No, I'm correct. I'm Michael Kemper, it's all right. 
<laughs> Excellent, thank you. So tell, uh, tell me what you're responsible for at Cisco and CX. Yeah, so I'm running right now the SP architectures and uh, the SP architectures basically do whatever we do with SPs and uh, that is the entire service provider industry in mobile, in fixed, in cable and uh, also the hyperscalers. So we are helping them and supporting them and uh, my teams are responsible to deliver. Why would you say it's important to digitize right now? Because I think the, we are not short of work, right, uh, all over the place. And um, what we can do as soon as we are digitizing, we have the possibility to do things much, much faster in a much more economical, viable way. And we can focus uh, the innovation of our engineers uh, and the time of our engineers on innovation instead of replication. And that is hugely helpful because, as said before, the threats are getting bigger than ever before and the turmoil in the entire industry is pretty huge, right? So you need to react fast, you need to be very nimble, and you need to be super precise, right? Because an outage, um, wherever it is, is going to be disastrous usually. So preventing those outages and building systems which are able to tackle challenges fast is just the baseline. Well, when it comes to digitization, uh, what do you recommend to individuals that are looking to increase their skill sets and get started? Kind of broad, but what kind of things would you suggest? So what I believe is a good baseline, and that is what we are recommending internally, is to really look for a definite baseline certification because that is going to give you the vocabulary. It will help you to understand the baseline of the toolings which are out there and is going to help you to look into exactly what you need, right? Because it's, it's a kind of fundament, if you speak that baseline language, you have all sorts of capabilities and all sorts of possibilities to take the next steps. And that can be in many directions, right? But the baseline has, the fundament has to be right. So final question, I'm curious what you're doing the rest of the week, what's your focus even after you leave here? It's top of mind? So what, I, what I've been doing this week, and that was amazing, I've been sitting in, uh, in a specific lab for three hours, and that was the edge of my reign. To be very honest, I'm super impressed by the engineers who teach, and I'm super impressed about the audience, because they've been all much faster than I have been. So I figured out that I need to learn a lot to become an engineer again, because I, that's where I come from. And um, I think the sessions are amazing. You find so many people which are so good in such a condensed environment. The breakfast talks, when you meet people you haven't seen and which are presenting all over since the last 25 years, when you see new faces, when you see customers, that is just amazing. And for me, the rest of the week, meeting customers, doing interviews with you, yeah. and, uh, and really enjoying the innovation which we see all over here. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Absolutely sorry I got the wrong hand there. Thank you very much. It's all about people, it's all about relationships when we come here. In fact, I had a chance to get out and ask a few questions around the show floor, and I believe we have a video now of that experience. Let's take a look. So Cisco Live, for me, is all about learning. I've been coming here for years, and it's all about how much can you learn in what period of time while you've got all the experts in one place. So we thought it'd be fun to go out and ask everybody, well, as of right now, how much you learning? The number one thing that I've learned at Cisco Live is to be prepared. There's so many things here to learn. I learned a lot about business values strategic values, uh, a lot about different certification. You can learn about anything from the dark web to Starlink to new networking capabilities and products. It's really amazing. We had some talks about UCSX and um, UCC. Pretty interesting upcoming um, technologies in combination with uh, WebEx. New ways to fulfill our needs. Yeah, main topics for me is looking into uh, full stack observability, cloud technologies, big deal for the future. Cisco is going full in on many services and that's really exciting. I'm really proud to be here. It's great to be in Amsterdam. I love it. The number one thing I've learned at Cisco Life is what an incredible company Cisco is. Amazing. Sometimes learning is just simply about reconnecting. Either way, what's been your experience? Oh, fantastic job, Rob. Great, great, great conversations. Welcome back to the studio. I hope you are having a fantastic final day of Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. Keep on reaching out to us on all social media channels using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Remember, if you have missed any moment of the broadcast, no worries. It's all good. It's all waiting for you right there in the on-demand library at CiscoLive.com. So, 
Now we are going to move out of CX and into Cisco's Emerging Technologies and Incubation, or ET&I. This next iTalk starts in about 40 seconds. It's called The Power of Yet. Developers are going to create over 750 million applications in the next three years. Well, that rapid scale and deployment requires an evolution of microservices interconnected by APIs from cloud and SaaS providers. Tim Segetti is going to show how Cisco is helping developers to discover, connect, and secure APIs with deep observability so they can deliver exceptional application experiences. Enjoy the iTalk. We're going to be waiting for you right here on the other side, back in Studio A. Hope you have a great time, and away we go. I don't get it yet. I can't do it yet. I can't solve it yet. Yet is a very small but powerful word because it can change the way we look at problems. Instead of seeing limitations, barriers, and obstacles, we can, see obstacle, we can see opportunities instead. Opportunities for learning, opportunities for growth, opportunities for creative thinking and problem solving. And it also acknowledges that there's going to be an investment on our behalf, an investment maybe of time, of energy, persistence, but it's also what fuels innovation. It drives us forward. And this is something that Cisco is very familiar with as we've been leaders in innovation for decades. For example, let's briefly recap some of the key areas where we've done some innovations. I've actually been with Cisco now, 20, this is my 25th year. When I started Cisco, we had a very different logo. And does anyone remember what our original mission statement was? It was to change the way that we live, work, play, and learn. How did we do on that? If we just do a brief recap of some of the innovations we pioneered, and not just in isolation, but with other technology leaders, but powered by Cisco networking, security, or collaboration technologies, we've seen that we've done exactly what we set out to do. Let's take just a few examples. For instance, if we look at the way that we live, one aspect of the way we live is how we navigate our place in the world. If we would come to an unfamiliar city 25 years ago and you want to get around, you'd need the map. You'd have to obtain a map, orient the map, find your place on the map, find your destination, plot a course, and track your course to your destination. Do we do any of that anymore? No. GPS technology is so ubiquitous, we don't even give it a second thought. But beyond just GPS technology, in conjunction with high-speed wireless technology, road-to-vehicle technology, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, wireless communications, we're actually realizing a long-held sci-fi vision of self-driving cars. It's becoming a reality, and it's powered by Cisco technologies, like we're, we're talking about, these wireless ones. How about changing the way that we work? I remember when I first started Cisco, if you wanted to have wire connectivity, you wanted to be connected to the network during a meeting, you got to the meeting room on time and you grabbed an Ethernet dongle and you plugged it into your laptop. And if you were late to the meeting, you, they ran out of dongles early and that was kind of an incentive to get there on time. <laughs> we don't even think about that anymore, right? Wireless is so ubiquitous. But not just wireless technology, but Technologies like hyperlocation, sensor technologies have changed the way we work. Just one aspect of that is all the advances made in robotics and automation. We can use these robots to perform high precision tasks, dangerous tasks, or even menial tasks like vacuuming our floors at home. What about the way we learn? This is a bit exaggerated, but it's a fair representation of what I remember school to be like, a university particularly, is carrying out around a lot of books, backbreaking in your backpack, and then sometimes you would receive assignments that would require you to access specific books in the library, and then everybody made a beeline to get those books before they were all signed out. 
Well, we have access to the world's libraries anytime, anywhere on our devices. We don't ever give that a second thought. We've transformed that aspect of the education. Or think about the transformation in our education that just happened a few years ago, globally, in response to this unprecedented pandemic, where all around the world we had to move from an in-person classroom experience to a virtual classroom experience, and this was accomplished typically in a matter of weeks. This required massive changes in network volumes and traffic patterns, massive increases in loads on the infrastructure for collaboration, and yet all of these technologies came to play to enable this global, rapid, immense transformation in the educational experience. Or what about how we used to play? I remember playing games like Mario Kart and uh, Gran Turismo at the time I started. But uh, now, thanks to high-speed networks, Wi-Fi 6, 5G, we're able to have very fully immersive experiences here. AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality, metaverse. And then these technologies actually have transformed the video game industry. Did you realize it's larger than the movie industry and the music industry combined? at $20 billion a year. But these technologies can be used for more than just entertainment. They can also be used for educational purposes or even life-saving purposes. We have surgeons that use ARVR to perform remote surgery when there's a trauma patient that's uh, miles or thousands of miles away. So tremendous advances here in, in these technologies. What I'd like to do today is to introduce you to the part of Cisco that's responsible and chartered with driving the next generation of innovation for Cisco. And this is Cisco's Emerging Technologies and Incubation Group, the R&D arm of Cisco. And we're using a very different approach than traditionally for innovation. Where traditionally we love technology, we often would have a technology first approach saying, oh, what can we solve with this technology? And what can we do with this technology? We want to pivot and use a venture-based approach. And this is what we're applying now to say, start with the big business problems that our customers are challenged with. And then find the right technologies to address those problems. So for instance, getting to know what are the problems that are keeping our customers up at night? We well, might say, well, there's a lot of those. But we could filter further by saying, what kind of business problems are you tasked with that if they're solved, could lead to somebody being promoted? Or if these remain unsolved, could lead to somebody losing their jobs? Those are the big business problems, the ones that will really drive impact and, and value to our customers. That's the one kind of problems we really want to look, uh, run after. And there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of challenges, and this is why there's also a lot of technology opportunities out there. And now, this presents a new challenge because you can't run after everything. You have to be selective. And it's like, what are the problems that we, our customers are facing that we also have unique capabilities and skill sets and are well positioned to bring something to the table that nobody else can? And so in order to identify those type of opportunities, we've adopted a framework that we call degrees of innovation that say, OK, look, we can make our existing products better. This is a first degree of innovation. But really, the business units are best suited to doing this. They know their products. They know their portfolios. They know their customers. They drive the roadmap. They're the best positioned to do this type of innovation where we focus on are driving technologies into new markets, whether these are adjacent markets where we don't yet play, but we play in something connected to it, or entirely new markets for Cisco, or maybe even markets that have yet to emerge because the technologies have not reached sufficient levels of maturity. So in my brief time today, I want to show two aspects of innovation that we're doing. One near term, which we've already fully incubated some solutions and are available for you, our customers, to start using and consume. And I'll show you where, the, I'll demonstrate them and also show you where you can download them for free. And then also I'd like to talk about some innovation that's farther out and why we're in the space, for instance, of quantum computing, cryptography, and networking. Okay, sound good? So let's start with modernizing the application, the focus area where we have near-term, fully incubated solutions. So 
according to IDC, 750 new million apps in the four-year period leading up to 2025. Think about what that means. That's about one new app for every 10 people on the planet within four years. That's a phenomenal rate of application development. How is that even possible? Well, to understand this, we have to go a little bit back in time. What's really caused this shift and the rep that rapid rate, that exponential increase in how quickly applications can be developed? Traditionally, applications were written in what we term now as monolithic code, where every part of the application was part of a single huge executable. Single tier, single function, every component to support the service was written into that executable as subroutines. And it wasn't very modular. It was very, uh, like if you wanted to change one subroutine and, and then have, a, have that reflected in the app, you'd have to get a whole new version of the entire monolithic application. And it was also very tightly coupled to either the virtual or physical hardware that it ran on. Now, with the advan advances in virtualization technologies, which further accelerated with containerization technologies, we could break apart this monolithic architecture and independently containerize these subroutines and then have them modular and independent and autonomous and allow them to be interconnected in a variety of ways and they can be repurposed over and over again and therefore allow for greater flexibility and speed in application development. Think about it this way. Basically, what this architecture has done for applications is what Lego has done for the world of toys. Prior to Lego, if you wanted a toy, you would go to a toy maker and they'd build you a custom single-purpose toy. Here's an example of a very ornate dollhouse. And this is actually here in Amsterdam, in the Rijksmuseum. Can you imagine the time, effort, expertise, and talent that went into producing this single-purpose toy? Tremendous. It's, a, it's amazing to look at, but just think about that investment of time. And then, when the need arose for a new toy, you'd start the process all over again. Whereas about 90 years ago, a carpenter in rural Denmark decided, I'm not going to build toys, I'm just going to build blocks interchangeable blocks, modular blocks, and let the kids connect them and build whatever they want. If they want a dollhouse, build a dollhouse. When the need arises for another toy, build another toy, and another toy, and another toy. And then you can do this with great speed. And you don't have to have the same deep level of expertise as the toy makers who originally built those custom purpose toys. Not only that, but it allows for tremendous scalability of these applications, because then these application components could be spun up when demand required them, and then also spun down when they were no longer needed that demand. It allows for scalability and resiliency. You could have your application deployed many places, on-prem, in the cloud, a combination, globally distributed, whatever suits your business need. And to our original point, it allowed for the speed of application development. It made it very fast for application developers to develop new applications, reusing code, recombining logical elements in new and creative ways to meet ever-evolving business needs. But if we look at this architecture, let's take a second look at it. Coming from a Cisco Live audience, and maybe a networking background like myself, CCIE, 20 years, active, not retired, not emeritus. When I look at this, do you know what I see? Perhaps I see what many of you see. This is nothing but a network. You replace those microservices with routers or switches, it's a network. It's a new realm of networking that never existed before. Inside the application, connecting these parts of the application together, and like any network, it requires secure connectivity, observability, policy, management, all of the things that we've been doing, and nobody does networking like Cisco, we've been doing for decades. And now we're bringing this expertise to this new world. 
So I'd like to introduce and demonstrate two new incubated solutions that are available for use in this space, the modernizing uh, application space, that uh, function, uh, perform these functions that we're calling out. The first one I'd like to introduce is called Callisti. And it's important to recognize that within a Kubernetes application and infrastructure environment, the default networking policy is any-to-any -any in clear text. That is non-encrypted communication. So there's two ways that you can solve this. You can put the burden on the developers and say, you've got to make sure that every microservice is encrypted, and you've got to deal with all your certificate rotations and all of that stuff but that's extra load on them. They don't want to be focused on that. They want to focus on the application logic and develop applications as quickly as possible. With Callisti, we say, no problem. We're going to handle the encryption for you by default. And the first thing we're going to do is turn encryption on everywhere and manage all those certificates so you don't have to. Makes it very simple, very easy. It lifts that entire burden, and it drives a tremendous amount of consistency in that infrastructure, the application infrastructure environment. More than just encryption, it also enables us tremendous amounts of visibility and observability. We can drill down into any of these microservices and take a look at all the different dimensions of their uh, performance. We can even set service level objectives or look at the health and monitor the health of any given key performance indicator that contributes to the health of these applications and then make sure that our applications are performing as intended. In addition to this, we can also manage traffic. For instance, I see here that I have a version of my movies application that has three different versions available for use. Well, I could, I could have traffic equally load balanced on them, but maybe I want to gradually introduce the newer versions into the production environment and see how they perform. Traditionally, I would do this by managing the... Um, pardon me, we'd be managing the custom resources via YAML files, and then we'd have to have a high level of expertise to manipulate these files to make that happen. Whereas we can simplify this and make it very easy to do within a tool like Callisti that just says, you know what, tell us how much traffic you want to send to each version of that application, and now you don't have to be a certified Kubernetes administrator to achieve that result. It can be done very, very quickly and easily. And then finally, one tremendously new powerful feature that we've added is that we offer all of these benefits not just to applications that are synchronous in nature, that is, have a re re request reply traffic pattern, which is what these architectures are most suited to, but also to event-driven applications, streaming data applications like Apache Kafka. And 80% of the world's leading companies use Apache Kafka, and yet we give a turnkey solution for Apache Kafka that includes not all the benefits of Kubernetes scaling up and scaling down dynamically, but also all the benefits of mesh technology, encryption, observability, and traffic management. Now, let me show another product that we're already released and have available to you called Panoptica. Now, Panoptica's focus is cloud-native security. And so the goal here is to shift cloud-native security left, that is, earlier into the continuous integration, continuous delivery cycle. For instance, as a de development operator, DevOps engineer or a site reliability engineer, I'd have certain views of my environment, and I can see how everything interconnects, but with the slide of a switch, I get to provide the same operators with the view of their environment through the lens of security. Where are all the vulnerabilities, whether they're software vulnerabilities, whether they're API communication vulnerabilities, whether they're network connections and policy uh, access, and all of this detail is provided for them. Not only that, but I can monitor the software, not just in my runtime environment, but even in my CI-CD pipeline and recognize that application developers will just be grabbing software wherever is most convenient to them, like GitHub or other repositories, which may have vulnerabilities and, and, um, and, and some threats associated with it. So I can identify all of these, and I can drill down into any given image and then see 
What is it rated from a common vulnerability score? Are there fixes available? And I can even drive policy that says, if it's risky like this, I'm not going to even allow it into my CI CD pipeline. I can examine all the layers, whether it's libraries, dependencies, and so forth, apply industry benchmarks, and finally also have a software bill of material. This is tremendously valuable. Think back to a year ago when Log4j came to uh, our attention globally and the vulnerabilities associated with it. The next question to answer is, where is Log4j in my network? And a tool like this would help us to identify exactly where it is and then even set policies on that. And finally, I just want to share one last quick point, is that we don't we recognize that there's a talent shortage in this area. So we want to make it very easy for our customers to harden their application infrastructure environments. And so we've driven and developed the frame, this industry framework called the MITRE ATT&CK framework for orchestrated container environments. And these are all well-known uh, threat vectors as well as some best practices for how to protect yourself against them. Each one describes a given threat, the best practices for remediation, the tool also identifies where these threats are present in your environment. And just with a few clicks, it allows for operators to set policies to harden and prevent and, and block that threat. It makes it very easy then to use and to, to consume. OK, so we've talked now about a couple modern application solutions, Callisti and Panoptica. Let's shift gears entirely now and talk about innovation that's farther out specifically in the field of quantum. So what are we doing, and why are we even doing anything in this space? So first of all, quantum computing. And uh, it's going to buckle up. Bear with me. It's a complex topic, but it's, it's, it's actually really cool. So it's exploiting behavior called quantum mechanics that doesn't follow the rules of classical physics. We'll talk about some of them. But to begin with, let's review how computers work today. For 70 years, computers have all been based on transistor technology. A transistor is a small electric circuit with semiconductors that can either hold an electric charge or report if there's no electric charge present. If there's electric charge, we call that a logical value of 1. If there's no electric charge, it's 0. And there are billions and billions of transistors in your electronic devices. For instance, Apple's latest M2 Pro chip has 40 billion transistors in it. OK, so a tremendously powerful tool. But here's the thing to keep in mind. A transistor can only hold one state at a time. It's either a 1 or a 0, one or the other. That's very important, because that's a key distinction between quantum computers. In quantum computers, we use qubits. qubits uh, actually leverage some of these subatomic particles, either electrons, and observe how they're spinning, or photons, and observe how they're polarized, and then use these to represent bits, one or a zero. But here's the difference. The bits represented can be one and zero at the same time. Is that easy to wrap your head around? It's not for me. Does that make sense? Probably not. And if, you, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't feel that you're alone. There's nobody that has the full explanation of this yet. Not even the Nobel winning nu um, nuclear, I'm sorry, physical theorists are fully able to explain this behavior. But we don't have to fully understand a behavior to use it. For instance, think of light. We don't fully understand the nature of light. Is it a particle? Is it a wave? But we make practical use of light all the time. It's the same with quantum. So think about this. A qubit is kind of like a coin. A coin can have two states, heads and tails, right? But while you're flipping the coin, what was the state while the coin is being flipped and in the air? Is it heads? Is it tails? Does it even matter? Not really. What matters is the final state. When the operation is complete, one specific state is reported, and only one, and that's the one that matters. So that's how quantum computers work at the very fundamental level. So what does that mean? That means that the operations can be performed at two values at the same time. This is a concept called quantum superposition. What 
that allows then is parallelism, fantastic amounts, exponential amounts of parallel processing. If you have one bit, you're actually performing computations on two values at the same time. You add another bit, two to the power of two, now four values at the same time. You add another bit to the computer, you're now processing values, eight values at a single time, simultaneously. Do you see how this becomes exponentially more efficient and more powerful and faster? So how does it compare to a regular computer? Well, the world's largest, currently, the world's largest quantum computer has 127 qubits. How does that compare to its digital counterpart? That's how many values, incidentally, it processes simultaneously for every computation. So let's compare it to a digital computer. It would be 158 million times faster than its, its digital supercomputer equivalent. So think about this. If you spun up a job on a traditional supercomputer, during the golden age of Greece, 2,500 years ago, and you let it run before Rome was even on the map. You'd see the rise of the Roman Empire, the fall of the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages, the Renaissance, all the way to our modern period, and now it completed. You could perform that same task on this quantum computer in one minute. Phenomenal amount of performance gains and potential available in quantum computing. Now, that's not all. There's another exciting promise that quantum brings, and that's the concept of entanglement, where these particles can be associated in a unique way so that a change in state in one is instantaneously reflected in the other, regardless of how, how far apart they are. And they've already done labs. Like, for instance, this seems to break Einstein's rule. But remember, quantum mechanics doesn't follow the rule of, qua of classical physics. It breaks them all. Even Einstein called this kind of behavior spooky. And so even Bell Labs has already proven the transfer of information in such distances that would be 10,000 times slower via the use of light. So it's phenomenal to consider. You could actually transfer information any points in the universe, theoretically, using quantum instantaneously. On Earth, it doesn't really matter that much for terrestrial communications, because you can send and receive signals with about 125 milliseconds of latency any points on the planet. But think about what's happening already with the exploration to, say, Mars. How long does it take to, and they're, they're launching something even in the next couple of months, some orbital missions, and how long does it take to send and receive signals from Mars? Well, it depends on the orbits of the planets. Like if they're really close together, <laughs> close being a relative word, it takes about five minutes. If they're extremely far apart, it takes 20 minutes. So you ask a question, you're waiting for an answer, it could take up to 40 minutes with quantum, be instantaneous. But not only this, a more down-to-earth use case, if you'll pardon the pun, is key exchange, crypto key exchange. You have no need of a third-party trusted intermediary to make a secure key exchange with quantum. And there's no media to transmit that for somebody to tap into, to eavesdrop, to do a man-in-the-middle interception. Additionally, another crypto benefit of quantum is that you can't clone anything that's encoded in a quantum state. So again, a great promise of security, but at the same time, quantum does present some very present and real challenges. Let's start with a couple technical ones. Decoherence. Quantum computers and particles require very specific states to be maintained. They're sensitive to temperature. They're sensitive to EMI, electromagnetic interference. They're sensitive to humidity. They're sensitive to vibration, so on and so forth. They are in massive, super con uh, cooled units that are shielded and, and guarded in so many ways. It's very difficult to maintain this. Not only that, we talked about entanglement. It's only available for a very, very brief period of time. Yes, quantum computers are fast, and they can perform a lot of operations in even that tiny window of time. but that's a real limitation for making practical use of entanglement for communication and crypto and so forth. And then the biggest problem 
The biggest industry-facing stressor that Quantum is bringing to the table is Y2Q. Or it's like a repurposing of Y2K, for those of us who remember that. And it's the time that it takes for quantum technology to become commercially available and crack existing encryption today. Which begs the question, 97% of the world's traffic is encrypted. And the majority of that is encrypted by the advanced encryption standard 256-bit algorithm. It's very powerful, very popular. How many quantum bits do you need to break that code? You need 6,600. And you could break it in real time. Every single packet, as it comes in, you decrypt as it arrives. OK, so how long before that becomes commercially viable? Well, if we take a look at IBM's roadmap and the progress that they've made in their chipsets for qubits, we can see it's probably three to five years out. Three to five years out, and all the current encryption that we're using today can become null and void. This is what's keeping nation states up at night, keeping companies up at night, and even individuals, what that means to personal privacy. So what is Cisco doing in this space? Why are we playing in this space and doing research and development? So first of all, the biggest problem to solve, yeah, cryptography. And we have deep and extended expertise in encryption. We've been doing virtual private networks and encryptions for many, many years. And we have a lot of expertise. And we're already developing algorithms that are quantum resistant. Not only this, but we see that quantum networking produce, uh, provides another opportunity for Cisco to bring its unique strengths to the table. We see that quantum computing is evolving very similar in a similar pattern to how mainframes evolved in the 1960s. You'd have a few of these machines very geographically uh, distributed. And yet, any one of these quantum computers, just like any one of the mainframes, would be more powerful if internetworked with its peers. So absolutely, the goal to internetwork these will also be manifest. And then the question comes, are you going to have two networks, one for traditional bits and one for qubits? Or are you going to converge that? Cisco is a leader in network convergence. We did it for voice, video, streaming data, everything. And so we really can bring our strengths to the table and experience and thought leadership. And then finally, photonics. We talked about all these quantum computers we talked about were based on electrons and observing the spin of electrons. And they are very sensitive to the environment. That's why they're in super cooled environments. That's why they're in shielded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, there's another way qubits could be represented, and that's in the polarization of photons. Horizontal polarization, horizontal polarization or vertical polarization. And photons are far less sensitive to the environment than these electrons. And we, Cisco, have deep photonic expertise, particularly in our optical business. So this is something we want to take a very close look at and see its viability. These are very far out thoughts and directions and areas to explore, but we're already starting that work. And we want to share this with our customers. Now, before I go further, I, I, I don't want to leave the misimpression that we're only doing research in two areas. Just because I had only enough time to talk about two areas, the modernizing of the app and quantum, I don't want to leave you with the impression that's the only areas we're doing research in. But a picture is worth a 1,000 words, so I'd like to share a one-minute video that shows the many and diverse areas that Cisco is doing research in.
Okay, so I'm out of time. All I want to do is recap that Cisco is and remains a leader in innovation. We have new solutions available for your use today, as well as we have new session tracks at Cisco Live. Look for ETI, and if you want to learn more about Panoptica, it's the first session, 2005. The other one's on, I'm sorry, that's Callisti. The other one, 2511, is Panoptica. These have already been given here, but they will be on CiscoLive.com on the on-demand library next week. Come see us at the World of Solutions at the extreme far end. We have our cloud native solutions, as well as then you can download these platforms for free and start using it and benefit from this research and innovation. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to attend this session. I know time is very precious. Thank you for attending Cisco Live. Enjoy the rest of the show. All right, and welcome back to our studio, coming to you live from the Hub. Tim Zagetti is on his way over here right now. In just a moment, I'm going to grab an interview with him. But first, we are going to head out right now to the world of solutions, where Rob is going to bring us a couple of demos over at Panoptica. Rob, how you doing out there? I am doing fantastic because we get to talk about security, Steve. So excited to be over here because we're not talking about just any security. It's kind of a space that Cisco is really getting into an aggressive manner more directly, which specifically Panoptica, it's a Cisco product, service, software, but it's, it's all about cloud native security and what we're doing to secure these workloads in ways that a lot of people aren't paying enough attention to. To help explain it, Tim is joining me here. Tim, I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, Rob. So tell me, um, what's important to understand about what you're accomplishing with Panoptica and what do you want customers to, to know about how to use this? Well, the important thing is, is that cloud native applications aren't just about the workload. So it's not just the container and the Kubernetes environment that it's running in, but it's also the API security that goes with it. Okay. So it's not just who can talk to who and at that API security, but what communications they're actually having, what endpoints they're calling, yeah. what data they're sending back and forth. Because it's usually very opaque, right? So yes. we don't know what's going on, and just because we uh, people make the mistake, myself included, all the time, which is it's working, I quit trying to mess with something. Uh, but a lot of times we need the ability to see in there and control some things at that degree and not simply assume that that everything's going well, so to speak. Do you mind showing us how this works? Sure, absolutely. So from a Security perspective, there are usually three things I like to focus on. Visibility, right? What all is running in my workloads? So, and from the runtime view, I get a complete list of the workloads running in my Kubernetes cluster. I can actually drill down into a particular workload and see the comprehensive assessment of security that comes with it. So not only do I have that visibility into the workload itself, the container as we call it, yep. but also all the parameters that go around it. So is this thing available to SSH, SSH into? Uh, has somebody modified that workload after I submitted it? Because keep in mind, in these cloud native environments, infrastructure as code, you know, uh, Git ops are very important. So all this stuff needs to be in a repository somewhere. So if it's modified after it's been submitted, that doesn't match what's in the repository. And so now we have a discrepancy going on. Are you setting up some, um are you setting up a foundational level of new workloads or inheriting a basic set uh, to then move forward on and then can be customized as necessary based on their specific needs? Or do you have to watch it? Because it feels like you work in a very dynamic environment. Workloads are being created all the time. They're being modified right. all the time, spun up, destroyed. How do you keep track of that? How does that attach itself? Exactly, and, and that speaks to the visibility issue okay. because developers are publishing functionality features all the time. We see that not necessarily uh, in the work or the runtime view, but certainly in the API environment because these services are going to uh, deployed repeatedly, and so we now need to know what services are deployed, what API endpoints are getting created, what visibility there is between them. And so then we can look at the risk findings for all these vulnerabilities, yep. and I'll just scroll down to some interesting ones about you know, leakage information and so forth. And right. so we right. get that visibility, both workload, API, and then the new emerging space of serverless where we can ah. see their functions, right? So. Now that they've been divorced from, you know, working with the infrastructure teams to deploy in a Kubernetes environment, they can just publish to the cloud, we have even less visibility. And so Panoptica can integrate with your cloud accounts, pull the list of functions, and assess them in a similar way as container security. All right, I'm going to need to flip over in a second and Absolutely. see the other side of this, but is there one final point quick to make that we missed? 
Make um, sure I didn't forget to ask you something. No, no, sure. Uh, I would say that just keep in mind that the application as a whole has multiple components and too many folks focus on one. They either focus on API security or workload security and we're taking a comprehensive view to things. Well, that's perfect. Tim, thank you so much. It's great seeing you again, Rob. We're going to talk to your peer just around the other side of the booth. Follow me over here. I apologize. We're going to kick you out. We're going to bring this gentleman a microphone here. Yvonne, where, let's see, did Tim keep the microphone? Here we go, Tim did. Perfect. Yeah, we have a limited set of microphones here, supply chain from what I understand. No We're working through it. Um, Contrast for us real quick, you're showing a different angle on how we're working right. with these workloads. We talked security there, this is Calisti, uh, yeah. and it's all about cloud native observability, correct? That's correct. So Calisti is a cool product that allows you to make a better management of your cloud-based uh, native uh, applications, so uh, modern applications on Kubernetes. So for example, just by deploying Calisti, Calisti is deployed as another application on your uh, cluster, uh, you can have three basic main pillars. For example, the first one is security. Just by deploying Calisti, you get all your links encrypted. So this is the first one, and this is out of the box, just by deploying Calisti. So, uh, you know, this makes a lot of more sense in this new containerized world in which you don't know if your workloads are going to be sitting next to each other or they can be in a different country or they can be 100 kilometers. So you cannot be doing clear text communication between workloads and that used to be clear text for Kubernetes. Kubernetes by default is clear text. So just deploying Calisti, you get rid of the problem of the security. Well, immediately I love the visibility and just the, the real world language you can put to this <laughs> to kind of demystify the a, a complexity of trying to view mainly, the cloud. How do you view a cloud? Yeah. Mainly because you have to think that Calisti works all in, in one cluster or also in multi-cluster environments. So when you are running in a hybrid environment with different clusters, they can be running in different countries. So security is a main issue here. Yeah. So encryption is something that you really have to take care of. Second thing, uh, or second pillar of Calisti is the uh, observability. Instead of dealing with a... Um, um, you know, uh, CLI line commands with no uh, visibility at all. Now you have a topology view, for example, in this case, let me grab to this one, which is easier, that shows you how your workloads are doing in every single moment. You can click on any of them, and Calisti will take you about all the statistics, of the health statistics, and uh, will show you all the charts uh, with the number of requests per second, yeah. and all how it's doing in terms of um, let me show you a workload in which you can check how you are doing with your memory, with your CPU, rate, latency, etc., etc. So, uh, top, um, visibility, uh, observability is one of the biggest things that we can get out from Calisti. And the third one, and this uh, and the, the kind of the most powerful one, is the idea that you have to do some traffic steering, traffic management, so you can introduce some policies into your application. So you can decide how much, for example, how much traffic are you um, driving to each of your containers depending on how you rely, how you thrust on them. For example, we have a new container here, a new version 3, and we don't, uh, it's a new release. We are not very confident that it will perform properly as yeah. the old one. So we just decide to introduce a new policy that only oh, push like that. a 10% of the traffic to that. Yeah. So, as long so as you're saying these new workloads, you really don't know, can they handle the stress just exactly. yet? Let's let's scale it in. Exactly, yeah. slowly, so we, oh, can, like we can check, we can monitor how it's performing slowly, and if it's performing okay, we will expose it to more, more traffic. And gotcha. that also can be checked by the fact that we can go back in time and see how our uh, application was doing in any singular moment, in any particular oh, moment. So, you can go back in so time. I can. I can go back and check how was my cluster performing. Look at that, I had a lot of issues so because forensics. I yeah. inject some fault. So that's awesome. basically Calisti, a tool that helps you to deal with all yeah. these new cloud native applications. Well, Yvonne, thank you so much, especially because we were, we were telling you we're going to do one thing and then we said, no, let's <laughs> throw them into it. We're ready to go. So guys, a big thing to remember when it comes to cloud native workloads, it's a combination of very fundamental things. We've been talking about this throughout the entire week. And that is the fact you need security, and you need observability, and you certainly don't want to ignore that when it comes to your cloud native workloads and everything that feeds off of those things. Very important areas to cover. With that, let's go back to the studio with Steve. Rob, thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it. Fantastic demos. It's so good to be there in the ETN to iBooth. You know, Cisco has got such a long 
rich history of innovation, and now Cisco ET&I is really driving that next generation of technology innovation. So, let's continue that conversation, because I've got Tim Segetti here with me in the studio. Hello, Tim. Hi, Steve, how are you? Thanks you so much for- You rushed me. straight on <laughs> yeah. over from that fantastic iTalk. Um, congratulations, really, really nice session, great content. I really love what the BU is doing right now and how quickly the word is spreading across the Cisco ecosystem and out to our partners. So let me start by asking you, what is different about ET&I versus how Cisco has approached innovation in the past? You know, that's a great question, Steve. I really appreciate it. Uh, at Cisco, we love technology and we love it so much that sometimes we've, we've uh, just started started with technology saying, hey, uh, what are the key technologies we see developing and what can we do with it? And that's a technology first approach to innovation where it might lead to something that's valuable to our customers or it might lead to just another science project type of thing. Right. Whereas if we start the problem or start by examining the problems that our customers are facing and start from there and then apply like a venture-based lens on our technology investments and engineering and so forth, then we're able to stay focused and on track into actually more consistently delivering some innovation that's of specific value to our customers. So this is the, the, the pivot, if you will, in the change in lens of, hey, instead of starting with technology, the tools, Right, let's start with what is it that you want to build and why? You know, I need to build a house or I need to build, or whatever the task is, I need to repair a car, then find the right tools to do the job versus, hey, I got this really cool tool, what can I do with it? So that's the change, a business first, venture based approach to innovation. It sounds so natural, doesn't it, right? Listen yeah. to what our customers <laughs> and partners are telling us and build to suit their particular needs. Yeah. So what are the primaries of focus right now for ET&I incubation at this stage? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one key focus area we covered in the iTalk, which is modernizing the application. And so we have two solutions that have been fully incubated and now are available to our customers to download for free. No feature limits, no scale limit, I mean, no uh, function limits. The only limit is scale. Uh, if, but if you need to scale beyond that, we can talk. Sure. Calisti.app, Panoptica.app, we want our customers to start using it. You know, take it for a test drive, put it in your environment, see the benefits we're bringing to you, and then keep on, you know, we'll go from there. So modernizing the app. Then, the next area where we're going to have solutions in just a few months at the Cisco Live uh, US timeframe, it will be in edge. So in edge operations, in edge artificial intelligence. And the challenge is here, for example, is that the footprint at the edge is very different than in the cloud. So in the cloud you have infinite bandwidth, you have infinite compute, infinite memory. At the edges, everything is scarce. Mm -hmm. You got a little bit of footprint on maybe a camera or an access point or a network device, and then how can we use that efficiently? Can we cluster those resources together to run more complex apps? AI is a very complex, type of uh, application and algorithm, but it makes sense to do this at the edge whenever possible. Think about if we had to run AI to detect a specific event, maybe you know, um, you know, all these cameras watching the stadium and we want to make sure that people are kept safe and we're monitoring for a specific type of behaviors. Well, rather than stream all of those high def streams to a data center, right? Uh, it just would make so much more sense if we could achieve that kind of outcome at the edges and make more efficient use of the capabilities we have there and make it simple to operate. So these are some of the challenge areas that we're, uh, we're incubating and we're near ready to launch and look for some interesting things uh, very soon. That's very cool. Yeah. Edge Native is so exciting on this. And, and I got to hear a lot of that when we were out at KubeCon uh, in October in Detroit. Right. And everything was just lined up so heavily um, uh, around that. And that was a really big area of excitement. Um, I want to ask you about why customers should continue to trust us, to yeah. choose Cisco as their customer for the next generation of business and technology challenges, and I think ET&I is a big part of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this is why, you know, even though we've done so much um, thought leadership 
in networking, in security, and in collab, we want our customers to be aware of the many innovations that we're doing beyond these fields and even entering new markets. It's easy to think, hey, these are our strengths and we've, we've led the industry so much in these core areas, but you know what? They can be applied to many new areas, like we talked about in the iTalk, bringing networking and security expertise into the new realm of networking inside the app, as an example or edge, we've been creating platforms that have edge capabilities, it's like, okay, well, why don't we optimize them and make new and interesting uses of them? Or even why we're looking at various technologies, like we talked about quantum and what we can uniquely bring to this field, both in, not just both, but in cryptography, in networking, in quantum compute also. So it's really, you know, we have a lot of strengths and some real, a long and rich history of innovation and we want to continue this path and we want to share with our customers. Sometimes we've been perhaps a little bit too close to the chest with the innovations because right. you know, we want to you know, drive as much competitive advantage, but at the same time we're trying to find a better balance so that we can share with our customers that, hey, Cisco is and continues to be an innovative company. We're going to be with you all the way on either your cloud native journey, edge native journey, your quantum journey, whatever it may be, and then you know, work with us. And even, one thing I wasn't able to mention, but we can even have confidential discussions in the innovation forum, the whisper suites, where we can even share with a little bit more freeness with the customers under non-disclosure agreements, more details about other innovation projects we're working on. That's perfect. Tim, yeah. thank you so much. I'm glad you joined us in studio. Great iTalk, once again, truly appreciated. For all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay with us, we're going to take a very brief station break. We'll be right back in just a moment. All right, we are here. It is the last day of Cisco Live. Exciting as there's so much more to come, but also a little bit sad because we've only got one day left. So, going to make sure I make the most of that, and I hope you are too. Um, now, as you can see, you know, lots of people are still walking around the world of solutions. We just saw the social media area. You're about to come out now to us. So this is us here, you can see me waving, hello, wherever you are. <laughs> and I am joined here in studio by Ryan Rose. So welcome Ryan, how are you? Thank you so much. I am like super excited to be here and agreed, like it's the last day, but this has been an amazing show and it's been so great to be back in Europe, uh, meeting people. Thank you for letting me be on here. Oh, thank you for joining. So I just want to talk a little bit about what is happening at DevNet. We have the DevNet meetups, we have lightning talks, we have DevDash. Uh, this sounds really fun. The faster you answer questions, the faster the car crosses the finish line. So if you're here on site, make sure you give that a go. We have the design thinking um, and service provider um, in a series of hands-on activities. There are lots to do around DevNet here at the show, right? That is right. So uh, anyone that's been to a Cisco Live, whether it's in the US or Europe or Melbourne, you know the DevNet zone. Yeah. Uh, the DevNet zone is great because I always like to say that it's kind of the realm of the real where you get to get hands-on with so much of our learning, so much of our products and our technology. Um, but what's really great is, is that we provide a tremendous amount of ways for people to kind of learn about any topic or technology that they might be interested in. So we have our DevNet theater, we have our classrooms, as you said, the lightning talks. Yes. <laughs> um, but what's also great is we have these workshops which are uh, led by experts in their field and they actually bring people through technology one at a time. So if you're interested in automating the network, you find it in the DevNet zone. Amazing, and tell me a little bit about what your team has been up to, the DevNet and the developer relations team have been up to since the last Cisco Live Europe. Obviously we've had three years where we've not been able to be together in person. Fill us in. I, I will also say <laughs> that last three years is a total blur. Um, I, I feel like uh, you know when we were last in Barcelona in 2020, we were on the edge of this gigantic release of the DevNet certification program. Yes. Um, so uh, we were leaving on February 20th, and on February 24th of 2020, <laughs> we launched the brand new DevNet, certifica DevNet Associate Certification, DevNet Professional Certification, and in that time between that Cisco Live Europe and this one, we actually uh, also launched the DevNet Expert Certification. But what's really been happening is a tremendous amount of new content that's on developer.cisco.com. So for all of this new technology that you're hearing about observability or application security, we have sandboxes and learning labs for that. Um, for all of the new APIs that we have that have been coming out, 
we have sandboxes for that. Uh, that's really been the thing that we've been working on for the last three years. We might have been separated, yeah. but we were always trying to make we sure. We never came to a standstill, right? We exactly. We were just constantly moving. Oh, that's great to see. And, you know, I know that the um, DevNet community are really excited to be back. And like you said, getting their hands on the technology and really trying th things out in the um, DevNet zone as well. Exactly. Really great to hear. All right, well, let's talk about the next year then. What is the developer relations team or DevRel? What are your team up to over the next year? So the de developer relations and DevNet team is really focused on three areas. First, we want to bring world-class APIs to everyone that works with Cisco programmable technologies. So we've been working with our engineering groups uh, across Cisco to be able to make this happen. And in fact, right at the end of last year, we announced a new backward programmability initiative as part of our overall API first strategy. So if you're using a Cisco API, we want it to be the best experience possible. Uh, the two other things that we're working on, we're hyper-focused on security. So we are coming out with brand new security sandboxes, security learning labs, and we also want to bring in that DevOps component as well. So we have brand new shows, content, all on DevOps. We have a show called The Daily Stand-Up <laughs> with two of our developer advocates. One is Dev and one is Ops. <laughs> yeah, uh, but our final, our final thing is uh, just really driving to that transforming of infrastructure. If you want to automate it, we want to help you do that at DevNet. You know, we have a, a phrase, we like to say, see it, learn it, code it. Yep. Uh, if it comes to automation and transforming that infrastructure, getting the most out of all of that, we want you to be able to do that at developer.cisco.com. Amazing, thank you so much. And we've had Kelly Jones here, our Chief People Officer here in the studio. I had uh, fun talking to her earlier in the week as well. And then yesterday, Emma Carpenter, who is our VP of Security, was talking about the talent skills shortage, right? So it's really great to see that you've got to focus on security and you're helping to upskill. So just the final question you know, that we have time for is, what are you excited about? What should people take away? Uh, I, I feel like there's never been a better time to start. And I, I will say, I said that even back when we were at the last Cisco Live Europe, that this is a great time to get started and developer.cisco.com and all of the partners that we have, like the learning and certifications team, we have so many ways for people to get started. We have an entire area called start now at developer.cisco.com slash start now. Okay. And you can find so much there. Cisco U is soon going to be available with a lot of different training too. So for us, I am just so excited to see what people will create and we can't wait to see what they'll do. Amazing, so I think your message is um, DevNet is for everybody, get started. <laughs> Absolutely, we want DevNet to be the accessible vehicle for everyone from around the world. If you're coming with a strong tech background, if you're a network engineer, if you're a student, regardless of who you are or where you are in the world, we want you to know that developer skills and DevNet we're a home for you. Yes, thank you so much, Ryan. I know you're going to be featuring in our next innovation talk, so we'll let you go. Cedric, let's head out to you. Hey there, Nish. I am here in that home. I'm here in the DevNet zone. I'm here to see it, to learn it, and to code it. I'm just going to have a quick wander around what's happening over here. Um, I can see like it's always very busy in the DevNet theater here on my right-hand side. We have some WebEx by Cisco for developers as well. I can see some Meet the Developer stuff. And oh, th that's quite cool. Let's go there. Like I can see some cars over here. So, um, you know, I'm here. I can see the cars. I'm smiling. I'm excited. So can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening here, Kaval? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I am actually here at the Dove Dash, and this is um, a fun way to actually make API calls. Um, the term API actually freaks people out, scares people. They're like, it's too serious. So we try to make um, APIs a little bit more fun. Um, what people over here are doing is they're taking um, a, a, a survey on their computers, and as soon as they enter the right answers, the responses go back to a Kubernetes cluster in the back. And once that happens, it sends an API to the car, and the cars actually start moving. So we made it an official um, race, and so all these winners, as they go, are coming up on the leaderboard, and we actually have a winner, uh, a daily winner, that gets prizes every day. I, I'm not going to try that, I think, because I think I would not be good at trivia questions, uh, <laughs> to be honest. So this looks really, really, really cool. But I'm also seeing there, share your experience. Yes. What is that about? It's a big board. I can see that you can win prizes, Cisco store credit. We were there earlier this week. Yep. So can you tell us about that? Sure, I'd be happy to walk you through. Cool. Um, so this is actually our way of collecting feedback. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, 
DevNet has generally been very feedback friendly. Uh, we okay. really want feedback on a lot of areas. And some of the areas include our new API quality initiative. Um, what we're doing over here is taking um, feedback on what APIs people use, what kind of um, issues they're facing, if anything, what improvements they need. Um, the main idea over here is we communicate with the rest of the Cisco units to make sure that their products uh, and their APIs are understood, clear, clean, and well-maintained. Um, the idea is there should be consistency. We're actually working on various yeah. initiatives, which you're going to hear a little bit later about. Um, and just make it easy for people to consume these APIs. So um, a very interlocked system exactly. in the Cisco ecosystem. Exactly. Okay. Um, and the other initiative that we're also working on over here is um, their website, our website. Developer.cisco.com has a lot of content. And our main aim is to get problems, issues, and concerns that people are facing on our website. We get that feedback, we ac accumulate it, and we make sure that those questions and comments are heard, that we make those improvements as we go. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much, Kaval. I'm actually very, very, very intrigued to actually play the games right now and try the cars because they make a lot of cool sounds. But let's go back to Nishwal Alduda and I'll let you, know, let you guys know later on how that went. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedric. It was really great to see those cars in action and actually what DevDash was. So really cool. I'm going to make sure I get time to do that. And I loved what Ryan said about DevNet. You don't have to be an expert coder. You don't have to be overly technical to be able to do it. But actually, just to get started, head on over to developer.cisco.com to learn more. All right, so the next session is called Living Life on the Edge from Developers to Ops, and it's with Ray Stevenson. I've got to say, whoever came up with Living Life on the Edge is a genius because I love that, really creative. So what this session is all about is modding developers who are critical for digital transformation, for constructing new capabilities for software, applications, the network, and security as well. So responsible, these developers are going to be responsible for the innovation, for the future of technology from the cloud up to the edge. And really, the Cisco is going to show how engaging developers with new tools, hands-on experience, and code for hybrid environments in particular is going to help the developer community as we stand on the new era and edge of innovation. Really exciting. Let's head to the innovation talk now. Providing an assist is Ryan Rose, Director of Technical Training. Over to you, Ray. Thank you so much, uh, Toby. Um, yeah, my name is Ray Stevenson. I'm, I'm here uh, leading developer relations at Cisco. Um, before I go into the slides, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. I actually worked in software for most of my career, so coming to Cisco was a very different experience. It's all about hardware with some software mixed in. Um, I wrote code uh, in Perl and Python and Smalltalk and C++ in my early career. Did a lot of software design and architecture. I worked at Microsoft for 20 years, uh, and I'm really happy to be at Cisco. I've been here about a year and a half um, leading the developer relations team. So oops. Um, the frontier for innovation is really expansive. If you think about uh, all the things that are software-based and how they've been made over time, it's really uh, whatever the imagination of the developer is, or the imagination of an entrepreneur, if it can be made in software, then they make it in software. Um, and you think about all the things that surround us in life, all of these things are software driven. Uh, our device in all of our pockets, pretty much everything that is in our house, including things that seem very simple, like a microwave oven, uh, but all of those things are driven by software. And uh, I think for Cisco, looking at software for, through the lens of how do we help people to tie business metrics back to that software and observe what's happening between the interactions of different APIs is, a, is an opportunity where we have a lot of strength because Cisco has traditionally owned the network and is the backbone of the internet. If you think about innovation uh, and you think about someone like Ada Lovelace, she actually was one of the first programmers. And what's amazing about her is that she actually wrote an algorithm for a piece of equipment that hadn't been invented yet. She knew what that machine would do, but she thought about how to write the code for that machine, but it didn't yet exist when she wrote this. And today, similarly, if you think about quantum computing, it's the same kind of situation. The programmers are already thinking about how do I create a, a programming language that can handle qubits instead of zeros and ones. This computer doesn't quite exist yet, but they know it will be there, and they're already anticipating what does a programming language have to look like in order to take advantage of a new model of programming. 
But there's still a lot of challenges for developers. Um, if you think about what developers do, it's kind of an art. I mean, you could, you could say it's engineering, you know, it's software engineer is sometimes how it's described. But if you talk to software engineers, they often say what they do is art because they're, they're being very creative about putting things together and coming up with technology and, and, and um, innovation that they might not have considered in the very beginning. So, uh, and in the past, what they typically had to do is they would write that code and then they would pass it off to someone who would test it. Uh, and that would be you know, kind of throwing it over the wall. So running the, the software is someone else's job, creating the software is their job. But today, even if you think about the, um, the engineering teams that I've actually had to manage, uh, it's not quite like that. Um, there's a very close connection between the people writing the code, the people who are actually taking that code and putting it into a staging environment, and then moving it into production. So the site reliability engineers, DevOps, they're all together in the same team, and they talk to each other. So they're actually saying it's not just a piece of code running in an environment and then going to production. They're actually looking at it from all the perspectives of is this something that can operate over the long term rather than just some code that I was handed and it's just my job to make sure it stays up. And at the same time, they also have organizational challenges. Um, every business today is really a software business. Uh, even if, you're, if your business is hospitals, or your business is making cars, you know, cars have become effectively computers on wheels. Uh, there's very little in the, you know, today's modern car that someone who trained in mechanics uh, would actually recognize. There's not a lot that they could do. It's just driven by software. Um, and so you see that every company is thinking about how do I take software to improve my margins, my bottom line, um, in every aspect of my business, even if my business isn't technology. From the Cisco perspective, um, these are three areas that we're actually focusing on quite strongly. Um, you've heard a lot about observability this week if you've been going to these sessions or, or seeing some of the demos over there in the uh, cloud native innovation space. The DevNet zone is, is over there in the, in the hub. And observability is the idea that you can see what's going on between a bunch of services, a bunch of code, and tie that back to metrics that are not just about performance, but they all also might be about the business value of, of those things not working or the business value of them working better. Transforming infrastructure is another area where you, know, you want to make sure that as companies start to retire data centers and move those workloads from perhaps owned environments to things in the cloud, and sometimes back again, uh, they, need, they need to be able to observe what's going on so that if uh, something goes wrong or there's some kind of outage, they can quickly have a plan in place to recover and keep continuity going for their business and for their customers. And then finally, the, the third thing that I want to put on here that we actually care quite a bit about is world-class APIs. So if you're a software developer and someone asks you to develop an API, you might just say, well, I just need to have a handshake. I'm gonna, someone's going to ask for something, I'm going to give them something back. But ideally, you would go beyond that, and you would take the best practices of developers who came before you and think about, how do I design that API so that it lives a long time? And if I have to change something in the future, I don't break all the clients of that API that already came before. And so in developer relations at Cisco, we're actually focused on world-class APIs and API quality as one of our initiatives inside Cisco, but also something that we can share outside of Cisco. And APIs, they matter quite a bit. Um, you know, in the old days, you, know, you, would, you would use a library to write some code and create some kind of functionality, and it had an API. But it was just something that you used locally on your local machine. These days, almost everything is, is provided as an API, usually as a service out there on the, on the web, on the cloud. And developers don't write a lot of the kind of core code that they use for their solution. They just go find an API that already does it, and that's, that's how they go. But again, if you think about API quality, um, there's, there's APIs and there's APIs that are better. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're not creating APIs that make it hard for other people inside your company or people who consume it from the outside um, to come along with you as you make changes over time. So you can go from unreliable, where you're, you're pretty much just not thinking about it, uh, to evolving and starting to have versioning and starting to think about what are the aspects that make a big difference to someone uh, when they're consuming an API. And this, again, is part of our API quality initiative. Some other challenges, as I said, you know, the skills gap. You know, if you've never written an API for consumption by others, it's a challenge to say, well, what's the right way to do it? 
Um, you might make some choices, and they might be good ones, but they might not be good ones. It's hard to say. Um, internal to your company, there are APIs that people use. So there might be a commerce API at your company that is how billing and licensing is done. That has to be used by all the people across the company. If you change your license model, you now have to change your internal API. And if you think about what's happening at these companies, they have to keep building these things because they keep getting asked by their customers and their partners, like, hey, I'm, I'm reselling your, your stuff, but I need to have access to the data that is being produced from that commerce stream. And so the growth in APIs is explosive across all areas and all types of companies. And I think a really, you know, a hot area for someone who's a software developer and wants to think about, you know, what else could they do um, besides just writing code for one purpose. And our journey has actually been a, a long one. Back in 2016, we actually uh, created an advisory group where we worked with our different engineering teams to make sure that we could get some feedback on what would make, you know, a good uh, style guide for Cisco. Then we kept going, used that style guide to drive further discussions inside of the company. And then we, our, our API architect, who's actually Stev, he's back here in the back, um, actually started to work with all the different engineering teams uh, to try to get them to all get on board with this idea of producing high quality APIs that can be consumed not just between the different groups, but also outside of Cisco. And then finally, in 2021, you can see that we had exec alignment where it was prioritized as a strategy that we want to make sure that we produce great quality APIs, and we're now at the implementing stage uh, in 2022, and now, of course, we're at 2023. And last fall, we actually announced um, backward compatibility commitments at the Partner Summit with a select group of Cisco product groups. Uh, and the idea is that we, we have to put a stake in the ground somewhere where we say, this is what Cisco's going to do to make sure that as the partner community and the end developer community start to use the data that comes out of Cisco devices, they have some assurance that there's quality underneath and that they're getting something that isn't going to break when we release it in the future. So part of that so-called API first strategy is to treat it as if it is a product and it is a version and you don't want to make, you, you don't want to have anything um, stop working just because technology advanced. So along those lines, um, in our effort to try to do all that work that's involved in taking a look at APIs and understanding the quality uh, and the differences over time, we actually created a, a, a product called API Insights for internal use. There's actually an open source version as well. And we're going to have Ryan here in a minute come up and give you a demonstration of how it works. Um, there's an early adopter group of, of products here inside of Cisco. But this, this really helps people to understand um, in an automated way what's going on across version to version to version. And this was an effort between not only uh, just inside of our own team, but also between Cisco ET&I, the Emerging Technology and Innovation, and the Cisco Customer Experience teams. Here's the key features, um, but Ryan's going to demonstrate it, so I think that'll be more important for you to see that. But uh, what it really does is it does static analysis over the code and uh, lets you provide some level of API governance. Uh, and you can do other things as well. Uh, one of the ways that you can use it is, is to do language inclusivity. And I, I don't know if we're going to demo that, but if you don't have time here, you can certainly go to the DevNet zone, and we'd be happy to show you how this works. So um, with that, I'm going to bring Ryan up. Here's just a quote from uh, one of our product managers. Um, API Insights really helps inside of Cisco, and we want to make sure that it helps other people outside of Cisco as well. So, Ryan. Deal. Let's see what it does. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Boom. Well, hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Rose. Uh, I'm a, a director here at Cisco. And uh, first, before I start, can I ask how many of you are members at developer.cisco.com? That's great. Uh, stars to every one of those hands that went up. And if you have not signed up, this is your moment. Uh, because if there's one thing that we do at DevNet is we always try to enable you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a tool that's available for free, but DevNet accounts are available for free. So you can sign up and start using all of our tools and training today. So just as Ray said, I'm going to be going over API insights here. Now, I only have 
five minutes to really give a demo. But if you'd like to go in depth, you can actually engage any member of our team in the DevNet zone or come to developer.cisco.com slash API hyphen insights. And you can find all of this that I'm going to be going through online. So API insights is that open source tool that Ray was just talking about to help anyone that is building or consuming APIs be able to build or create better APIs, uh, and also to see things like breaking changes, help to ensure things like backward compatibility, and also through the combination of other open source tools, actually pull in more information on your APIs. So this is the API Insights dashboard. And what's really great about this is it provides a lot of information at different levels of accessibility. So if I was just a part of a team that wanted to just find out very quickly, what is the overall health score of this API experience? Each one of these APIs that's on this dashboard actually has its own score. And that's being judged against 34 parameters that we have that are inside of the tool. And it also then allows me to go deeper. So if I'm working, for example, on a DevOps team, or I'm working on a, on a development team, and I want to learn more about the API itself, I can actually click in to find results. But I always think this tool works better when we're able to kind of put it in a real world scenario. So let's say this is the developer relations store. Uh, it's a store where we sell a lot of different clothes, a lot of different things. Um, Maybe, uh, and again, I, I'll uh, preface this by saying these clothes are actually not available in the DevNet zone. So if you do want to buy a gift, unfortunately, we are not selling these. Um, so let's say that this store is powered by five microservices. And I want to I wanna make an update to the catalog API to provide greater amounts of personalization. So I go into the API right now. And um, I, uh, right at the start, I can actually see the versions that I've worked on on this catalog uh, API. And I can see that right now, the score of this API is 100. And I can click, and I can view the report on this API. I can actually find out anything that's tied to it. But what I want to do here is when I go to the catalog API, Let's say I've made that change. I've added personalization in, and now what's happened is the score has dropped. I've introduced a problem while I was working on that API. And this is what I mean by we can now empower development, uh, developer tw uh, uh, teams who are working on their APIs to immediately find out if they've introduced a problem like a breaking change. So what I can do is, is I can actually compare those two versions of that API. And when I do that, see it loading right here, I can actually see exactly what happened between the two versions of the API to be able to see that there's been a breaking change that's been introduced. And when I actually go in, I can see this difference directly in the code. It's highlighted. So the issue here is the max length has actually been changed here and the ID to maximum. So you can actually see the differences between the two sides of the code. You can actually see the issue, the type, string, the type, number. This is where I've introduced this massive error actually directly into the code, and that's what's causing this score to fall. So I can go even further and I can view a full report of this API and see all of what is making up this, uh, this score up above. 90, 98, 80, 93. I can see all of the individual markers that I'm looking for in this API health. And so I can see that I have errors, for example, in doc completeness and even REST guidelines. I can see a number of API security warnings that are being popped up to me. So what's great about this tool is, it's not just an alarm that's just going to run a siren and say, you've done something wrong. Instead, it's going to tell you, this is your issue, this is what caused it, and this is the recommendation on how to solve it. So we're giving you all parts of the tool to be able to help you fix, build, and consume better APIs. 
And what's really great, and it's awesome to see Ann Gentle here in our audience, a member of our, a leader on our de uh, de uh, developer relations team is, we've also added that inclusive language check as well. So we can actually look for language that isn't the, it's things that we're trying to move away from in our technical documentation. As we start to optimize for words like allow list and block list versus some of the antiquated terminology of old. All of this is now available and actually, again, highlighted here. So you can find things like errors in API security, errors that have been introduced through breaking changes, doc completeness, and inclusive language. And again, this is going to help your technical leads. It's also going to help your developers. This tool actually comes with an IDE extension. So that way you can be doing this type of check, not just through a, a different tool, but directly in the IDE itself. So we have an IDE extension into VS Code. So as a developer is working on the APIs, they can actually do a read on that while they're working in VS Code and see the exact same scorecard and even the recommendations on how to fix it. And this IDE extension is available today. You can go to Microsoft, and it's, uh, it's, it's easy to download and add in to your developer environment. What's more is, through a uh, connection into another open source tool that we have here at Cisco, which is API Clarity, we can also check the, uh, you know, we always talk about shift left. This is a shift right component, which is our ability to actually see errors in runtime. So now we can actually check drift, and we can see things like shadow or zombie APIs, things that are weakening this API overall. This is a great way to f fully score up exactly how your APIs are growing, changing, and when you need to deprecate parts of them properly. So it's a full service tool that allows you to build stronger APIs. And with that, I would recommend anyone that wants to learn more to actually visit our API architect back here, Steps Farts. Uh, and Gentle, who is a leader on our developer advocacy team, Ray or myself, we're all going to be in the DevNet zone uh, here at Cisco Live. And thank you all so much. We can't wait to see what you will create with this tool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Right on. Thank you. So if you want to find out more, you can, of course, scan this code, and it'll take you to that page that he mentioned. I'll pause just a moment and give people a chance to do that. And in a, I guess, internet tradition, there is one more thing that I wanted to bring up. Um, we actually have been thinking at developer relations, how do we make the life of people who work with Cisco APIs and, and um, uh, metrics inside of all of our equipment easier? And we came up with this idea that isn't live yet. It's called the Cisco Metric Search Engine. That's not an official title. But the idea is that if you're trying to get uh, telemetry data out of Cisco equipment, there might be more than one way to do it. You might have an API. You might have a Yang model. You might have an SNMP MIB file. Um, or you might just have the command line. And if you talk to some of the people who work in network operations centers, and they're trying to figure out like what, what are the right pieces of data that I have to pay attention to. In fact, if you go look at the knock for the show, you'll see some evidence of that. Um, it may not be in, in an API. And there may be another way to get that information. And so the idea here is that you could search across all of those things and say, like, I'm just interested in, say, for example, the CPU for wireless access points. And you come up with a, bu a bunch of results. And if you found one that was the one you were looking for, you could click on a on a code button, and you could get a piece of code that would actually allow you to retrieve that piece of data from the equipment. So this is something we think could be very useful uh, to people in the networking space. We're not sure, but you know, we'd love to have your feedback if you think this would be helpful. Um, a lot of times, the sample code that we've been doing for our, for our, our uh, demonstration for our internally just hits against the sandboxes that we run in DevNet. So again, if you're interested, please go to this uh, URL with this QR code and sign up. We won't use your email for anything other than this. And then once we're done letting people know that it's this come up, we'll get rid of the email address. But um, while you're there, please leave some feedback on how you might actually use this kind of tool if it existed. Because uh, we've got a, a, demo, a demo version working internally, but we're thinking about extending it a bit more and then including it on the main developer.cisco.com site. With that, um, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, please come visit us at DevNet over there on the, on the other side. 
And uh, you can always, of course, see us at developer.cisco.com. Thank you so much. Hybrid work is here. It's there. It's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here or here, there has to be someone here making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead. Log in from here. Dial in from here. Sit in from here. Assured that someone is here with a view of everywhere. Ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. We're all connected, which means the more healthy people we have in this community, the healthier this community, and this community, and every other community will be. Good health is made possible by great care. And great care is made even greater by connections. And only Cisco can securely connect patients, providers and staff with healthcare technology to power a more inclusive future for all. Between good health and great care, there's a bridge. My phone is at the center of my world. Life and work all in one wherever I am. And now with WebEx Go, I can easily balance both. Enterprise grade calling with my phone and an experience I'm used to. Personal calls are still on my plan and phone number. And for work, I make and receive calls on a dedicated business line with great call quality. I connect with clients, coworkers, you name it on a separate, secure mobile network without sharing my personal information. WebEx Go is built into iOS and Android, giving you the best possible calling experience. And that experience seamlessly extends across my WebEx workflow. Now I'm taking my business calling and my collaboration tools anywhere my work takes me. That's WebEx Go. Humans, a nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco wireless and DNA spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hard work has its place, but when it comes to managing your network, you want to work smarter not harder. You want to accomplish more and stress less. That's where the next generation AI powered Cisco DNA Center comes in. It simplifies operations through automation and shortens response times. So tasks that took days are done in minutes and sometimes don't need to be done at all. With Cisco DNA Center, you'll have the superpower of teleportation to virtually see and adjust your wireless coverage in any space in your network. 
You'll have AI-driven security to classify endpoints and enforce security policies across domains. And you'll be seamlessly integrated into the broader Cisco ecosystem for an unparalleled end-to-end -end network management solution, which means you'll spend less time worrying about your network and more time innovating. A cyber attack can grind everything to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. A classroom is no longer a room. It's wherever a student is. It's wherever curiosity plants a seed in a mind, sprouts wildly, and then demands to be fed. More, more, more. It's wherever someone asks why, or how, or what's at the bottom of a black hole. A classroom is anywhere in the world where there's a student eager to learn. Through secure remote and hybrid learning, Cisco has created the world's largest digital classroom. And we're making education possible for millions of students in countries all around the world. Powering an inclusive future of learning for all. Between curiosity and knowledge, there's a bridge. Hello everyone and welcome back to Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. We're in our final day, lots of great content to come, so make sure that you stay tuned with us for the rest of the day. Now the previous session we just came out of was um, called Living Life on the Edge from Developers to Ops. And it was talking about how developers are really at the critical point of digital transformation. They're really enablers of that and how they're helping with new capabilities, software, applications and the network. Now, now that my uh, fabulous co-host Rob Boyd is out in the showcase, so Rob, over to you. I think he has something you want to share. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nish. So any chance I can get to spend time in DevNet is very, very helpful because it changes so rapidly. There's so much work going on in this, the space that they use with the education that they're putting out, it's always enormous. But here I've, I've got a new friend, Steph, who has been working on APIs, which we've heard a lot about APIs and their importance. Uh, but specifically, Steph, I'm curious if you can tell me what is important to the DevRel community uh, working with APIs. What's, what's, that, what's the important relationship there? So what's really important to us in the developer ecosystem is that all developers, we need developers to have trust in APIs. Because you invest, you invest your time, you, it's a business strategic. So how do you get trust from developers in an API? And remember, you have only one chance as an API to make a first good impression. So how does that happen? Um, we have a tool here that we use internally at Cisco to score the quality of our APIs. Uh, it's called API Insights. We used it and we've been so successful with it that we have pushed it as an open source solution. I'm going to go to do a very quick scroll through. So this is what an API is. If you look at this API contract, so you see those lines of code. It's a lot of code. You don't really understand. It's thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that describe your API contract. And at the end of the day, it renders as this. 
But how do you check the quality of what is inside? We cannot control the quality without automation. So we applied automation to us internally. So that tool, API Insights, will give you some clarity about these two paths, four operations, and what are the different domains, how my API scores. You've got score for design, inclusive language, are you using the right terminology? Documentation and the contract, how solid is that contract? And by using this tool, you get those scores, and over the life cycle of your API and the releases, you will see your score increasing. And when you get to a number of 100%, you have a complete API described, and the benefit of that, you can automatically generate the change log. So here you see between one version and another released, you get the difference, and eventually, if there's any breaking change that is going to really hurt your community, you will detect it before releasing that API. So that was a quick discussion. Any thoughts about this? Well, I was going to try and restate something real quick and just see if I've got it right before I have to run because we've got a couple things I want to cover. But in general, you guys are really working to solidify, standardize the relationship, how APIs are being used across all Cisco products because that ultimately becomes a customer experience. It becomes a way for us to move forward fast very competitive issue with this, but that's really, it's, it's how the community builds together fast, and that's what you guys are working on with the new API Insights tool, is that right? Exactly. Okay. Steph, thank you so much, I appreciate your time. Guys, let's step over here. So this is, this is fun. I think you wanted me on the other side, Steve, is that right? All right, so let me come over here, make sure, I always do what camera Steve says to do. Yeah. This. This is a pleasurable moment for me for a moment. This is my good friend, Jason Davis. He has been the my route to information in so many ways across Cisco for many, many years, because normally you're hidden away in the knock, you're not always out front, yeah. but you've been working more with developer relations. I wonder if you could tell me, start <laughs> off, you're a distinguished engineer. I am. Yeah, what is important to understand about this relationship on open telemetry? Well, open telemetry, you know, augments our story about all the telemetry and instrumentation we put in our products, right? And there's such rich information there. And customers can definitely get some interesting insights if they use like DNA Center or Crosswork or whatever their management tool of choice is. But there's so much more that's available inside the device. It's kind of like your car having that onboard diagnostics port that your mechanic would plug into to get more insights about your vehicle and probably tell them how fast you drive, right? And we don't want your insurance agent to know that. But, um, you know, what's been interesting for me is Wi-Fi 6 this year has been new, right? Uh, several years ago, it was, it was just getting ratified. But now it's pretty predominant where 802.11 AC was 95% of the clients out here on the wireless. But now it, we're seeing it's about 63% on Wi-Fi 6. And being able to use telemetry, I can go in and look at interesting information and sta statistics about... Uh, this is me as a producer, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, so there's some, this is showing some statistics about the wireless client information. So what we're seeing now is that we have 435 clients out there that could have connected at a higher capacity on the wireless network, but the infrastructure in the main hall didn't support that. If we switch over to the meeting village where we have the Wi-Fi 6 uh, access points in the six gig band, we see operationally more of these devices can connect at the higher speeds. So if we track this year over year, what we'll be able to see is people need to keep refreshing their environments because Apple and Samsung keep refreshing all the equipment and people are upgrading their phones and tablets and laptops, right? So it's, it's kind of cool to be able to get this data insight through telemetry. Yeah, I realized that the camera panned into me reading my email. Um, because uh, the main thing was, it was fascinating, Jason. I don't mean to imply any differently. Because I was just thinking, man, you can't take the knock out of the engineer, can you? You're yeah. still involved in some way. But I mean, really, you guys, you're highlighting where we're going. So as we prepare to, as you set this standard, because this is what we need to be able to move forward with. Exactly. And again, about the telemetry and instrumentation that exists in the products that allow you to make better business decisions and insights. That's perfect. Jason, as always, man, I continue yeah. to need your help. Let's see. Okay. My Final guest, this is interesting here. Marco, yes. is that correct? So uh, he is in the Cisco Champion program. Incidentally, a program I am also in. I'm just not as involved, especially as Marco. Because one of the things you're supposed to do in the Champion program is you're not within Cisco, right? So he is an observer about what Cisco's doing and speaks to his audience in a broader, uh, to a broader basis through blogs, videos, 
podcast probably. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing and how is it important to be here at Cisco Live and what's important about DevNet for you? So uh, I'm a, a old school CCA guy in the earlier days and I started watching videos from David Bombel and Hank Preston and I go, what is the DevNet thing? I was very interesting, very curious about that and I started to get deeper into it. And um, I realized that there are a lot of more possibilities to do, use cases. I can automate things, I can enrich my solutions. So with my customers and design, we are really starting to get into that. And um, I started my own blog post and to show my customer what's the use cases, what's the beauty of the DevNet to automate things. And here in uh, Cisco Live, you have a lot of opportunities to connect with people. They are, have the same thing on their mind. Uh, we talk to each other and say, hey, I did this. Did you uh, ever tried this and so the community is very great and uh, a lot of people here and uh, sessions also to get new things to done it's very great to be here well that's probably one of the things i enjoy the most about the community is the interaction that i mainly observe through uh, the the webex interface because everybody is extremely friendly as different parts of the world wake up in the day and they're saying hello and then you guys are sharing personal information and getting very involved and in, in, in lifting each other up it feels like as a community but then that that community is very tied to how do you make each other successful but how do you make Cisco more successful uh, do you feel that same warmth uh, from your perspective and your relationship with with the Cisco community as well as the champion community yeah they really take care of us uh, we take care on each other and it's you stay motivated. You uh, talk with a lot of people which are highly driven, highly motivated, and it keeps me uh, motivated and driven as well. And to exchange experience, and yeah, especially in the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of people only on WebEx, only video cam, and to see in person and to interact uh, between humans, it's very great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate all your contributions to Cisco and, and the writing and the understanding you're giving us, the additional perspective that you give us, as well as the rest of the champions from an external. It's very, very healthy for all of us. So I hope we're doing everything we need. Thank you so much. Guys, we'll go back to Nish in the studio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you to Marco. I love what you said there about community and Cisco taking care of the community of champions we have, but also of each other as well. We're now going to head into an interview that we had with Jonathan Davidson. He is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of the networking team. Let's take a look. Hi, everyone. I am hanging out here in Studio B with the intriguing Jonathan Davidson. You will always be noticed the intriguing Jonathan Davidson from now on. Just so you know, thanks to Liz and Tony, you're done. You're set. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. It's great to be here with you, Steve. And I can tell you, uh, the intriguing thing, for those of you who didn't see the keynote, that's how Liz introduced me. And uh, unfortunately, Liz has given me lots of nicknames that have stuck. And I'm, I'm, I don't know how to feel about it, intriguing honestly. Intriguing is good, though. And you even said yesterday, it's like, I'm not sure anybody's called me intriguing before. But um, I like it. We don't normally get that. The inspirational, the exciting, the wonderful, the intriguing. The intriguing. I think that's perfect. Well, welcome to Amsterdam. Thank you. Um, as executive VP and general manager of Cisco Networking, I really, I loved what I heard from you yesterday in the opening keynote. For me, it was so concrete. Um, I think you've given the quote, the quote of the show so far. You said that uh, we are creating a big, cozy blanket yes. of unified experiences. I think I've heard you requoted 30 times in the past 24 hours, at least half of them by me. You shared so many great announcements under that big, cozy blanket. Give us a quick recap of the things that you announced in your section of the keynote. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that. And uh, this takes a village, of course, to be able to come up with uh, not only the technology, so I, I get to represent all this great work from a lot of great engineering teams over many, many moons. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my communications leader actually came up with the big cozy blanket analogy, okay. so kudos to Stephen for that. Credit where credit is due. Exactly, um, but, but it's true. That's really what our customers they want. They want those unified experiences. Uh, so there's a few things that we announced. One, uh, last summer at Cisco Live in the US, we talked about how we were extending the Meraki dashboard to go and include Secure Connect. So you can have a simple, sassy solution uh, attached to what many of our customers love, the Meraki dashboard. Uh, and so now we actually extended that and said, okay, no matter what SD-WAN solution you're using, if you're using our Vitella SD-WAN solution, you too can have access to this wonderful 
secure connect solution. And so that's uh, going into early release now and will be GA in just a few months. So really excited about that. Yeah. And it creates those unified experiences. How do I get consistency regardless of what type of technology I'm using inside of Cisco to connect my users and things to each other? you can now do that securely, so very exciting. Um, we also talked about how we're continuing to invest in our cloud monitored catalyst, and we're going to be moving more and more to a cloud managed catalyst portfolio. We have seen tremendous feedback, a lot of positive feedback on, on what we're doing there. And then the last big thing, new thing that we announced was how we're extending our IoT operations dashboard to include visibility into all those devices that are on premise. So you can now do security assessments uh, with that as well, so you can feel more secure. And I can tell you, when I go and I talk to our IoT customers, Customers, they are so excited about our IoT portfolio and what it means for them. The story is so, so, so strong. Because our operations have got to scale so much more efficiently, right? We have to create that agility you were talking about. You mentioned we're a first mover for industrial transformation. You talked about connecting everything, drones, machinery, yeah. and so on. That speed, I think, is so quick at this point, incorporating the security part of it as well. Uh, I think you said yesterday the world is, was just waking up the smartphones 10 years ago, imagine what we're going to look like 10 years from now. What are you seeing here at the show, yeah. and in your own work, that's really leading us to that inevitable future, and that security embed that you just mentioned? Yeah, well, I, you know, having connectivity without security really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that clearly resonates with everyone here at, at the show. Um, but uh, the Vincenzo who actually was on the stage with me from Anel, um, I think he laid it out really well. Uh, the security, he's viewing the, the whole platform for how he's delivering power uh, as, as his platform. And he knows that needs to be secure as well. What he also shared with me was some outstanding hard to believe statistics that just in Italy, there's 440,000 substations providing energy just in Italy alone. Um, there's also the EU government is putting billions of dollars into upgrading and digitalizing all of that infrastructure across all of Europe. And so a lot of customers and partners here at the show they want our help, they need our help on how to go and, and make those transitions. And so we're, we're really excited about, about what's happening and the opportunity in front of our customers to go through this and how we could potentially help them is driving a lot of really powerful conversations here. Now it was such a great conversation. I love what Vincenzo said. Um, I love what you were talking about with Ford, right? 100 year old car company, incredible transition. The vehicle is no longer just to get from point A to point B. Yeah. It's such a part of our lives and it all relies on the network, right? I think that's so important. So, um, I want to ask you one more important uh, thing. You mentioned yesterday three billion around the planet remain unconnected, underserved. Right. You talked about Cisco Silicon One being all in on simplifying IT across hybrid work to get us to that point. Yeah. What are a couple of the ways that Cisco is transforming IT experiences right now? Wow, uh, there's there's quite a few. Well, and so so first, when, you, when you're talking about what can we do, I view that as our, our day job at Cisco is to go and help bring connectivity to those three billion people uh, that are either underserved or unconnected. So we need to do that by making technology simpler to access, more cost effective, to lower the total cost of operations. We need to be able to do that. And that's our day job. We have a lot of engineers. We're spending billions of dollars in R&D to go and make that happen. But also, when you think about what we're doing to actually get that technology out in the world, this is where Network Academy comes in. Yes. And we have to enable people to upskill, to better themselves, so that we can go and actually take this technology out into the planet. Uh, and that's something that's really exciting. I, I've shared this with others before, but my, my wife spent two years in the Peace Corps, living in a hut in Mali, Africa, so she's she knows what it's like to not have access to information. Now back then, it was access to books and libraries, uh. because there really was not a whole lot of prevalent internet going on uh, <laughs> back, in, back in the day. But if you fast forward that to today, you, we need to enable people to go and and connect into this digital ecosystem so they can 
get access to great things like data and education. They can communicate with people that might be far away. And I can tell you, just bringing it to those in the U.S., uh, I'm, I lead the, uh, I'm an executive sponsor for the Native American Network, ERO, at Cisco. And so I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of people who are Native Americans. And uh, in talking to one of the, the advocates, they explained how they were writing letters to the, their grandmother. And I'm like, oh, what a lost art form. How, how great that is that you're writing letters to your grandmother. And she goes, no, like, there's no other way to communicate with my grandmother. There's no phone, there's no internet. And so, and that's in the United States. So people, when they think about this, they think about, oh, it must be a third world country somewhere that doesn't have access to this. It's everywhere. everywhere. And we have such a critical role that we do play and we can play to go and help close the digital divide. Fantastic, great, great, great story as well. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be able to sit down and get a few minutes with you in your busy, busy environment here at the show. So thanks for stopping into the studio. Great to be here, thank and you. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Hello everybody and welcome back to Cisco Live 2023 Amsterdam. My name is Nish Parker. I'm here in the Cisco TV studio bringing you all the action from this year's event. Now remember, whether you're here in person or you've joined us from home, from the office, from a coffee shop, wherever you are around the world, we want to be sure that you're using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA and at Cisco Live to let us know how much fun you're having at the event. If you haven't figured this out already, it's not too late because you, the best experience for you to take a look at this stream on is CiscoLive.com. That's where you will find lots of emojis and you can choose one to let us know how you're feeling right now and how much fun you're having at the event. Also exciting, for the first time ever, we're using um, live captioning and translations to seven different languages. So I love that Cisco is really following through on its mission, which is to power an inclusive future for all. Now, we've been talking a lot about hybrid work this week. We heard it in the keynote through the innovation talks. I think every guest that we've had in the studio and out in the world of solutions has said the same. But hybrid work really is key and center to what um, all of our customers are thinking about and what they're working on doing next. So let's take a quick look at this hybrid work video. Hybrid work is here to stay. And it means organizations of all sizes are reimagining their workspaces with people working from home, from the office, and anywhere in between. Organizations are having to support flexible and inclusive work styles and having to address a new set of complex security and manageability issues. Hybrid work is a strategic imperative for employers and they must get it right. It's at the core of how they address issues of productivity, culture, talent retention, security, sustainability, and so much more. Hybrid work can't be solved in isolation. Facilities, real estate, HR, and IT teams are coming together like never before to rethink work from the ground up. They are realizing it takes a combination of networking, collaboration, and security solutions to truly address hybrid work. And they are looking to Cisco to help them be successful. So, where to start? with the new Cisco Hybrid Work offers. At the core is our Hybrid Work software offer that powers our hybrid work experience for employees, regardless of location, and includes capabilities that span collaboration, security, monitoring, device management, and more. Hybrid Work has changed how employees use space and businesses must reimagine and digitize their offices to adapt to new work styles. The Hybrid Work Office Offer brings together the best of our networking, collaboration, and smart workspaces products combined into a single hybrid work solution. You can work with us and our partners to help design collaboration spaces of the future. From hot desking environments to informal huddle rooms to large conference rooms. You can be assured that the solution has been evaluated through the Cisco Validated Framework and backed by our CX Services team. At home, employees need the proper tools to stay connected and productive. The Hybrid Work Home Offer extends enterprise-grade security and experiences to the home 
giving employers the ability to equip home users with inclusive collaboration environments that leave no one feeling left out, and giving IT the visibility and management to support remote employees and offer a superior user experience. The Cisco Hybrid Work Offer comes with training, CX integrated customer support, and simplified pricing for you to make your transformation to hybrid work easy. Only Cisco can deliver everything that meets today's needs, supports digital transformation strategies, and accelerates the deployment of end to end hybrid work solutions. Cisco, nobody makes hybrid work work better. All right, you saw and we've heard about hybrid work all throughout the week, and it was really great to see that all to come together into one offer that's available. So hopefully that gave you some inspiration, some excitement. I love seeing all the different places that all of those team members were working at, so I've got inspiration when I get home. But I think right now, uh, Rob, you're out. World of Solutions of the Showcase, where are you and what are you doing? Yes, I am. We're Rob Boyd here in the World of Solutions Investigative Reports. And we're here trying to get to the bottom of this notion of software simplification. That is not, those are simple words, but when put together mean something that might not be exactly what, a, what is happening, but the effort must be investigated. With that, I want to come over. Do you mind giving us your name and what do you do for Cisco? Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. I'm Kirsten Hill. I'm with the Global Software Sales Team, um, Sales Business Development Manager, very responsible for hybrid work and simplifying software through the purchase of enterprise agreements. Perfect. So what are you explaining when it comes to simplification? You're focused on the licensing simplification. How does that actually manifest itself? We are focused on the customer experience with software, so making it easier to buy, consume, and manage software through an enterprise agreement. Specifically in this space, we're talking about hybrid work. Um, the competitive software offer we currently have is seven software suites bundled together for extremely competitive pricing that goes across collaboration, security, and applications, and really the, uh, the idea of observability in Thousand Eyes. That's awesome, because I feel like this is one of those areas where, that we always consistently need to get better at. So you're really focused on how can we make it easier to consume so you can focus on solving you know, communication challenges within your business, not worrying about licensing bundles and different things like that. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah. And with the enterprise agreement, it is one contract, so it's changed as we move to EA 3.0. We mm -hmm. have a single contract that is co-termed, so beginning and end dates are starting and ending the same for our platforms, um, as well as an opportunity to really have fixed pricing. So when you sign a contract at a three- or a five-year term, you truly have that fixed pricing locked in, yeah. and it, it, it creates uh, financial predictability for our customers. Well, that's perfect. i tell you what because I've mentioned the word bundles. I want to talk to someone over here about offers. You mind giving me the microphone? Absolutely. You did a very good job with it. We're going to bequeath it to someone else. Kirsten, thank you so much, guys. Follow me over here. Absolutely. I'm going to walk backward just a little bit. Look at that. She got applause from her team. So she talks about license simplicity, but there's also the what do I buy simplicity. And what Cisco has done is make a few things easier in terms of packaging so you don't leave anything out. I'm going to give this microphone over to this gentleman here. Do you mind, Denny, is it? Danny, absolutely. Danny, perfect. Yeah. British accent in my no ear. No worries, no worries. Always hard to understand, but beautiful person. Same, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking a little bit about simplification when it comes to licensing. I understand that you are focused on simplification as it concerns what do I need for my home office for this situation and that type of thing? How are you answering that question these absolutely, days? Absolutely, absolutely. So the name of the game is simplification and improving the experience mm -hmm. of all our users, right? So when it comes to hybrid work, we are actually having the full lifecycle yeah. and service portfolio we help. We have tax services, we have design and implementation services, we have adoption services, but we took it to the next level when we want to drive simplification. So for example, for the support for all our software products, more right. than seven of them, since the beginning of February, we are providing an overlay and a single point of contact phone to streamline and simplify the experience for our customers, right? And the way a lot of our corporate buyers, especially, are consuming, this becomes, you know, what's the right mix of menu of offerings are going to work for my situation? Because it, it changes, and I think a lot of customers are really wrapping their heads around the new way of working. Absolutely. And is it going to stay? There's some trepidation around it, but I, I think it's been pretty clear that hybrid work, hot desking, all these type of concepts that maybe we were always been encouraging people for, we now see that it works 
and that uh, employees tend to prefer it, I believe. Absolutely. It's an absolute reality. And on top of that, to make the case for specific customers, we have advisory services to help them understand what does hybrid work mean for their own users, right? So we tailor the use cases and we streamline the execution and the operation of this for their very specific needs, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. So we walked through some of those here. Do we have someone else that we were going to talk to in a moment? Okay, we did. Can I have Thank the you microphone so back? Please, please. You, Danny, you're awesome. Danny. 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 Danny, Danny, Danny. Okay, got it? Studio telling me, yep, Danny. Perfect. Let's see, we're talking with one of you, I believe. Yes, sir. Okay, here. Yeah. I'm going to hold the microphone. Let's do it that way. Yeah. So tell me what you're working on here in the offers area. Okay. We have here, uh, let's say, our endpoints, hybrid endpoints, to make sure that everybody can work at home if, uh, if necessary, yeah? because the new normal will be three days at home and two days maybe in the office or so. On. But what will happen, of course, in every meeting, there will be people abroad, so you need to get them in in the right quality and with the right tooling to do all kinds of uh, content sharing and so forth to make sure that the meeting is not a meeting with 10 endpoints or 10 actions, but that it is a meeting that is combined with content so that you can make decisions. That's the idea. Yeah, well, I think sometimes when it comes to enabling customers to be able to do what they need to do from a hybrid work perspective, we are certainly very proud of our devices. We're proud of our relationships and the uh, the co-optition that we have with, with Microsoft because these are the tools that our customers use, so we're wanting to meet them where they are. But we've got wonderful software, capabilities that can very shine, assuming that you've got the right licensing structure, you've got the right products. It's not that complex, but it's just complex enough, it feels like, to, to maybe give people pause, and it feels like what you guys are doing is really removing the friction to both purchase and actually use the products in an intelligent manner. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's, uh, that's fair to say, and we try to access now with more ideas in this uh, in these meetings, right, to ask about how would you think about the bundling of more products together, and uh, then it can uh, have more value to be working at home with those products, and we try to combine them, make it easier to buy them, and also in the software, it's all included now, so that you have the security, content sharing, very high quality in, in the content and so forth, so that's all from one system. That's perfect. Ronald, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. So guys, the point to remember is the fact that when it comes to hybrid work and it comes to collaboration with any of these devices, it takes a village, which we call the network. It takes a lot of things working together, so that includes security and observability as a foundation. So it's not as if these things that are visible don't ignore the things that are back in the closet or back in the cloud, wherever they may be. Don't forget also, WebEx makes cameras. And you think, why do I need a camera from them? Well, if you're in a big operation, these cameras are trackable. The sensors from uh, using Control Hub, which I hope we get a chance to talk about later, you've got the ability to do everything you need to do. Headsets, cameras, all the way up to big room systems. With that, I'll shut up and throw it back over to the studio. <laughs> oh, Rob, we never want you to shut up, but we do want to go to the innovation talk. The next innovation talk is going to be about hybrid work offers here and now. We've got three speakers. We've got Abby Singh, we've got Luke Dabritsky, who joined us in studio earlier, and also Paul Girault. They'll be talking about hybrid work offers and how they provide a simple approach to addressing current micro and macro trends for your business. We know you're going to find it really useful. Take a look and we'll see you right back here afterwards. Good afternoon and welcome to our innovation talk on the future of work. My name is Luke Dobrinsky. I'm a vice president of uh, strategic planning and future of work. And shortly, I will be joined by two of my colleagues, Paul Gerald, distinguished engineer, and Abhi Singh, senior director of future of work. Our team within the Cisco works across the enterprise to design, build, and ensure commercial success of cross-architectural offers like hybrid work. We are super excited to be here today and share with you our perspective on the space and then showcase some of the technology that enables hybrid work experience. Our presentation today will be broken into three sections. I will briefly talk about trends, what companies are looking for uh, from solutions, and then why we believe you should start on your transformation journey now. We'll pass it to Paul, who will walk you through a life in the a day in the life of an employee how the technology supports and enables employees moving seamlessly through the space from home 
to office and anywhere in between. And then Abby will walk us through how we leverage technology in the next generation offices, and then we'll spend a little bit of time about the offers that are in the market now, which we hope we will get excited about. What are some of the trends that we see in the industry? Well, first of all, coming out of pandemic, everybody is trying to figure out their future strategy for hybrid work. One thing seems to be true is that people are not coming back to the office 100%. And we believe that's the trend that will stay. So hybrid work is here, and it's here to stay. As fewer people are coming back to the office, what's happening naturally, there's a contraction of office space. You just need less space. We see there's different numbers floating out there, but we see something in the realm of north of 30%. Cisco manages 18 million square foot around the globe, 370 location, over 87 countries. We see it internally, and we see it with our customers, that the space is contracting. Now, at the same time, as the space is shrinking, there is a change in the DNA of the space. There is a shift from traditional me space to we spaces. And we see the split of like 30 to the 70. So there is no more assigned seating, my desk, my specific space. There is more room designed for collaboration, innovation, team working. And it's also flexible, meaning that I book it on demand. So it's first, first come, first serve. And that flexibility allows you to actually manage smaller space with the same number of employees. Now, the implication of it is you need to get smarter about managing the space. Because suddenly, space becomes utility, and you have to match the supply and demand. So all the things around digitization of, of your real estate, all the data that you're collecting from the access points, from your collaboration devices, be, is being fed to the central place. But then you have to have a capabilities analytics to actually analyze this and drive real-time decisions. What we also see is uh, flight to quality. So in all of it is, we see that upgrade in terms of the experience that we try to deliver to our employees. And this is not just true for office, it's also true for home, and it's true on employees on the go. So what the customers, our customers are looking for, clearly it will always be true, quality products and services, but that's not good enough. As the complexity of the environment and the solutions grows, we need to make it even more simpler. Simpler to use, with the right features, functionality, it needs to be simple to deploy, and more and more we hear conversations about one-stop shop solutions that are much easier, faster, able to be deployed. That obviously has implication on integration, not just be between the technologies that go into solution, but ability to, to operate in a brownfield environment, integrate with existing infrastructure. And then the last piece, which is more wrap around the technology, is the flexibility around pricing, buying programs, licensing. Once you start putting together cross-architectural offers, that becomes even more uh, important. And as we design solutions, we keep all those things in, in, in mind to make it easier for customers to buy and for our partners and sellers to sell. We also innovate in a space. Today we won't have enough time to do justice and go in depth in all of these areas, but those are some of the areas where Cisco is investing and innovating, and hybrid work, end-to-end -end solutions are consuming those capabilities. Let me just give you a couple of examples of the innovation. On the, uh, on the smart buildings, it's everything around the digitization of the real estate. I talked about ability to uh, collect all the data from the uh, access points, from uh, collaboration devices. All of that becomes, like, becomes the digital footprint of your real estate, which then allows you to manage it more efficiently, more effectively. On sustainability, examples of that are low, uh, low voltage POE, things that allow you to drive more um, energy efficiency. In our office in New York, um, which is not just one floor, it's around 42,000 square feet, we see energy savings in realm of 47% before and after implementing the next generation technology. On collaboration, I hope you had the opportunity to talk to some of our colleagues from Ecola, but everything around smart uh, audio, uh, AI in power, uh, voice counseling, uh, all things around hologram, those are all the future things that will help us augment the reality and make the, ex uh, make the collaboration experience even better. Security, passwordless application access, and AI that allows you to detect security risks before they actually take place. All of this 
is part of our ecosystem of end-to-end -end hybrid work. Visibility. You probably have seen some of the announcements around Thousand Eyes. We're trying to go beyond not just managing technology, but also monitoring experience of our employees at home in an office. So then your IT department can actually pinpoint where the issue is and constantly can improve on that experience. Connectivity, things around Wi-Fi 7, 8, all of those things are coming, as well as um, smart integration of the PoE sensors, all of those things that we integrate into the end-to-end -end solution. So why now? First of all, as, as I mentioned, we believe the hybrid work is here to stay. So there's no coming back, in our opinion. So you may as well lean into it and start working towards it. Employees' experience or expectations have changed much higher. Your expectations have changed. You know what good looks like. You know what the experience could be like. We have to deliver against those experiences. That feeds into uh, employee retention. It obviously supports employee satisfaction. It, it supports the productivity, but that's one of the levers that we absolute, absolutely have to deliver on. But it's more than just experience. We see more and more cost pressures. It's the macroeconomic trends. Obviously, in Europe, the pr uh, energy prices, all of that is putting pressure on the cost savings that also needs to be delivered. So experience and cost savings. I mentioned efficiency of operating in office, but there is also savings that comes with CapEx, with deploying the solution itself, and then you have the efficiencies of managing the, uh, the real estate. All of that uh, drives or, or helps to uh, drive cost savings. It takes time to get there. Now, yes, with the offer, which Abby will, will touch on sh uh, shortly, we did templatize it. We're creating a Lego block, so it gives you flexibility of deploying it in, in totality or in elements. We created reference architecture, design guides, how-to guides. So in essence, you know what makes up great experience. We know it's working because we, we uh, deploy Cisco validated framework. However, on the customer side, you know it will take time because it's not more, no, no more conversation with just IT, traditional IT. Now you have the real estate facilities at the table. You have HR. All those conversations also bubble up to CIO, CTO aligning that across the even customer footprint and the stakeholders takes time. Finally, quality solutions are here. We believe the technology is here and it's ready to be consumed. And we believe that there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We have the technology to enable you, so I encourage you to engage our team and our colleagues here to see what's available and how Cisco can support you. Now, let me pass to Paul, who is now going to walk you through how the technology actually works in practice. Thanks, Thank Paul. you, Luke. Appreciate it. So I'm going to take you through the day of the life of a typical hybrid worker. This is Alicia. You might be able to relate to Alicia. She works in the office sometimes. She works at home sometimes. She works in a coffee shop sometimes. She's traveling, and sometimes she works at a customer site. How many of you can relate to that today? Yeah, right? Everybody's working hybrid today. And let me take you through a day in the life of Alicia. Now, you could probably also relate to the IT team that needs to support Alicia, because you're here at Cisco Live, you're probably IT professionals, and you have to support workers like Alicia who need to work anywhere they want. But it's not just Alicia moving everywhere, it's Alicia's applications, it's her data, it's your enterprise applications. Everything is moving from that data center that you used to control and you had a firewall and you made sure that everything was very well controlled and your employees were on site. Well, that's no longer. Your applications are everywhere, your data is everywhere, your employees are everywhere. So you need to manage this new reality of this evolving perimeter of IT. Now in practice, we keep talking about hybrid work, but what is work? We keep talking about the three places people work, right? At home, in the office, on the road, anywhere else. But what is work? Let's peel that onion a little bit and understand what we're talking about. For many employees today, work really is dealing with SaaS applications. So you might be working on Office documents or Google Docs or something in Salesforce. So work is dealing with SaaS applications. You've also deployed applications in your enterprise, but as well as in the public cloud or in a private cloud. So these applications, again, are everywhere and work often involves dealing with these applications. Now, how do you access those applications? Well, more and more often you access these applications over the public internet. You don't have that tight control of 
putting all your applications behind a firewall and protecting them and making sure that they're safe. So how do we make sure that Alicia can access these applications safely and securely while protecting your data at the same time? So Alicia's company has rolled out Duo for multi-factor authentication. And Alicia used to work at a different company before, and she didn't really care for multi-factor authentication a whole lot because she found it annoying. She had to get text messages and then copy codes left and right all over the place. And see, raise a hand, who loves passwords? Yeah, said nobody, right? Nobody likes passwords. So Duo makes it a lot easier to, uh, more frictionless for Alicia to actually get through her day while still protecting your data because Duo has a lot of intelligence that it allows the multi-factor authentication to authenticate you when it needs to, but not bother the employee when it doesn't have to. And with our innovations in passwordless technology, we will get to the point where just her fingerprint or just a face scan will allow her to authenticate with an application without having to type a password at all. So passwordless is, some air, is an area that we're really excited about. But work is not just office applications or Salesforce. Work also involves collaboration. It also involves meeting with other employees, either in person or virtual. And her company has also rolled out the WebEx suite that allows her to chat with other employees, video conference, and have meetings. So she's having a chat conversation, and instantly within the WebEx app, she's able to have a video conversation, high quality, very great experience. Um, also, her employer sent her a WebEx camera as well to make sure she has the highest quality video experience as well. So she's having a conversation, and outside, so she's at home, so outside, they're blowing leaves outside, right? And she apologizes. She said, I'm so sorry, there's a lot of noise outside. But the person she's talking to has no idea that that's going on because WebEx Smart Audio Technology has completely removed all that background noise. And it's not just when you're at home, it's when you're at a coffee shop or you're at the airport and you're having a call. Smart Audio makes conference calls incredibly more inclusive because you can actually participate in this call instead of having to be on mute and, and being worried, I'm not going to unmute myself because then I'm going to disturb everyone. Smart audio is really revolutionary, and this is just one of the very small list of long innovations that we have in the collaboration space. So they're having a call, and all of a sudden, they need to bring in a third person into this call and have a meeting and share content. How would you do this typically? Well, all right, I'm going to send you an invite for a meeting, and then we'll call back in, and we'll, we'll meet up after this meeting. It's very cumbersome, takes a long time, but that's not a problem with WebEx because they can just click invite at meet at the bottom of this screen and instantly they're in a full-blown WebEx meeting without having to send in an invitation, without having to do a calendar invite, nothing. One button, you're in a full-blown WebEx meeting, you can share content, you get the full noise removal, everything is there to allow Alicia to collaborate with her employees. So great, great experience for her. And this is just one of the many pieces of the WebEx suite. WebEx suite allows Alicia to have calling, meetings, messaging, she can have large events and webinars for training her teams. She can have polling when she goes to a customer site and she wants to have a more interactive discussion with her employees. All of these are enabled through the WebEx suite. And I could spend hours here telling you about all the functionality in WebEx suite, but this is what enables her to collaborate regardless of where she is. Now, Alicia has to balance her work life, right? She's a hybrid worker, she's at home, she's having coffee, and on her work laptop, she happens to be checking her personal email. And she gets an email from her friend, Sam, who they had dinner last night and they were talking about painting her house. Or Sam says, hey, I, I, I'll send you this link for the company we use. They have a coupon on their website. And she sends this, but you might notice there's a misspelling in the link there, and she didn't type paint, painting correctly in that link. So when Alicia clicks on that link, what happens? it gets blocked because it's a malicious website. Now, before you had control over your employees when they were in the office and you had that firewall and it was protecting everyone, but now she's clicking links at home. Are you gonna put a firewall in everybody's house? I mean, you might wanna do that, but what if she's in the airport? So Cisco Umbrella is protecting Alicia's laptop to make sure that she's protected from malware threats regardless of where she is. And these threats are real. They're really big, right? We're talking about almost $4 million for an average breach. And 52% of attacks are caused by malicious actors, but 
what does the other 48% then? Non-malicious, so things like this where somebody accidentally clicks on a link or accidentally does something that they probably shouldn't have done and gets themselves in trouble. So Umbrella is going to protect Alicia regardless of where she is and regardless of where she goes. And 90% of all malware does use DNS in some way, so DNS security from Umbrella protects you at least from 90% of all those attacks, which is a great start. Now, I don't know how many people are here, maybe about 100, so 68 of you are not watching your DNS. Um, that's not a good thing, right? You need to be watching your DNS to make sure and monitoring it to make sure that you are permitting access to sites that are not malicious. All of this is backed by Cisco Talos. Cisco Talos is the largest, the largest security intelligence and threat intelligence organization on the face of the planet. They see two billion pieces of malware every day. Billion with a B. So we have all of this intelligence that's not feeding just into Umbrella, but all of our other security solutions at Cisco as well. Now, Alicia might need to go and access some legacy application that's sitting in her enterprise data center. And to do that, she uses our Cisco Secure Client. You might know it as AnyConnect. And she's able to VPN and access that application securely very easily. Her company has implemented secure, uh, certificate based authentication, so she doesn't even have to type a login. She just clicks a button and she gets into the enterprise very easily. But AnyConnect or Cisco Secure Client is much more than just VPN. Cisco Secure Client integrates all of our security portfolio into it and allows for things like ICE posture checking and NetFlow collection and the ability to monitor what your employees are doing even when they're not on VPN. Now one day she has a poor meeting experience. Something is going wrong with her internet connection or maybe her ISP is having an issue or maybe there's something wrong with WebEx, who knows? So she calls her ID de IT department. How does IT help somebody who is sitting at home? Well, that's where the ability to use WebEx Control Hub and diagnose the issue comes into play. So with WebEx Control Hub, we get full visibility into all the experiences of their users. And not only have we, do we have WebEx Control Hub, but we actually have an integration between that and our Thousand Eyes endpoint agent, which is running on Alicia's laptop. The Thousand Eyes endpoint agent allows for employees to quickly cross launch and look at the exact moment she was having that poor experience in a WebEx meeting and see the root cause of that problem through Thousand Eyes. This is a great integration and if you don't have this already you should, and you're using WebEx, you should definitely take a look at this because it makes troubleshooting significantly easier. Now, the Thousand Eyes endpoint agent is not just for troubleshooting meetings. It actually gives you visibility into the entire employee experience. And it turns your entire base of employees into distributed nodes throughout the internet that are providing you data about how that experience is going regardless of where they are. And it's not just Thousand Eyes that's giving visibility. We also have additional capabilities through Meraki Systems Manager that I'll tell you about. But one day she goes out and she goes to a SharePoint site from a customer, she clicks on a PDF and what happens? There's malware. Well that malware is protected through the Cisco Secure Endpoint client that's running on Alicia's machine to make sure that she does not have, she, that she's protected from any downloads that occur on her machine. And as I mentioned, we also have Meraki Systems Manager running on that machine. That allows IT the visibility of what's happening on her machine allows her to support allows them to support her and allows them to monitor and maintain and upgrade all that software but delivered from the cloud so regardless of where alicia is her it organization can make sure that her machine is up to date and safe so in the end we in practice we have a variety of different products that are running on alicia's so, uh, uh, laptop but when alicia makes her way into the office there's a different experience that she wants to have that, to augment that. And to tell you about that, I'm going to hand it over to Abi. Good afternoon. So I'm really excited today to share with you, amongst all these trends and with all this technology, what does Cisco does as a company for our own employees and create a best-in-class hybrid work experience. So let's dive right into it. 
the way we see the world around hybrid work is we want to make sure our employees are able to work from home, work from office, and anywhere seamlessly. Now, to some extent, we already had these capabilities, and when pandemic hit and we had to transition the next day, everybody working remotely, it happened seamlessly for us. But at that time, we also realized that this is a trend that is here to stay. So we have to get better at it. So now, when a new employee joins Cisco, we have an option to send them a pre-packaged hybrid work kit. What does this kit have? It has all the hardware, including their laptop, video endpoint, everything that they need to have a home office. But also all the amazing software capabilities that Paul just talked about, all of that is already pre-provisioned in this kit. With that, the, there's no, no longer someone has to install the software and wait. They can be productive right away. And most of this software is actually delivered from the cloud. And we are able to now monitor the digital experience of our employee. So if somebody is having a problem at home, we can tell whether it's the SP, their home internet, or if it's an application issue. So this is around home and anywhere. Now let's go to the office. As we thought, OK, now we have to redesign our offices for this new environment. People go to the offices to collaborate. They do not go there for dedicated workplaces because they already have a home office where they can work in a quiet environment. So we are looking for four business outcomes. The first one is agile experience. For anybody that goes into the office, they should be able to use the office for what they need, whether it's a meeting, it's an innovation session, whatever they need, right? The second one is we want to work towards a sustainable future. We want to operate our offices in a, and achieve the carbon neutral footprint and participate in the circular economy. The third one is when you come to your office, if you're our guest, if you're an employee, we want to make sure we positively impact your health and wellness. And the fourth one that we are going to spend the most time on today is actually digitization of real estate that becomes a very core tenant that even helps with the first three. So how do we do that? We go into an office and see, okay, what do we already have? We have the network devices, we have the video endpoints, we have cameras. They all serve a purpose, but also in addition to it, they also have amazing sensors embedded. We can know how many people are in the building. Where are they in the building? We understand what's the air quality, what's the humidity. And with all this data, we can now superimpose that on a digital floor plate. So most of your buildings currently have an AutoCAD drawing. We take that and then convert them into a virtual floor plate. And then now we have a very good digital presence of your building. What we also do, we convert whatever we need um, power to and see if we can actually power this device using power over Ethernet using low voltage. So now all of a sudden think about all the copper that is saved, all the labor cost that is saved in actually bringing it up there. And then we are able to control these blinds, these lights, everything through our networking equipment. Because we have space to put a small container in there so to now control all these devices. And when these principles are actually applied in practice, we achieve case studies like our office in New York. So we created this office of the future. During the pandemic, it took us two years. It's a 42,000 square feet office. It's one floor in a skyscraper. And what we did is we design, redesigned it completely. And as Luke was saying, it went from dedicated offices and only 16 conference rooms to 92 collaboration spaces and no dedicated workspaces. There are some hot desks there where you can work independently, but mostly it's for around collaboration. And in this office of the future, we connected all the lights, all the blinds through power or ethernet, and we basically removed a lot of copper that we don't need anymore. And when we did that, we were able to leverage a lot of sensors that were already there. We also installed new sensors. So in total, we are basically in this 42,000 square feet building, we are collecting about 5,000 data points per second. And with that data, we can now make intelligent choices on how we operate this building. Our energy usage went down. 
So in the long term, we're going to save a lot of money and work towards a sustainable future. But at the same time, even in the capital expenditure, we saved money because we didn't have to get labor to install those circuits or, or electricity. And actually, as we are sitting here in Rye, all these access points that you see on the ceiling, they're all powered over Ethernet. So these are the principles that are already being used um, by our customers. So let's go a little bit deeper into how this happens. So first, if you go into a space, you can see, OK, I have all these sensors that are already there if you're already using Cisco technology and how I can use that. The second thing you do, you upload your um, building drawings, and then these static drawings now become a, a virtual uh, uh, digital floor plate. Now you say, OK, I got some data points, but I actually want to se want a sensor for some specialized reason. Great. We could do that. We go to our marketplace and then install more sensors on, what, on more information that we need. Then we say, OK, now we got everything. Now let's make sure everything is placed accordingly in this virtual floor plate. And now you have a digital way to control this building. Now this enables a lot of different use cases. One of the use cases that you see today on the board is around digital signage. So currently, it's live um, environment within our New York office where someone can go in and see this building in a digital fashion. They can book rooms. They can understand the, the layout of the building and really interact with this space in a very efficient way. So no longer you're wasting time walking around the office trying to see if the conference room is busy or not, or basically a lot of time wasted around that is gone away. And it contributes towards your health and wellness because you can see how the space is being used. But also, all this data can also be fed into your building management system, like Honeywell, Schneider. And now based on the occupancy of the space, you can make intelligent choices in an automated way on how you, how you choose to operate your building. And we are actually demonstrating these solutions right now on the show floor. So NetNet is this. We have spent a lot of time in coming up with these things. It took us two years to create the Cisco Penman office. So we said, how can we now take this information and provide that in an easy-to-consume way to our customers? So let's go from top to bottom. So all the amazing software that Paul talked about is now all inclusive in an EA 3.0 uh, portfolio that is delivered at a very aggressive pricing in a per user per month fashion. So all the capabilities you can consume from one enterprise agreement. The second one I want to talk about is work from office. This is where we looked at the Pen1 office, and we said, OK, if you have to build a similar office, and by the way, every customer that has a tour, they say, how can I build it? We created design guides around this, a solution builder approach, and Lego blocks. So you can see, OK, I have already two things. I need to buy these three things and bring it together. And you have the same experience like the Cisco Pen 1. And now, if you want to extend this experience into the home so your workers actually have the same experience of high-end video collaboration at home and security, you can now buy one of the work from home kits. So with that, learn more about these offers on our booth or go to our website. Thank you so much for spending time with us and being a Cisco customer. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. We're just out of an innovation talk. The talk was called Hybrid Work Offers Here and Now. Now we're going to wait for Luke and for Colin to join us here in the studio. But just before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the Medibus. Now, the Medibus is part of the Reimagine Germany initiative. It's a bus that has a consultation room on board, a lab um, area, a changing room, a tre treatment room, a reception. And what's really great is that it's powered by 16 different solar panels, so it's really energy efficient. It's got air conditioning. And um, I just want to make sure we have time to actually take a look at the Medibus, right, instead of me just telling you about it. So let's head on out to the World of Solutions. Rob, you're there, and you're with my good friend, Jonathan Elton. Say hello. 
Oh, we've just got one second. So let me just tell you a little bit more about the bus and then we're going to head straight back out afterwards. So the Medibus, it's actually treated 12,355 patients to date. It's visited 496 different locations. It's driven in over 11,000 kilometers and 204 hours of video translation. And that's all in just 301 days. Now, if we talk a little bit about the technology that's there on board, uh, we have collaboration technology, there's video interpreting technology, of course, network management and IoT. We've heard lots of those innovations across the show this week, as well as enterprise and IoT networking. There's a powerful router on board, which um, helps obviously with nationwide internet access wherever the bus goes. The list goes on. I'll tell you a little bit more around Meraki. That's used for temperature monitoring and alerting. We've got telemetry and lots of data collection analysis because the data is really what helps bring it all together and make sure that all the patients have a really great experience. And then finally, security. The bus is full on end to end integrated with all of Cisco's security solutions. Right, I think now Rob and Jonathan, you are ready for us out in the world of solutions to so show us the Medibus. I'm absolutely ready. Let me just apologize. Steve had told me not to touch the camera, and I was like, surely I can't hurt anything. Apparently I can. All right, so we're ready. It's all good. Uh, Jonathan, so glad to have you here. Can you tell us what you do and, and, and what's going on with this bus behind us? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Elting. I work for the Country Digital Acceleration Program here at Cisco. Um, this is the Medibus. Um, I'll tell you a bit about it. So this bus was first created because uh, in Germany, uh, in rural areas, uh, the population there really struggles to get access to healthcare, and so we had the idea to bring the healthcare to the population in, in the villages there. And the best way to do that was basically put a doctor's office on wheels, and that's what you see here. Sorry, I was going to ask you a question, uh, whipping the mic back and forth, but how did this get started? You guys have, uh, there was a specific need you were looking to address in the rural areas, but quickly you were being used in, in providing relief in some really big operations, correct? That's right, yeah. As is often the case, the original idea behind this uh, didn't end up being the only way that we used it. So um, initially it was the crisis, uh, or the Syrian crisis and refugees coming into Germany. Um, more recently, of course, unfortunately, the Ukrainian crisis has brought an influx of refugees to the country. And now even one of these buses is on its way to Turkey. So it's really been used as a humanitarian aid and, and crisis relief. And is it fair to say that one of the objectives here is to really create a model for both for the partnership, the communication, and just the enablement of things that are really occurring across multiple countries, companies, uh, resources like doctors, for instance, who want to provide help but need resources to be able to execute with their art. This is the kind of way in which we play a part to do that, but we want other countries to pick this up and, and look at how they might use it? Absolutely, yes. Our, our intention with this is that it's not a one-off. Well, there are already seven of these buses, so we've achieved that much, but we def definitely want to spread it outside of Germany. We've made some great uh, progress on that this week, in fact, with uh, interesting and relevant people coming to see the bus, and it's really helped that it's been here in, 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 in reality for them to touch and feel and, and walk through. Well, that's awesome. I wonder if you could give us a little tour through the bus. Do you mind? Yeah. Let's go do it. Go. Absolutely. Come on board. So this is a bus um, built here in the Netherlands by VDL. It's custom made um, for, this, for this purpose. And it's a diesel bus. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to be sustainable there. However, on the roof, we have 16 solar panels. And they link up to this uh, battery management uh, setup here. So once the bus arrives at its destination, it will be fully sustainable for the day and it can provide uh, a full day of appointments to patients without any need for additional power. Um, of course, it's fully connected with 3G and 5G. We use our IR1800 series um, for this. And because we're often in rural places or, or places without the, the best connectivity, um, we have a dual SIM option in here uh, and, and 3G and 5G options. If those aren't available, then we also can connect via satellite so we can always get the connectivity going. We have uh, our access points uh, hidden away in, in the cupboards here as well uh, and lots of our collaboration equipment as well. Um, as we come through the bus, you're passing now through the waiting area and the initial uh, treatment room. And as we keep coming through the bus, you're coming into now the first uh, main treatment area. We can, we can even put a bed in here if needed. 
And all of these rooms have the privacy glass, so full privacy for the patients, um, so they feel safe uh, and secure in here. And as we keep coming through, now we're into the laboratory. Um, so, so here we have all the facilities uh, doctors might need, including a uh, bank of refrigeration here. Uh, oh, sorry, no, no ice creams in here today, um, but we, uh, this is where all the medicines and the vaccinations are kept. Because what we found with the bus is um, often refugees coming over the border require either a COVID vaccination or there's often children that require some of those um, first vaccinations that you need uh, when you're very, very young, like measles. Um, so we can administer those um, with the help of these fridges. And now, uh, bring you into the final space, <laughs> and Rob's here. Oh, hey. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Can't hear a thing. I'm just trying to self-diagnose just a little bit here. Oh. All right. Okay. I, I think, just to test, because this was an issue later, that the studio can hear me, yes? Awesome. Okay. So I'm curious in this room, so this is where you're seeing patients, you've got a privacy door, lights up to let people know they don't need to get in here. But That's really, right. you guys are specialized in the fact you're dealing with countries, obviously a refugee situation, you've got language issues and different challenges. I think you just spoke about some of that, but some of these tools here are set up specifically to deal with that. Can you explain what these are? Absolutely, yes. And, and you're right. So many times the doctor and the patient don't speak the same language, and obviously that's a really big problem. But luckily our technology and uh, combination with our partner can, can sort that out. So we've partnered with uh, an organization called SAVD. They offer a pool of linguists that are available just at a touch of a button via WebEx. Um, they have over 700 of these um, people on hand and in 26 languages those people can be, be available inside two minutes. So it's a very quick service, no one's kept waiting around too long. Um, and then the, the doctor and the patient can have a perfect clear conversation yeah um, now I'm trying to remember one other thing and I don't know if it's set up here but you had this as an example of something that's in a language I cannot read we can use this system also to help us translate absolutely yes so when we uh, when we phone in um, yeah I'll, I'll show that here when we when we phone into the translators obviously here, you, yeah I'm they can keep, yeah. yeah no problem they can see what the patient brings in with them, and sometimes it might be a, a box of pills that they've oh, yeah, run out of. And they need their medications. That makes complete sense. Exactly, or they might even have a, a doctor's letter, like this one down here. And the translation again can be used to to, to help assist the doctor uh, into into what this means, and then the right drugs can be prescribed. Um, the other thing that we can do is sometimes a, a second opinion might be needed. Um, obviously, this this would be a bus filled with nurses and general practitioners, but what if there's a a skin a specific skin problem for example you need a dermatologist ah. well then we have another option where we can connect um, to a remote doctor for for that second opinion or for that specialist advice um, and 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 we can do that right here and we, we've had this demoing um, through this week at Cisco live uh, I'll, I'll pop this up again oh, specific doctor is yeah. there someone there that we can talk to wow and oh we, we have, have a live doctor Look we at that. do this is Andreas hey Andreas Hello. He, he looks suspiciously like the guy I saw outside. Hey, oh, might, no? might be yeah, the case. Maybe it's just, well, a lot of doctors look alike, people say. That's incredible. So yeah. we've got the translation capabilities in language and experts on demand. But what I love is I think just the biggest thing is how do you care for somebody if you can't speak their language and you want to lower their heart rate? You want to make things a bit easier on them because I just think of the panic I have when I if I can't communicate how I feel like I do when taking care of my animals I'm like how can they communicate with me I wish I had the translator either way guys come check out the Metabus here in the far corner of the world of solutions very good people here doing very good things with that we'll go back to the studio Thank you so much, Rob. Really great to get a chance to take a look inside the Medibus and see all the technology. We're going to now shift and return back to the topic of hybrid work. I'm joined back in the studio by Luke. So, Luke, welcome back. And you are joined by Colin D. Ellis. So, welcome, Colin. I'll leave it to you. I'm right here if you, want any, if you have any questions right, or anything, but to, take it away. Great to be back. Colin, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Look, you work with leaders around the globe on the topic of culture and also how, how to mold and build the culture around the hybrid work current environment. Could you share with us some of the challenges that you see with leaders as well as employees they face in the current hybrid work environment? Yeah, I, when, when the panic pandemic first hit, Luke, what we had was equity of experience with regards to culture. All of a sudden, everybody was at home and we were very right. good at rolling out technology. So we had the mechanisms to stay in touch. And the organizations that thrived during the pandemic were the ones that actually put time, thought, and effort into resetting their culture. They recognized that things had changed, things that, that, were, that were different. And so they reset their culture. They thought differently about how they would communicate and collaborate and the behaviors they needed to demonstrate. Now, as we 
come back to the work place, Luke, and we, we, we look to leverage some of the solutions that we see is it almost needs another reset. And so I think the biggest challenge that most leaders face right now is how, how do we be deliberate about this thing called culture? For too long, it's been an unwritten agreement between leaders and employees. And now there really has to be thought given to, if we're not all going to be in the same place and there's going to be this inequity of experience, how do we make sure that people still feel that sense of belonging to their colleagues and we know when to come together to get productive work done? That's, no, that, I, I see it in the market because the interesting thing is people lead with technology, but in essence, you almost have to lead with the culture and then technology enables that. I'm very interested to see what's the secret sauce? What are some of the like necessary conditions to kind of get it right, both the culture, but also be able to operate effectively in the hybrid work? You know, it's a great question, Luke, because I think too many organizations suffer from waiting for the perfect conditions. Right. And, and culture is pervasive, it's there all of the time. And what we need to make sure is that we're not waiting, 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 waiting for this thing called culture. In the meantime, you're losing your good staff or you're not leveraging all of the great technology that's there to enable hybrid working. And so for, for, for leaders, it's really a case of, hey, listen, we need to deal with this cultural issue right now in order to get the best from not only our people, but also from our technology. And, and so from a condition perspective, it's like now is always the right time to start working on culture. <laughs> that's fascinating because I was just having an innovation talk and that was exactly the message, like the time is now, mm. don't wait. Uh, it takes time to get there. So the sooner you get on the journey, because it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the interesting thing is, where do you see the market going? Uh, obviously, we talk about the culture maybe catching up with some of the technology, but where do you see the trends going in the near term, at least? Well, I think, I, I, again, at the start of the pandemic, you know, key, leaders were kind of caught in this place of, is the office gone? Do I sell off my real estate right. or else, you know, are we going to come back full time? And I think there's this, there's still this um, uh, almost you know, kind of dissonance to sort of say, what do we do, where do we go? So I think future term, what leaders are looking, and certainly the organizations that I work with, work with is, well, how do we best use that space? I think we're still some way away from kind of augmented reality in, in video. I think more desktop terminals with cameras inbuilt to reduce the amount of distraction, because we're still getting a lot of people who are getting distracted by their emails when they're yeah. on their calls. Luke, so I think leaders are going to look at, well, you know, how can we leverage technology to ensure that we don't overwhelm people? Burnout still one of the biggest issues we see in our workplace cultures. People just lack the discipline around their technology. Um, and, and how do we, I, I guess, shift our workspaces to best suit the work that we need to do? Is it private, quiet work, or can we move our walls about and do more collaborative work? And so I think finding those solutions for better uh, uh, kind of office working is definitely something that we're looking That's at. That's a great point of view because a lot of people are, are you know, chasing the next shiny object, hologram, VR, great, but you have to look at the starting point, like less than 10% collaboration rooms have actually video enabled conference rooms. So start there and then think about the future, right, so to speak. If you were to wear Cisco hat, what would be some of the guidance, advice you would give to Cisco, like as we support you and the leaders, obviously, on this journey, what would be some of the things you would give us as a pointers? Well, I, I, you know, I still think that we make an assumption that everybody knows how to build culture. Hmm. Luke, especially in the hybrid world, you know, the way that we work has changed dramatically forever. You said this in your talk before. And I think you know, one of the things that Cisco needs to do and every organization needs to do is to teach its managers how to build and evolve positive hybrid working culture. Because only then do you, are you able to retain that sense of belonging, retain that sense of what Cisco is about and what it's good at, and leverage the tools that you have at your disposal to improve productivity and make sure the products remain to the quality that they are right now. Excellent. And in fact, we need to have more dialogue like this around culture, things that surround the technology. I think that's the piece that leaders want to hear as well. So I really appreciate the, the time today, opportunity to speak. I think we should uh, continue the dialogue as we move forward. Sounds great. Thanks, Luke. Amazing. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you to Colin as well. Really interesting perspectives. And thanks for bringing together the themes around, obviously, this being a technology show, but the people and culture piece is really critical. All right, we're now going to head out to a quick video. It's of Cedric wandering around the world of solutions in the event and speaking to some attendees. So let's take a look. Let's try to stop someone here and see what they have to say. Oh, they're going. They, see, they can see I'm coming. Cisco? Live! Cisco? Live! If you think about Cisco Live, what are the three words that come to mind? 
Oh, well, of sustainability, okay. that's a big one. People, connections, that's what this is all about. Networking, engagement, having fun. Plastic, networking, great spirit. New technology, security, zero trust, I take. Collaboration, sustainability, partners. Building knowledge, sharing knowledge. Great to be back, meeting cool people. Inspiring, nice. This is the first time we heard nice, and I like it. Innovation. 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 I would say innovation. Inspiring. Big. Relationship. Vibrant. Diverse. Fun. Food. A lot of learning. If you would have to convince your friends to come to Cisco Live next year, what would you tell them? I would tell them it's a great opportunity to get together with customers from all around the world, or at least uh, Europe and Africa. You can put two years of learning into a week. Where else could you meet someone who's helping move along the mission to Mars? Then Cisco Live. Get to know the latest and greatest uh, in terms of IT. You have many people with a lot of knowledge here, so you can really ask the question you are having. How would you convince them to come to Cisco Live? Just ask them. They will be here. Has great people, great technology, and fantastic outcomes. You should come. As you can see, everybody's really excited to be here at Cisco Live in Amsterdam. It gives you enough reason to come next year, so just make sure that you're all in and you're here. All right, welcome back to Studio A, right here at the front of the hub, here at the beautiful Rye Amsterdam. Great job, Cedric. Thank you so much for bringing the energy and bringing the fun to Cisco Live with all of those new friends that you've made since you got here this week. Remember, keep sending out those social media posts, tweets, photos using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Please share your response to the content that you are hearing all day long and stay with us right up to our closing keynote with Pierre Luigi Colina, the world's greatest football referee. Right now, I've got Mohammed Imam here in the Cisco TV studio with me. Mohammed is Senior Director of Product Management for Catalyst 9000 Series. Welcome, Mohammed. So glad to have you here with us. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. So, Catalyst 9000 has been so incredibly successful for Cisco. How has the portfolio really evolved over the last few years? It has been an amazing run in the last five years. We introduced the Catalyst 9000 in 2017, and since then we have never stopped innovating. We have unified the entire Catalyst portfolio in one product, which is Catalyst 9000, whether it's access, aggregation, or core. We have unified the architecture from software perspective with iOS XE across the board, single image, with one hardware architecture using the UADP ASIC, and that has simplified the user experience. That has made the operational activities for our network administrators very, very easy with the Catalyst 9000. And so the portfolio kept evolving, and last year, we have introduced what we call it the X series, mm -hmm. the X factor, um, and that is the Catalyst 9300X, our latest Catalyst 9300, which comes with 90 watt of power, multi-gigabit, one terabit stacking, and a lot of other functionalities packed in this beautiful box. We have also introduced Catalyst 9400X with Soup2 and some new line cards. And on the Catalyst 9500X and 9600X, we have introduced for the first time the Silicon One-based Catalyst 9Ks. And that means additional power, additional performance, additional scale, and we have made the install base that was with the Catalyst 6500 back in the days, now is ready to migrate to the Catalyst 9000X. Having said that, in this Cisco Live, we are introducing a couple of new exciting products as well. We have our industry first 60 port, 25 slash 50 gig box. We have never seen a one RU box with 60 ports packed. Typically it's 48. But now we are able to pack 60 port with the innovations that we have done. This box is capable of 60 ports of 25 or 50, as I said, but it also comes with 400 gig uplinks. Four ports of 400 gig uplinks. And that basically makes you ready for the new hybrid world that we are living in in the post-pandemic era. It also comes with security features, IPsec capable, MacSec ready, and it's... it's uh, software fine access and EVPN ready as well. Absolutely, so again, a lot of great breakthroughs, a lot of announcements this week here at Cisco Live. Um, share a couple of the latest trends that we are seeing, for example, in uh, enterprise campus networks. Let's go with that. So in the enterprise networks, 
as you can imagine, in the post-pandemic, one of the trends that we have seen is the hybrid work. Yes. And that means more video, more mobility, um, more security concerns as well with, with, with all these, um, with, with more mobility and more people in different places. At the same time, we, have all, we are also seeing IT and OT convergence, right? A lot more endpoints are now coming into the network which were never supposed to be on the network in the past. Things like lights, LED lights, blinds, uh, HVAC systems, they are getting connected to the, to the network. And I think one of the most trending topics of the day, especially here in Europe, is, is the energy saving and sustainability. And I think network is sitting in a very strategic uh, place and can be the catalyst driving this transformation of sustainability uh, in, in the future years, because every, all of the enterprises that I'm talking to, they have their sustainability goals defined. I think network can play a big role in multiple ways. Number one, PoE. PoE cuts the cost for our customers, but at the same time, it brings a better form of energy with DC power. Uh, and, and second is the, the visibility that you get with the network for energy savings. The more visibility you have of usage, occupancy in your networks, in your buildings, the more you can optimize the energy. And so that making, the, making our buildings smarter with the smart buildings, architectures, I think that is something that is going to drive sustainability from network perspective. Great, so we've got about 20 seconds left here in the section. Tell me quickly about security. How do we keep it all secure for the network? Look, I keep it simple. Gone are the days when we could do security port by port. Yeah. We have to take an architecture approach. And it has to be an end-to-end -end architecture approach with segmentation and policy as the key that you really have to have in the network. So I'll leave it at that. It's a much bigger discussion, and we can have much more discussion on that at a different segment. That is perfect. Mohammed Imam, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. We really do appreciate it. Congratulations once again. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, we are going to go back out to Rob Boyd. This time, Rob is in the NOC, and the NOC is always one of our most popular and interesting areas here at Cisco Live. Rob, I see you've corralled one of our distinguished engineers. You found Joe Clark. Yes, I thought everybody recognizes Joe Clark. Thank you so much, Steve. Joe, always easy to recognize because he never looks any older. Yep. I don't know what his secret is. He's not willing to share. Dorian Gray painting. Dorian Gray office. painting is, is doing the aging for him. Yeah. Well, Joe, you guys seem to have done a fabulous job because I haven't had Thank to think you. about what y'all are doing here, which to me is kind of the That's the what way we aim works. for, yeah. We, uh, we got here on uh, January 26th rolled the core in from the uh, Cisco lot or the Cisco offices here in Amsterdam and we have been building it out ever since it's been great to be back here after three years in Europe doing Cisco live so we wanted to balance a little bit of the new with the known and I think we've built a great network and you can come by here in the hub uh, to the knock and see the heartbeat of that network we have the statistics we have a picture of our uh, core one data center we have been doing just almost 50 terabytes of traffic to the internet since we started and we have been we have a, a great team 60 people on site watching things making sure we don't have any issues and when we do find things we jump on them we make sure that our attendees have the best possible experience because we only have five days to make that great impression well, I'm curious too, when people are lining up here, what kind of questions are they asking your, you and your team? They kind of want to know why we did what we did and what we did. On the architecture? Like, on the architecture. Okay. They, they're like, well, why did you make this decision? Or why did you make it? Some people think that we, that they want to know, well, why didn't you go with this technology or that technology? And some of it comes down to making sure that we can keep things with the right amount of complexity. If something goes wrong and we're down for an hour, an hour out of five days is a long time. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're using the best, the greatest Cisco technology with enough of what we know to be able to troubleshoot quickly, to be able to resolve issues quickly, and to manage the complexity with a team of generally volunteers yeah. who come out here, who prep, who really love this stuff, who, who believe it, but also they don't, they're not doing this every day, and they need to be able to be fast and responsive. Well, I had a chance to talk to some of the, the um, apprentices mm -hmm. that, are, yeah, that have been that. helping with yeah. this, and I think that's fascinating. I love the way we bring up the next generation, give a hands-on in a real live environment that's critical. Yeah. You know, it's a very critical environment. I also love the fact that you choose 
only Joe Clark would come to say, we need to dial in the right amount of complexity. It's not the way I've always thought of it, but I understand exactly yep. what you're saying there. That works perfect. I'm going to ask you to give up the mic because I okay, want to talk to absolutely. NetApp, if you don't mind. I'll let you just hand it over to him. Yeah. Perfect. Joe, thank you so thank much. You, I appreciate it. So remind me again, I apologize. What is your name and uh, what are you responsible for here? Yeah, my name is Abhinav. I'm a senior technical marketing engineer from NetApp. And as a NetApp, we have uh, built Metro Cluster. So that is basically your all NOC primary workloads are running. Yeah. So this year we did a technology refresh. So we replaced the controller and we did all the data migration to the new stack. So the entire primary NOC computes are running on NetApp. So, uh, and as you know that FlexPod, it's a partnership between Cisco and NetApp that has been running since around 2010, almost since the start of Cisco UCS platform. And in FlexPod, we produce validated reference architecture, wherein we call it as Cisco validated design Cisco. and NetApp verified architecture. I've depended on those CVDs in yeah, quite yeah. a few different areas, but you yeah. guys have a lot of variations of that, which I appreciate. That's, that's true, true. So we cover all best practices that comes in building the stack properly and customer can deploy based on the workload requirements. So that's the beauty of that. And we have been done almost 200 plus CVDs. Yeah. So we, we capture all kind of application requirements uh, being with the uh, generic VMware based application or could be a healthcare, AIML and uh, VDI especially. And if you talk about uh, some uh, app modernization, for example, OpenShift. So we cover a large variety of workloads. Okay. Well, I know that you guys have worked with the teams here, and it's the flexibility, the modularity of the, the FlexPod architecture specifically that makes it attractive. But are there any points that you would say, even from a sales standpoint, why, why would someone be interested in, in FlexPod as being the easy-to-use architecture for their compute and data? Yeah, sure. So first of all, it's a data center in a rack, and you will get a lot of flexibility based on you can deploy it on a small or medium business enterprise. And now we can also connect it to the hybrid cloud. So you can move your data across on-prem to the cloud in case of any disaster recovery. And with this, uh, the design of Metro Cluster, both data center are active-active, and they appear as a DR group for each other. So in case even the live uh, uh, Cisco live event is running on the NOC, in case if any of the flex pod or any of the site is getting affected, we can quickly recover the entire stack within five minutes. So that's the beauty of that. So the recovery ability is it's really the resilience to give you that confidence and the trust that you're going to be able to yeah. where do what you want. Okay. So I'm getting a time check on the studio. We're good to go. I want to thank you so much for your time and your partnership. Yeah. Guys, we'll head back over to you in the studio now. Thank you. All right, Rob. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Great job, Joe. Great job, uh, Avinav. The Nav. The knock is just, it's so cool. All week long here in Amsterdam, we have been talking about zero trust. Well, yesterday we saw a great iTalk with Lothar Renner and TK Kianini on how to frustrate attackers and not frustrate users using zero trust for the multi-environment IT. Well, we are about to replay that session for you right now. We're going to meet you right back here on the other side in Studio A. We're going to